morning, everyone. We can begin together here. My name is Joaquin Esquivel, Chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, today is uh, Tuesday, uh, March 15th. It is 9 a.m. and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'll begin by introducing my fellow board colleagues with me here today, joined by Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, Board Member Sean McGuire, Board Member Laurel Firestone, and Board Member Nicole Morgan. With us today as well as our Executive Director, uh, Eileen Sobeck, our Chief Counsel, uh, Michael Lawfer, our two Chief Deputies, Eric Oppenheimer and Jonathan Bishop. Our Clerk of the Board is Janine Townsend and assisting her today is Margie Arjol and Courtney Tyler. As you can see, this, webcast, this meeting is being webcast and recorded. You're either viewing us uh, one of two ways, uh, either customarily on our YouTube uh, live stream or on the Cal EPA website, or you're here on the Zoom platform with us. If you intend on commenting on any of today's board items, you need to be here on the platform with us. There's a link and instructions at the top of our agenda today. If you're having any challenges with that, please do just email our clerk of the board at commentletters at waterboards.ca.gov and she can help uh, make sure and get you here on the platform with us. Once you are here, your camera will be off. You will be on mute until um, it is uh, time to, to speak on the item that you've requested to do so. Uh, with that, I, today we usually uh, go straight into public forum, but we actually have a presentation of Superior Accomplishment Awards and would like to call up Eric Ekdahl to uh, present that award. Good morning, Mr. Ekdahl. Good morning, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. Uh, this morning, it's my pleasure to present a sustained Superior Accomplishment Award to team members in the division and the Office of Chief Counsel that we're working on the Mono Lake uh, license petition project or workload. Uh, and I'll give a brief overview of that workload and what uh, those staff were doing and then introduce the staff. Uh, and maybe they can pop on camera and uh, say hi. Uh, the staff we're recognizing today were key in supporting the Division of Water Rights completion of changes to the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power or LADWPs water rights in the Mono Basin. These changes will result in enhanced restoration of environmental damage that resulted from previous diversions within the basin. The Mono Basin is of historic importance to the State Water Board due to litigation that began in the late 70s that resulted in the confirmation of the State Water Board's responsibilities to protect the public trust. Following that litigation, the State Water Board issued a decision in 1994 called Decision 1631 that modified LADWP's mono basin licenses to establish in-stream flow requirements, water export limitations, and conditions to protect public trust resources in and around Mono Lake. Subsequently, Order Water Right 90-05 required LADWP to implement stream restoration and monitoring activities in the Mono Basin as part of a stream restoration and monitoring program. The new order, which was issued last fall, uh, makes major changes to the stream restoration and monitoring program including a requirement to modify Grant Lake Dam to accommodate higher peak flows that are now required in certain years. The new stream flow regime is aimed at accelerating ecosystem recovery processes that will benefit uh, the trout fishery and other riparian habitats in uh, Rush Creek in particular, but also Lee Vining, Walker and Parker Creeks. The program changes uh, stem from recommendations made in 2010 by an independent scientific panel. After more than a decade of studies in Rush and Lee Vining Creeks, and following uh, coordination on how those recommendations were to be implemented in September of 2013, LADWP, Mono Lake Committee, Cal Trout, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife entered a settlement agreement regarding the changes to the program recommendation by the scientific experts. And so these uh, license changes or petitions to change the licenses were essentially to integrate those recommendations and integrate a series of uh, negotiated outcomes related to those settlement parties. And so the workload uh, has been ongoing for, in some cases, well over a decade, and the staff that have been working on it have really uh, overseen just the whole process and tracking it, working with stakeholders, working with settlement parties. And so in particular, I'd like to introduce Scott McFarland. He's the supervisor overseeing the petitions and licensing unit within the division. And he's responsible for, or was responsible for analyzing LADWP's change petitions and preparing the approval order and the amended licenses. Uh, Greg Brown was the lead environmental scientist working on these license amendments. Steve Marquez was the lead engineer working on license amendments. And David Rose in the office of chief counsel uh, was the chief attorney working on these amendments as well. 
And then also Sam Bull and Brian, who was the section chief kind of helping uh, guide the workload and work with stakeholders as well. So with that, uh, sincere thanks and congratulations on just an immense amount of time and uh, superb work and unparalleled dedication and professionalism in seeing these projects through. It's been a long process, but it's been worth it and we couldn't have done it without them. So thank you. Virtual round round of applause here uh, for what what as uh, Eric said has just been incredible work. Uh, Mono is is a storied basin and critical water body here in the state, and the the work that you've continued on here I know not uncomplicated sometimes not without um, some sharp elbows in the space is just uh, incredibly appreciated. And again, I think the word there is really the professionalism that uh, the team has continued to bring to that project. Uh, knowing that uh, there's real challenges, uh, not just in that basin, but so many of our, our, our water bodies in the state. Uh, but uh, appreciate here the, also the work of LADWP in, in completing their, their sequel work and getting the project continued to, to move. And, uh, and, and we continue to, to look forward to what is a really productive and needed discussion around issues uh, at Mono. So just thank you all for your, again, incredible work and dedication here. Uh, and, and look forward to what I know is going to be continued uh, challenges, but um, appreciate the approach and, again, the professionalism that you've all brought to this. So just thank you incredibly. Anything from uh, fellow board colleagues, please. Uh, always welcome uh, additional. Uh, yes, Vice Chair. I'll just say, I'll just add on my thanks. Uh, it's been a very long haul. Uh, this was actually one of the first tours I took when I became a board member in 2013. It's taken a long time, but um, we're here because you all st just stuck with it. And uh, not only working with the department, but all of the stakeholders, the Mono Lake Committee, and all those that just needed to stay at the table and appreciate you keeping everyone at the table. Congratulations. You're here. Thank you, Vice Chair. Board Member McGuire. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a special appreciation for just how much work was involved uh, with this project in particular, which I won't go into right now. But uh, well done. And uh, you know, I know, you know, having worked in water rights at one time, how much coordination, uh, heavy lifting it takes to get a project, you know, as complicated and um, difficult as this one and yet important uh, across the finish line. And I've uh, heard, you know, really just uh, a lot of kudos for you and the work that you've done. I don't think the settlement and this project would be where it's at today without your dedication and commitment to seeing it move forward. And, uh, you know, really excited about the prospect of, you know, not only the flows, but the outlet structure uh, which was agreed upon, you know, nearly 10 years ago now, which I hear uh, uh, is in design, could be uh, starting construction even this year. So really great news all around. You know, thank you. There's more work to do in the Mono Basin for sure. Um, and I know you'll be there for that. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, board member. Thank you again, and incredibly. I, I, I know there's in, in a lot of pressures out there. I, I think of all the drought work that's going on in your units as well. Um, and just really appreciate getting this uh, across the finish line and continuing to work in the basin. So uh, thank you all. Awkward virtual clap. And actually before you all disappear, let me uh, print screen and um, take our virtual photo. So, uh, all right, uh, one second, there's a print screen. All right, smile, thanks. Really appreciate it and I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, and. Uh, space here to acknowledge uh, the incredible work of the folks in our, our water rights division. So thank you, Eric. Okay, with uh, the accomplishment, uh, Superior Accomplishment Award um, done, we can now move on to public forum. And I believe we just have one commenter today, uh, Mr. Jared Powell. And Chair Escobar, I do not believe uh, Jared has joined us in the platform. He was listed as okay. necessary. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Chair Esquivel, I do yes. just have someone that just came in for a public forum and I'm just sending him the um, password information now. So it may take him a few minutes to come on board. Uh, okay, 
uh, we can here kind of hang a moment or uh, proceed to item number one and then take public forum uh, after we've adopted consideration or we've considered the board meeting minutes and uh, they're adopted if we so okay. choose to have them adopted. Okay, well, uh, again, I'll talk public forum, give a moment to uh, the person a moment to be able to sign on and we'll go ahead and move on to item number one. Are there any uh, adjustments or amendments to uh, the meeting minutes? There is actually an adjustment to the meeting minutes. Um, there are additional names actually listed within the Superior Accomplishment Award um, for the Racial Equity Working Group. There were um, the steering committee members were acknowledged during that presentation and they were inadvertently inadvertently listed. I apologize because they did an awesome job and I, um, but they, and so there, um, the additional names that were listed were Greg Gearhart, Nefertari Cooley, Renee Purdy, and Stefan Dehot. I can't pronounce Stefan's last name. <laughs> and so those names should not have been listed as part of that particular group award. Okay, I will remove them, board member Morgan. Great, thank you, board member. Any other adjustments or issues with the board meeting minutes? Hearing none. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes um, as amended. Thank you, vice chair. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Townsend, can you please call the roll call vote? Certainly. Vice chair Diadamo. Aye. Board member Morgan. Aye. Board member Firestone. I'll abstain because I had to leave early. Okay. Board member McGuire. Aye. Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you as well. And I'm reloading uh, the list here. Uh, Ms. Townsend, did the uh, individual wishing to comment on public comment make it onto the uh, platform let yet? Let me check real quick here. Uh, as of yet, no. Okay. Uh, I'm going to proceed in, and Mr. Lawford, let me know if you you prefer otherwise. But I'll I'll proceed through um, our agenda and allow the public commenter to maybe insert a, uh, their public comment uh, between one of the items. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it's fine to go ahead and reorder the agenda. So we'll hold public forum open and uh, presumably move on to item number two, the drought item. He is actually on the platform now. I just saw someone enter. Okay, great. Well then- uh, I'll we'll... go ahead. It's Mr. I Jeff McCulkin. <laughs> yeah, it's a good filibustering. Thank you, Mr. Lauper. For future reference, we know we can. Uh, not to put you uh, quickly on the spot, um, Mr. Mc, uh, McQuillan, uh, but if you would like to provide a public forum comment, uh, please do. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I rushed in. I assume you can hear me okay? We can, we can. We can. You made it in. <laughs> Glad for joining us. Uh, I just want to join. I'm Jeff McQuilkin, Executive Director at the Mona Lake Committee. And uh, I, I rushed over. Thank you, um, Janine, for getting me uh, in the system just to join in complimenting the staff um, and uh, congratulate them on the recognition for all the work on uh, Mona Lake and the Mona Basin licenses. Um, it really uh, was quite a tremendous project um, as your comments have uh, illuminated. Um, maybe I'll just share two quick things from uh, as a, one of the parties involved, one of the settlement parties and one of the participants myself in uh, gosh, a decade of um, meeting with the staff <laughs> um, on this. Um, uh, you know, we really brought to the, to the board and the team a voluntary agreement and um, we know these are uh, desirable and, and good things, um, not all voluntary agreements and, you know, match up precisely with the needs and the authorities and the desires um, of the agency. And uh, one of the challenges, I think, for the staff uh, that was, you know, really done very well was to uh, gently guide us all through the parts where, uh, you know, our uh, the majority of everything we had, of course, was uh, wonderful, but not everything um, quite matched up. And so there were quite a few conversations to be had um, to steer that agreement into a place where it could become um, what was really needed uh, for the board to, to take its final action. Um, and so I just want to recognize the staff's uh, 
uh, gentle leadership to us all um, on that. And the second thing um, just to uh, highlight is that we kind of had a second project entirely hidden in this first one. And that was um, the recognition that the pieces of the uh, Los Angeles Water and Power Water Licenses in the Mono Basin were uh, scattered through a number of decisions and documents and orders and past things. And there was a desire to bring all those together into one uh, unified document. Um, and just the, uh, the legwork to uh, find all those pieces. Uh, we all had some surprises about what was in the history and the record, uh, get them in a document and then reconcile them. Uh, there were requirements that had been completed, uh, things that maybe weren't in agreement, et cetera, um, was, was its own project as well as the actual content. So um, again, thank you um, for recognizing um, Scott and Steve and Greg and, um, David Rose played a big role in this, and Sam and, and uh, Eric Bechtel, of course, too. So I appreciate that, and I have the Moreway Committee's uh, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. McQuilkin. I really appreciate you, you taking the time to, to add uh, the thanks here, and I just appreciate just the trust that all the stakeholders have had to, to have some um, you know, gentle guidance from, from staff, knowing that uh, everything is not always as clear as we all would like it to be. <laughs> and, and needing to sometimes make some calls there. And thank you for as well, the nod uh, around the work on water rights, because what, uh, what also grew from that was uh, lessons learned around digitization of uh, potentially of those documents as well. And I know um, even yeah. feeds uh, some of the, the work we're doing when it comes to the upgrade of our water rights data system. So um, thank you, I'm glad we were able to quickly uh, get you in here. And I really appreciate you uh, making that effort to be able to provide uh, just further thanks to what uh, we just uh, very much acknowledge is an incredible team. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, I think that that um, wraps up then uh, public commenters and thank you again, uh, everyone for uh, the work and patience there. Next, uh, we can move on to um, what are a tranche here of uncontested items, um, items number two and three. Uh, are there any issues, um, Ms. Townsend, anyone that um, for and or for any reason that these need to be pulled off of the uncontested item uh, list? No, I have no speaker cards. Oh, okay, and I apologize. What I, I unfortunately did was uh, click into uh, the wrong agenda item this morning. Right. <laughs> so I uh, apologize. Uh, one second. So let's uh, go on to move on to our tranche of informational items, I believe at this point then, and um, I'd like to call up uh, Mr. Ekdal. Good morning again, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. We have a, a relatively lengthy drought update today. Not maybe that lengthy, but a little bit lengthier. Uh, next slide, please. Our typical agenda will provide an update of current hydrologic conditions. Then we'll step through some additional slides when we get to the watershed specific uh, efforts because March is water data month. And so we've uh, taken the, maybe not liberty, but the opportunity to describe how data is informing some of the drought work that we're doing, how we're coordinating that data, and then also making that data available for others to review and take a look at, and we'll kind of run through that in each of the respective watersheds. Uh, there's a bullet on here for drinking water, but drinking water and Division of Financial Assistance do not have an update this uh, meeting, and so there won't be an item for that. And then we'll talk about other actions, including enforcement and our typical reminders. Uh, next slide, please. I also wanted to note that uh, we do expect speakers from the Department of Water Resources, Director, Director Carla Nemeth and Regional Director of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, Ernest Conant. Uh, but Director Nemeth is previously engaged in another uh, meeting until about 10 or 10.15 and will get an update when she is available and ready to speak. So we may uh, interrupt the flow for providing the opportunity. And if we are completed with our item, which we in fact may be, uh, we'll coordinate and figure out a time as best as the board uh, wishes. So with that, uh, next slide, please. 
We'll turn it over to Michael Macon from the Division of Water Rights to provide the hydrologic update, and then I'll jump back in. We have some additional board staff to provide some additional information in a bit. All right, thank you, Eric. And good morning, Chair Esquivel and other board members. Uh, we're gonna run through the hydrologic update. Uh, most of these slides will be very familiar to you. Um, so let's just jump right in. Uh, starting with the Northern Sierra Precipitation Index, uh, you see we got a little bump in precipitation um, in March. We're sitting at 32.2 inches on the year. Uh, uh, next slide, please. A similar pattern in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, got a little bump in March. And as you notice outside, we're getting a little more rain today. Uh, so hopefully we'll we'll see a continued increase, but we're continuing to fall below that average uh, for a water year, um, all basins. Uh, next slide, please. Taking a look at the two layer basin, uh, we're sitting at 14.4 inches uh, on the water year, and that is 70% average to date. Uh, again, we're well below that uh, blue average curve. Um, Next slide, please. So taking a look at uh, snow content, oh, we're holding pretty steady uh, in the northern region. We're sitting at 52 inches. Central, we're at 58. And the south, we're at 60. Uh, statewide, we're sitting around 57% of average to date. So not as much as we'd like. Uh, next slide, please. Taking a quick look at all the reservoirs across California, uh, Folsom and Bullets Bar are sitting around uh, flood control levels. Uh, Shasta, Oroville, and New Maloney's are well below historic averages with Shasta sitting around 51% of historic average and probably the, the worst off reservoir across the state. Uh, next slide, please. In the most recent uh, Bulletin 120 update from DWR, uh, for the Sacramento River Index, we're looking at a critically dry year under both the 50% exceedance forecast and the 90% exceedance forecast. Uh, similarly, in the San Joaquin, so we're looking at another critically dry year on the air, most likely, unless we have a really wet March and April coming up. Uh, next slide, please. Taking a look at some other reservoirs across the state. The Kachuma Reservoir is sitting at 91,000 acre feet. That's about 47% of capacity and 64% of average. Diamond Valley Lake is at 568,000 feet. And that's about 70% 70, 70 of capacity. And San Luis Reservoir is at 897,000 acre feet. And that's 44% capacity and 53% of average. Next slide, please. For term 91, we did peek into a uh, positive supplemental water uh, releases. Uh, however, it's still not in effect. We anticipated Delta outflow requirements to be reduced under D1641 uh, today, actually, um, based on the previous month's eight river index. So we anticipate this to kind of drop back down into negative values, uh, particularly with the recent rainfall. Um, so we didn't feel the need to impose Term 91 with those looming changes coming up. So next slide, please. However, across California, we still see persistent drought conditions uh, with most of the state in severe drought and some regions in extreme drought, particularly along the North Coast. Uh, next slide, please. Taking a look at the temperature outlook for the month of March, uh, we have a above average chance of being below normal temperatures pretty much across the entire state. So that'll help keep things a little cooler. Uh, next slide, please. Shifting to precipitation, we're sitting about an equal chance of below or above average rainfall. Uh, again, we're hoping for above average, but uh, see what we get. And I believe that concludes my update. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. I'll hand it back off there. Thanks, Michael. Uh, 
I'll jump back in and run through then the additional slides on the specific watersheds and some of the water data slides. Uh, so the additional slides we include this meeting are focused on four kind of broad areas. I have a, a single slide that I'll talk about the updating water rights data for California project or upwards California as we're referring to it, where the board is undertaking a significant effort to revise and revamp its water rights data management system and the processes that go with managing and maintaining that system as well. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about the data of drought decisions. How do we make the decisions that we make and what data help drive that? Where does it come from? And how can we get better data to help drive better decisions? Those types of questions are, are featured prominently in the purpose behind updating our water as data system for the Upward Project in general. Uh, that kind of ties into the third bullet, how drought data is used, when do we issue curtailments, and how do we make the decisions to suspend or reinstate them? And then we'll bring in uh, Sam Cole from our uh, cannabis policy section, who's been working very heavily in something called the Drought Water Rights Allocation Tool, or DRAP, and how we were using that to update uh, curtailments in the Russian River watershed specifically. So the next slide, please. Uh, this slide, I'll, I'll be up front, I unashamedly stole it from Sam Cole when he ran through his draft slides. I said, Sam, I, I like it so much, I'm going to steal it and I'll give you credit and you can still show it again. But it really sets the table for how data factors into what the division is doing during drought. You can see the, the chart on the side, which compares two different scenarios, one in which uh, there is insufficient supply for demand and another in which there is ample supply relative to demand. And it seems very simple in that you know, kind of stark uh, orange and blue table, either a yes, no decision, but on the left side, those separate bullets uh, highlight all the data that goes into determining where those bar graphs plot and how we analyze whether there is supply relative or sufficient for demand. How much water is available? When is it available? Uh, where is it available in a watershed? You can imagine that there's very large watersheds and it may change geographically. California is an extremely large state and it runs uh, you know, an immense number of hydrologic provinces. How many water right diversions are there on a stream system, where they're located, how they might affect one another, uh, the priorities of those diversions and where they plot geographically, how much are they diverting, how much have they reported that they're diverting, and then what's the relative priority in event of, of shortage? And each one of those bullets probably has multiple nested questions within that. All of them are informed by data and it's all ongoing and active kind of data work that the division and others at the board are doing. Uh, the division by no means is an island and we rely very heavily on our Department of Information Technology offering Office of Information Management and Assessment. Uh, in a very collaborative effort. Uh, board member Fireson, I believe you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to ask on this graph and it's fine if we talk about it on the, when, uh, the other part of the presentation, but so is the demand actually that much signif or significantly higher than in surplus years? And, or am I reading that wrong? And if it is, then can you just talk a little bit about why that is? We'll show another slide for that in a moment. It's, you know, this, this graph is representative, right? So it's not supposed to indicate a pure volume and it's supposed to be illustrative of just the idea or the concept. But you'll see in a moment that there are uh, some watersheds where there is a very stark difference between supply and demand. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that drive the data set that we get that from and why those things maybe plot the way that they do. So we'll get, we'll get there in a couple of minutes if we can hold on. Uh, next slide, please. So first, uh, just a, again, a very simple slide. We contemplated doing a, a longer presentation here, but we're in the midst of ongoing solicitation review and uh, wanted to hold off until that solicitation is a little bit farther along and maybe a little bit more concrete. So we anticipate maybe uh, June coming back with a, a longer presentation that talks about the Upward Project and what we're doing in it and who we're working with and how we got there. It's a fascinating story, uh, but it does take a little bit longer to tell. 
long and short of it is that you know, the division currently maintains a database of diversions and uh, that's as reported by the diverters and that's key to building drought response actions, permitting and public trust considerations. The state budget this last year allocated uh, a fairly large uh, infusion of funds to essentially rebuild that process in that system. The system was really designed and implemented in the early 2000s and lacks a lot of the modern data elements that we would uh, see in kind of a, a more modern system. And so we have uh, difficulties doing things like uh, quality assurance, quality checking on some of the reported elements, ingesting certain data types, and really integrating and showing that data across a geographic kind of concept, so geospatial type uh, map. There is a website for it. If people are interested, uh, please go to the, the link there and sign up for our Lyris email updates. We do send them out occasionally and they'll start to come more frequently when we get a little bit farther along in the contracting process. Uh, next slide, please. With that, uh, I'll start jumping into the individual watersheds and maybe first begin with the uh, Delta. So curtailment statuses as of March 8th, curtailments are based on what we're calling the watershed wide water unavailability assessment. So we're looking at the entire Sacramento watershed, the entire San Joaquin, as opposed to breaking it down to some of the sub watersheds, which we also have the capability of doing. Uh, there are curtailments in place for a subset of project rights in the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. So it's been very dry as we've noted previously and as Michael noted during the hydrologic update. And that has started to show itself in just flows and water availability, particularly now as we start to move towards what is the irrigation season. And uh, without kind of those winter rains to provide the, the soil pre-irrigation uh, naturally, uh, there's now increased demand in some sectors and in some watersheds for uh, irrigation as well as storage. Uh, people are trying to put as much water to storage as possible, recognizing that things have been so dry and that in a third year of drought, storage is going to be critically and increasingly important uh, as we now start to contemplate a fourth year of drought and what might come next. We do update these weekly and we do project that the curtailments will expand uh, in the relatively near future in the next couple of weeks as demand increases. Demand does increase substantially in April and uh, as con conditions continue to remain dry despite today's rain. We do have uh, additional requirements on some larger diverters. I wanna highlight the enhanced reporting uh, the enhanced reporting is those that divert more than about 5,000 acre feet per year. We were asking those diverters to essentially forecast how much they would divert in the month ahead as a way to help better tailor the curtailments and create a, a more precise or refined uh, expectation for those curtailments. And we've noticed a significant drop off in compliance in reporting. Uh, the first month it was up around 90% and it's dropped off to now the chart on the side shows about 30%. Uh, you know, at that level, we really can't use the data, unfortunately, because there's such a significant lack of compliance. Uh, it's not necessarily sufficient enough to give us that estimate of what might be coming. And so that may be something that we continue to reach out via our enforcement team or other mechanisms to see if we can uh, get a little bit better compliance in the near future. Next slide, please. Talking a little bit more about the Delta data in particular, uh, data drives the water unavailability methodology for the Delta watershed. And that water unavailability methodology is what we essentially use to determine should we be looking at a curtailment in this watershed or not. The forecasted supply data, we start to talk about where this data comes from. It comes from outside sources. Uh, we rely heavily on the Department of Water Resources Bulletin 120 information. We also rely very heavily on the California Nevada River Forecast Center full natural flow forecasts that are provided uh, through federal agencies and the, uh, I believe it's the Desert Research Institute, but I can maybe follow up on that. Uh, the other data we, we rely on is self-reported. And so this is the actual diversion data that 
all water right uh, holders and claimants are required to report annually to the board. It comes in monthly increments and uh, usually is reported around April 1st or July 1st of each year. The uh, issues and difficulties that sometimes we have with that annual reported data is the quality assurance and quality checks that sometimes go into a more modern system. We often see very significant reporting errors, not intentionally, uh, but it's very easy to mix up sometimes uh, gallons and acre feet. And you can imagine if you're reporting in acre feet, what you measured in gallons that will very significantly uh, change the estimates for your watershed or sub watershed. Staff do go through and try and correct that data as best we can, but we don't always catch everything. And there are some smaller errors that uh, are harder to catch. Maybe you miss a decimal point from time to time. Uh, it's still a substantial error, but it may not be as grand as you know, a full unit conversion error. But that's the best data we have. And that's the data we have to rely on, uh, even though it does come in after the fact, sometimes by as much as 18 months. Recent legislation is gonna help start to streamline the reporting deadlines. It's gonna collapse this April 1st and July 1st timeline into a single date. That's gonna come over a couple of years and that's gonna be a great help, but it's still gonna take a couple of years to get there. We take all that data, we ingest it, and we essentially come up with a determination of water unavailability by priority of right and implementation or essentially implement those uh, curtailment actions. And uh, do credit to the staff that do this work. They were featured as one of the SSAs a couple of months ago, but this is the Delta drought team uh, that works tirelessly and runs these scenarios sometimes multiple times per day, uh, multiple times per week, and is constantly updating, tweaking, adjusting the data that goes into it to make sure that we are doing you know, the most precise curtailments that we possibly can in maximizing the beneficial uses uh, of the water rights, the priority of the water rights, but also protecting resources and other senior right holders. And it's a, a complicated task. And you know, again, hats off to the staff that do that and a huge thanks to them. Uh, next slide, please. The thing that we want to highlight here is that the water unavailability methodology is all driven by publicly available data. So all of that comes from data that anyone else can access uh, and you know, kind of ingest and manipulate and work. When I say manipulate data, I don't mean manipulate in the negative sense. I mean, you know, transform it into a pivot table or put it into a format that makes it easier to graph. Sometimes data scientists refer to manipulating data a little bit differently than I think maybe the public does. Uh, but it's all publicly available and we all rely on it. We maintain multiple online lists and interactive tools and visualizations to help explain how that data is used and transformed and visualized. We have an interactive curtailment status list, a water unavailability uh, visualization and a Power BI or compilation. It's essentially a, a Microsoft tool that helps visualize data and data sets. And we'll step through some of those in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So here is a screenshot, it's a little bit hard to see, uh, but this is the Delta Interactive Curtailment Status List. And this allows any right holder or claimant to go in and online and basically see if they are currently curtailed or not. And it's a, a pretty simple uh, color-coded matrix. Green means not curtailed and red means you're curtailed. And you can enter in search by your water right ID, you can search by owner name, water right type, uh, your sub watershed, or if you're in the legal delta. And that tool on its own, uh, again, uh, huge thanks to staff for compiling it, putting it together and getting it in this visualization. It is a huge step forward and it provides an immensely beneficial tool for all diverters in the curtailed watersheds. And again, this one's specific to the delta, but we have similar tools in the Russian River and the Shasta, and I'll, I'll show those in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. The other things that you can do in this visualization tool is look at the watersheds and sub watersheds specifically. So here we've broken out uh, or show, show a map essentially that shows uh, the Sacramento watershed and the San Joaquin watershed. And you can look by priority of right and it breaks it down into some binned levels of demand that's that color coded bar that's kind of in the middle. And you can search by uh, the different uh, 
priorities of right and kind of help sort that and confine it and look at if you're interested in a specific like time range or priority range, you can do that as well. Next slide, please. And then uh, lastly, it also helps us track compliance. So we can look, the, the leftmost map shows the subwatersheds in the Delta. And that's just basically showing the compliance of cert certification filed by subwatershed. So it's looking at you know, the information that we sent out last August, basically asking people to come in and say, did you receive the uh, curtailment order and are you going to comply with it? Uh, we've been tracking about the same level of compliance for a while, and you can see which watersheds have complied better than others. Uh, you know, the, the the heat map there, I think, is extremely illustrative and informative. It's also uh, helpful for us internally to help prioritize where we might want to follow up with inspections, uh, just additional outreach efforts, phone calls. Again, you know, I, I sometimes talk about enforcement, but enforcement is usually our last step. We try everything else in advance to make or, or try and help people comply, just you know, work through questions. Uh, I know staff sit with people on the phone and talk through them if they have issues or concerns or can't figure it out. And that's actually helped a ton. It's also in part, I think, a reflection of the size of the diversion. If we consider how many uh, diversions are in the Delta watershed. There's about 17,000 that we're aware of or that have reported. There may be more, some that haven't reported, uh, and some riparian rights that turn on and off from year to year or occasionally. But a lot of them are very small, and it's only about you know, 600, 700 uh, rights that probably account for 90, 95% of all the diversions within that watershed. And there's a vast, vast majority that may be less than an acre foot per year, less than a couple of acre feet per year. And during these critical drought years, we can prioritize where we reach out and which types of diversions, the sizes of diversions that we may want to focus and prioritize. And so the other uh, columns there just basically highlight some of the other things that have come in, the exceptions to the human health and safety and the uh, claims of non-consumptive use. Next slide, please. Uh, so that, that's a high level overview of the Delta more broadly. Within the Delta, we do have mill and deer creeks also. Uh, there's a slightly different, or maybe more than slightly, there's a, a different approach in mill and deer in that there are in-stream flow requirements that have been submitted by uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the curtailments within mill and deer creek are structured around preserving a minimum in-stream flow of 50 cubic feet per second. Uh, that went into an effect October 15th of last year, and that flow has been maintained ever since. Uh, there are ongoing conversations with diverters in both watersheds regarding the potential for voluntary processes going forward. And we may be able to provide some additional information there in the next couple of months. Next slide, please. I'm going to transition then away from the Delta and start talking a little bit more about the Russian River. Uh, curtailment status as of right now, curtailments are suspended through April 1st. We are going to take another look the last week of March to see if that uh, curtailments can continue or whether, or sorry, whether the suspension can continue or whether we'll need to start implementing additional curtailments based on what we are expecting to see. Uh, demand again increases in April as irrigation season picks up. Uh, storage is still pretty low and I'll show that slide in a moment. We do anticipate significant curtailments beginning in April. Uh, we're also looking at whether or not we will need to continue the emergency regulation that authorized the curtailment orders. And uh, the emergency regulation was adopted June 15th of last year. Uh, if it needs to be updated, it can be updated again by the board, but we'll need to bring it to the board a little bit earlier to make sure that there's no lapse in coverage. And so we do anticipate bringing something to the board uh, in May for their consideration regarding continuing the emergency regulation in the Russian River. We do anticipate having some stakeholder engagement prior to that. And in fact, we're already beginning that process. Uh, we do again have similar interactive tools and there's a powered BI dashboard that uh, 
folks can access to essentially look at who's complied with the curtailment certifications and what the curtailment status is as well. Next slide, please. Uh, you've seen this graph before. The red segment shows changes in Lake Mendocino storage in the upper part of the Russian River since that October storm, that October atmospheric river where uh, basically year to date, we've went from about 12,000 acre feet storage uh, in October to about 43,000 acre feet now. It has been kind of staying consistent right around 42 and a half, increasing by maybe 100 or 200 acre feet per week over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the uh, Question is whether or not that continues to gain a little bit or in April continues to, or as, as irrigation demands pick up, uh, whether that may decrease. Uh, we are modeling and looking at what summer flows might be in the Russian River. And uh, based on what we're seeing so far, uh, anticipate deep curtailments in the Russian River system beginning very early in the season this year. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that to be alarmist, but saying it to begin preparation and planning because it is an extremely dry year and uh, it will be different than it was last year with earlier and deeper curtailments coming sooner. Uh, next slide, please. Again, so uh, I noted I borrowed this slide from Sam Cole. I wanna turn it over to Sam Cole who will talk through the DRAT effort in the Russian River watershed. What is DRAT? And then show some, I think, interesting slides and maps of how it's been applied. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sam Cole. Yeah, good morning, folks. Um, this is Sam Cole. I believe I'm live. All right. So yeah, I just wanted to briefly touch on this slide again before going into a bit more detail on the water availability analysis in the Russian River. So pictured on the right here is a kind of a cartoon chart that demonstrates um, the basic concept behind the water availability analysis, which is just assessing supply versus demand. So uh, in general, if supply is greater than demand, we have a surplus, but when supply is less than demand, we have a shortage. Um, and while those principles remain true, we do have some added complexity in that both the supply and the demand are distributed both temporally and spatially. So geographically and over time. So in addition to the how much question, um, how much water is available and how much uh, demand is there, we also have to consider other questions such as when and where is the water available and when and where are the diversions taking place? Uh, so next slide. All right, so how do we put all of the data, the the who, the where, the when, and how much together to calculate water availability. Well, that's where the drought water rights allocation tool or simply DRAT um, comes into play. So this was developed under contract originally with uh, UC Davis during the previous drought uh, to do just, just that. And it does it in a way that is quantitative, transparent, open source, inexpensive to implement and relatively easy to learn. Now, um, I'm not gonna go into too much of the nuts and bolts on the equations here, but you can see a few of them on the right. Um, and I will say these formulations along with the user manual, the Python code, and many other resources are available through the board's GitHub page at the link shown on this slide. And we do strongly encourage folks to dive into those details if, if, if they want to and have the capacity to. Um, but you know, at its core, DRAT is, it's simply just a set of mathematical equations that represent essentially two things, a goal, and the rules to follow, almost like a game. So the rules fall generally into three categories, your geography, your physics, and your legal priority. Um, and so geography is basically recognizing the fact that water is spatially distributed based on rainfall, land use, geology. Uh, it's basically saying that one basin might have a different flow than its neighboring basin. Um, the physics is, is real basic stuff, so we're saying, water can't be created or destroyed and water can't flow uphill. Um, and then as far as the legal priority goes, those rules really only kick in when there's a shortage. And it basically describes, you know, how do you divvy up the water according to the law? And I'll touch on that in a, in a bit more in the next slide. Um, 
But I also just wanted to, to say that what DRAT does is, that, you know, there might be many ways to allocate water to users, but there might only be one optimal way. Um, and that'd be optimizing for both maximum allocation of the water resource, but also minimizing the shortage uh, while still following those rules. And that's, that's what the linear programming solver that's behind DRAT does. It basically just finds that optimal solution while following the rules that we give it. Um, so next slide. So a bit more on those legal priority rules. In California, as I'm sure most, most folks know, water is allocated using a priority system, general, generally first in time, first in right, but with the caveat that there are two distinct priority systems, the riparian and the appropriate regimes. So this image, courtesy of Jay Lund and the, the team at UC Davis, kind of succinct, succinctly illustrates the main differences. So when a shortage occurs under the riparian system, folks have to correlatively share that pain. So everyone gets progressively less and less of the water that they that they might um, have demand for versus the appropriative system, which means water is allocated in order of priority until you run out. So the risk there is that the ju you know, juniors might receive zero while seniors receive full allotments. Um, so these two systems are basically described in those rules through mathematical equations in DRAT. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm gonna walk you through kind of visually um, how we applied this to the Russian River. So pictured here is the Russian River watershed uh, on the North Coast of California. So the blue line represents the main stem of the Russian River. And this goes all the way up to those East and West Fork headwaters up at the top there. Next slide. Um, and so the first step is developing the supply flow uh, data, time series data. Um, and there's several options for obtaining the supply flow data. Um, you know, each data set has its own list of pros and cons. And often it's, it's either working with kind of what you have available or finding a balance between better accuracy versus better resolution, um, both from, you know, spatial and temporal resolution. But in the case of the Russian River, we are relying on physical based numerical surface water runoff hydrologic models. Um, and, I, and I won't get into the details on how the models work, but the models basically use mathematical representations of the physical processes that are happening in the watershed. Um, and you can see in the image on the right, it basically has different ways of representing the mass balance of water, for example, from pre precipitation and the energy balance that takes place from the sun, evaporation, evapotranspiration, and others. Um, the advantage of having a, a, a model like this is that we can, it also allows us to sort of project into the future by generating basically the input data sets, those meteorological data sets, which is really just daily time series of like rain and temperature data. Um, and so we can either develop those based on historical uh, data or by pulling data from external sources external sources such as the California Nevada River Forecast Center um, and, de and developing basically a future forecast of what might happen. And, and we're doing, we're using both of those sources currently in the Russian River. Uh, next slide, please. So these, this, this image is basically just trying to show you these are the actual modeled outputs um, from the, uh, from the hydrologic models. So you can see what that allows us to do is figure out where the water is spatially distributed throughout the watershed. Uh, next slide, please. And what that spatially distributed flow allows us to do is basically split the watershed into these sub basins, uh, which are the different colored polygons you see here. So the basin delineations typically start with a single point that represents the, the drainage outlet of that basin. And that point may be a, you know, a significant hydrologic node um, where you want to be able to distinguish between two branches of water coming in, for example, or it could be where maybe there's an existing gauge. So you wanna be able to compare the measured flows versus your modeled flows at that point. Um, or it could just be some other type of prioritized location of interest for a number of other reasons. Um, uh, next slide, please. So we delineate those sub-basins to basically better represent that interconnected network of rivers and streams that are in the watershed. Basically applying those rules that I described earlier of physics and geography by mathematically describing the connectivity between these basins, which then tells us 
how water rights are connected to each other, but also how those water rights are connected to the supply flows. Um, so we basically convert these real streams and rivers into simpler basin schematics, and then use code to automatically build a basin connectivity matrix, the user connectivity matrix. B basically, these matrices are used by directly by DRAT in calculating those optimal allocations and shortages. Next slide, please. So we can add the demand data in. Um, each dot shown here is a point of diversion that has been identified as basically representative of the total diversion for a given water right. And the colors indicate water rights that share a basin with one another. So same color, same basin. Um, the division of water rights has developed a methodology to standardize and improve the accuracy of water diversion use data. Um, and those tools, procedures, documentation, and code is available on the board's drought website under the drought tools and methods section. And uh, the link is shown on the slide here as well. And that methodology is intended to be updated regularly as needed based on feedback from interested parties and lessons learned through implementation. Uh, next slide, please. So ultimately the results of DRAT can be used in combination with a thorough understanding of sort of the major water rights in a given watershed, including you know, relevant terms and conditions to support the formal regulatory decision on whether curtailments should be issued to protect senior water right holders in the event that there is a shortage. Um, pictured here is an interactive mapping tool that effectively implements these curtailments. Um, and the information is also available in tabular format on our webpage. Uh, right now you can see uh, this was this was screenshot was just taken the other day. Um, and there's no curtailments right now in the Russian river. So the map's all green everywhere. But as things dry out, uh, we may start to see sort of shortages which would show up in yellow and curtailed rights, which would show up in red. Um, so this helps us kind of manage sort of on the fly and uh, quasi real time, right? It allows for more rapid response to events, such as the large storm event that we saw happen in October of last year, which allowed us to lift curtailments in anticipation of that event. Um, and the tool draft can be used for things not just like this, but also support a whole host of other regulatory planning activities by kind of projecting out into the future uh, to the extent that we can. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate you that uh, deep dive, uh, Sam. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I appreciate um, as well that we're making sure that we're publishing here, both on GitHub and our website, all the methodologies so that everyone can actually uh, track along, you know, check our homework and, and here engage with, as you can see, is not an uncomplicated endeavor trying to figure out how best to you know, walk through curtailment here, uh, given sometimes the, the lack of uh, quality data. Um, but I think that you know, when I think of this last year, when I think of the work that the board has had to do, um, this has been just incredible to see the advancement and what we've been able to apply, the, the faith and trust of water rights holders themselves to say, yes, we need to enact the priority system. Yes, uh, we need to be help guide through um, this, this incredible drought in a way that ensures that we're maximizing the beneficial use and, and, and balance, balancing ultimately what are these impacts in the watersheds. And so just you know, incredible kudos and thanks. And I appreciate uh, having this deep dive as a basis for folks here that are, are following along the board's work and maybe are interested in, in, in helping to um, better develop uh, these tools and or even to understand what it is the board is doing as we undertake these curtailments. Um, so just incredible thanks. Um, board member Firestone, please. Uh, yeah, echo that appreciation and um, and just, uh, you know, the, the um, importance of transparency and access with this really complex <laughs> work. Um, I had a couple questions. One was just back to the slide, what I was just curious about is whether um, the supply, whether the overall demand um, during times of shortage is significantly higher. And I'm guessing that's if it was, that that would be because of lack of precipitation. And so needing to make up for that um, by diverting more. Um, but I, I wasn't sure if that 
if, if that was part of the meaning of the slide or if it was more just um, overall trying to show that, you know, it, what shortage is. Yeah, no, th there's a couple of factors that can drive that supply demand ratio, I guess, that difference. And the first, I, I think, is, as you've noted, precipitation. If we get a number of storms throughout the winter and then even into the spring, it reduces the need for you know supplemental irrigation, pre-irrigation, and that type of uh, use. The other is sometimes demand, and you wouldn't think that maybe necessarily, or sorry, uh, storage rather. Uh, storage can also factor into that difference if you're able to rely, say, on your own water right versus a contracted water right. Uh, land use changes will drive some of that a little bit. So there are uh, some rights that turn on and off depending on maybe uh, a irrigation district or farmer is uh, replacing their uh, tree crop that year and you know they're ripping things out as opposed to planting. There, there's a lot of things that can drive that. And then the other is just evapotranspiration. So if you have a cooler uh, spring cloud cover that does decrease then just evaporative loss and that can factor in as well, temperatures as well. So a number of different things, we do see fluctuations and we do see reported demand differences as well that are pretty considerable. Now, whether that's a QAQC issue, whether that's a reporting issue, whether it's all those things plus actual changes in demand, uh, that is a larger and more complicated question sometimes. Great, thank you. Um, Another question I have is uh, within, uh, I guess this methodology, and then I think maybe more, this may be a more general comment uh, or question is um, just where there are in-stream or other quantitative flow requirements um, that are built in uh, as opposed to areas where there's not. Um, and you know, I think it would be interesting to see, I know you went over like Mill and Deer Creek, for example, we have quantitative in-stream flow requirements um, within the emergency regs. And so just interested if we could see, and I don't know that you have it now, um, but either in the future, more generally where we have those and where we don't, um, both I got, I, both in the, the emergency curtailments and then more permanently, um, and then, and then I guess more specifically to this, are we including any um, in-stream flow or quantitative flow requirements within the, whether it's demand, it doesn't look like we are in, in it, my understanding, but. It, it, uh, it, I'll answer the last question first. Uh, are we incorporating in-stream demands into DRAT? Uh, Sometimes yes, sometimes no, we can, I guess is the broader answer. And under the pure application of the priority system, you curtail to zero, so, right? So you would dry up the entire stream if you're simply following the water rights priority system. Uh, but what DRAT does do is allow you to set that threshold. So you can set it at zero, you can set it at some other number to incorporate uh, those in-stream flow requirements. There aren't any in-stream flow requirements in much of the watershed. There is uh, in-stream flow requirement related to Sonoma County Water Agency and releases from Lake Mendocino. And we do maintain that, and that is part of the curtailment process and consideration. In terms of the other question, where do we have uh, existing in-stream flow requirements? Uh, that's something that Sam has actually worked on previously and is displayed in part in the water resilience portfolio we can probably excerpt some of that in the next couple of meetings. Uh, but we've basically done that analysis by region. I believe there's also uh, a website compilation. And maybe, Sam, I'll, I'll look to you if you want to jump in here that we do maintain and people can look up online as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as part of the adoption of the cannabis policy, um, the you know we had a CEQA exemption. And, and part of the requirement was that we did not relax any existing standards. Um, in implementing those, developing and implementing those uh, those in-stream flow requirements on cannabis cultivators or for diversion related to cannabis cultivation. Um, and so what that meant is that we had to basically generate a, uh, a list of, in of existing in-stream flow requirements throughout the state um, and, and map out where they were so that we knew uh, whether 
whether a, a given cannabis cultivator would be required to, um, you know, follow, maintain the in-stream flow requirements that are developed through the policy or the existing requirements. And there is in fact an online mapping tool. Um, if you go to basically the cannabis page uh, and there's, there's a couple of mapping tools. One of them is the daily mapping tool that folks are required to go to. But then if you scroll down, there's a, a link there to the existing flow requirements one and it has a statewide map that shows, uh, it's an interactive statewide map where you can zoom in and see the different uh, rivers and streams that have in-stream flow requirements and click on them and it'll actually pop up information that shows, um, you know, kind of a, in tabular format monthly, like what those flow requirements will be and also provides uh, links to the documentation where you can read more about those flow requirements. I think the other thing I want to add, and this is a, it's a complicated topic to integrate, but it's an important one to consider uh, that even with those in-stream flow requirements in place, the board doesn't have the authority to issue curtailment orders unless there is a regulation in place or we've adopted those as part of a water quality control plan or some other implementing mechanism. And in many parts of the state, we have not done that. Uh, so if there's an in-stream flow requirement, say recommended, we don't have the authority to tell people to stop diverting without the emergency regulations that we have in place right now. Uh, potentially there could be permanent regulations adopted without an emergency in place, but we don't have those currently. And so if the uh, emergency drought proclamation goes away, so does our authority to implement the related curtailment orders. And so that adds a wrinkle into how we approach and how we uh, look at those instrument filler requirements and, and other work within the division. And we're actively trying to address that, but it's a longer, uh, more complicated process. Great, thanks. And if there's, um... Yeah, if there's a way of, of helping with that visualization or understanding um, in sort of future drought updates, that's helpful. I, I guess um, is so um, in the current, just so I'm following, in the current drought, uh, drought <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> model and application, um, even, I guess even in sub watersheds or watersheds where there are um, in stream flow requirements or either an emergency adopted through emergency regs with curtailment or um, sounds like not very many, if at all, more permanently. Um, although I didn't follow if the Russian river shed has some permanent or or not that are um, able to be implemented through curtailments. I'm just wondering, so we, it sounds like we have the capability of doing that. Should that be um, adopted in the future or maybe where that is incorporated into the emergency curtailment regs, but that um, are we actually building that in yet? Or are we, are we applying that at this point? I to paraphrase, and please correct me if I'm, I'm off track, uh, where we have those in-stream flow requirements in place, we do incorporate them. Uh, where we don't have them in place, then clearly we don't. In DRAT, we do have the capability of you know, setting that base at that in-stream flow requirement. Uh, there are in-stream flow requirements for the main stem of the Russian River related to uh, Sonoma County Water Agency and the uh, operation of Lake Mendocino and uh, keeping kind of uh, in-stream flows in that upper watershed in particular. Otherwise, though, there are no existing in-stream flow requirements in the rest of the watershed. And that's... Um... And that just to your kind of last point about whether we can um, issue curtailments based on those in-stream flows. So the ones for um, uh, Sonoma are uh, able to be, are, are they incorporated into our curtailment um, emergency regs? Just remind yes. me. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, 
I had one other question, but I, I'm vice chair, if you wanted to go on this topic. I, okay, so one other question, and this is really just a note on um, for future, uh, request for future um, drought updates is just, I, I saw that DWR has a new live tool around groundwater. And I know in the past um, that's been a limitation is just not having great data available on groundwater changes. Um, and so just in the future, it'd be great to, to get some overview within the um, drought hydrological conditions of, um, of just groundwater levels and um, how they may be changing. Because I think that's an additional kind of acute problem that we're all concerned about. Okay, we, we can coordinate internally with uh, exec and, and other teams to figure out who's the right uh, group to do that. And maybe it's worth also flagging for the, the public watching that you know the Division of Water Rights actually does not regulate groundwater. And the division doesn't have the authority to uh, regulate groundwater. There's a pathway through some Sigma uh, outcomes, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but we don't permanent wells, we don't uh, limit pumping, we don't track pumping, we don't measure pumping, they don't report to us. And so the Department of Water Resources does have a, a quasi voluntary process called CASGEM, the California Statewide Groundwater Elevation Monitoring Program. And they do collect bi yearly, so twice a year uh, samples, and then they have now put those up on their interactive website. The data is still twice a year. So it's going to still be a little bit uh, static or out of date, but we can work with our Sigma team within the board and uh, figure out who's best to incorporate that groundwater information as part of the drought update. Thank you, Mr. Actal. Really appreciate that. And thank you, board member. Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, I hadn't planned on raising this issue, but just um, uh, in uh, follow up to what Mr. Ekdahl, what you just said about groundwater, um, uh, that wouldn't necessarily be the case where uh, there seems to be uh, interactivity, interaction between uh, the stream and the groundwater pumping. So for example, on the Russian, you're looking at that connection and um, uh, whether or not uh, the, any future regulation might encompass those groundwater pumpers. No, that's a, a great comment and reminder. Uh, and I think the, the watershed where we're most directly looking at groundwater in the context of drought is the Scott watershed in Siskiyou County, where we in fact did issue curtailments to interconnected groundwater. Uh, and that's the first time we've done that in a, in a drought context uh, the Russian River is a place where we're actively considering. I mentioned earlier that uh, we're anticipating bringing something to the board in May for your consideration for readoption. Uh, and we're actively contemplating whether or not to incorporate groundwater into that as we go forward. Uh, we've modeled or estimated what we're calling breach losses, how much water essentially disappears between what's released at Lake Mendocino and what makes it down to Healdsburg. And the reach losses are on the order of 3,000 to 4,000 acre feet per month uh, within that upper watershed area. Some of that is riparian vegetation, just trees and other things kind of growing along the, the river or their vegetation. But we think that's only about you know 900 or so acre feet out of this 10,000 acre feet that is otherwise disappearing. And the rest of that is likely related to groundwater pumping. Uh, and you know, sometimes those wells are located very close to the stream and it's almost a one-to-one -one connection. Even though it's a well, you're actually pulling directly from the surface water. It gets more complicated the farther you move from the main stem of the river. Uh, there's a depletion factor and a timeline delay and it depends on the size of the well, the depth, the volume, how long you're pumping in duration. Uh, and so that's something that we look to start engaging with stakeholders on over the next couple of weeks and months. Uh, in fact, we have some meetings coming up in the next couple of weeks to walk through that. But it is something that we have approached in some of these contexts. The other nuance in the Russian River is this thing called underflow. And without going into gory detail, those are wells where legally it's surface water. Uh, 
and that's kind of a, a legacy of some archaic uh, understanding of how groundwater worked from the 1800s carried over into the 1913 water right law that we still work with today and we're uh, kind of stuck with those ramifications but uh, I'm trying to work best with what regulatory and legal tools that we have. Thank you for that. So yeah, I just had um, uh, a, a comment and a question here. So first of all, the comment, big picture, um, it's tax season. And so I can't help but think of taxes and how this relates to um, taxes in some way, because uh, the way our tax system works best is through voluntary compliance. And I think for those of us who use accountants, there's some sense of trust. And uh, for those that are um, afraid, really afraid of the IRS stepping in, that makes you wanna comply. And so I just wanna compliment you for um, putting out this information and for um, layering on additional tools above and beyond what we had last year and want to confirm that in fact, you're rolling this out to stakeholders. I'm hoping when you do these drought updates, maybe doing um, a notice um, for those that have signed up uh, on the Lyris list where you know you're going to be talking more specifically about certain watersheds and providing additional information that might be helpful because I know staff resources are scarce. And so the, you know, the more meetings and workshops, that's great, but then also just flagging this as an additional opportunity for folks. And so um, I'm just really um, excited about these additional tools, but in order to get at that trust level, sort of like and how you feel about your accountant, we still have a long way to go uh, because this is new information. And so the, the more that it's out there and the more opportunities that the uh, stakeholders have, to go through it, ask questions, you know, not certainly not at, at these meetings, but you know, for additional stakeholder meetings and workshops where folks really have an opportunity to drill in and ask those questions. And I've just been very um, impressed where stakeholders have raised concerns uh, that the division um, has been, uh, I'm thinking in particular on some issues that occurred in the Bay Delta watershed um, uh, to, to sit down and meet with stakeholders and then adjust, adjust whether it's the methodology or hopefully these tools, um, you know, being responsive, which helps to provide for greater accuracy and also greater trust at the same time. So um, my question uh, specifically is on the, uh, this tool on, on drought. And um, it's, it's, my, it's my sense, and I just wanna make sure I'm correct here, that in the last regulation on the Russian River, you were using storage levels as a surrogate to in incorporate all the things that this tool would otherwise be doing, perhaps with greater precision. So example, the, the water unavailability analysis, the human health and safety, the, the fish flow requirements by Sonoma County, and then evaporative losses. This uses a different approach to get at um, a similar result, although hopefully um, more accurately. I'm seeing you nod your head. I just wanted to make yes. sure that that's how I, I understand. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Great. And as we look forward, or you know, not looking forward, but as we anticipate work in the watershed and curtailments, we do anticipate using DRAP for the upper watershed as well this year. At least that's our initial plan uh, so that rather than tying to those lake level triggers, we can do the more precise you know, sub watershed or geographic approach that this tool does allow. Uh, at least that's the, the initial plan. Uh, so we, we still do have some slides left and I'll, I'll move through them very quickly. Uh, and again, thank you for giving us the, the time and opportunity to spend a little bit more time uh, to, to run through some of this. And hopefully this does also allow uh, Director Nemeth to, to come online, uh, but no worries if not. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Scott and Shasta River. So switching geographic range uh, in the Scott, all curtailments are suspended through March 18th. Uh, in the Shasta, all curtailments are suspended through March 31st. Although I got word late last night that uh, flows in the Shasta are dropping, have dropped below 135 and uh, they're anticipated to keep dropping. 
And so it is likely that we will consider turning some of the curtailments back on in the Shasta in the very near future, if not today, then maybe uh, later this week. Uh, and again, we believe it's related to just very dry conditions and the start of the irrigation season coming earlier than anticipated. Uh, we also want to note that we have received our first proposed local cooperative solution. Uh, it is under review by staff and there's a website where uh, folks can go and take a look. I note that we just put web page and links to it and uh, we'll follow up in the future and make sure we actually have the, the typed out URL. But uh, if you search under our drought website, you should be able to come to it pretty quickly. Uh, Next slide, please. Here again, we show the, the Scott River. Uh, we are above the in-stream flow requirement at this time. Uh, the green arrows indicate when we've made modifications to the curtailments, usually by suspending them. Uh, and you know, we, we've had a lot of notifications that we're suspending it and we're taking it kind of you know, week by week or two week time chunks, but uh, also trying to be as precise as we can. You can see those fluctuations in the flow where it has dipped below the the threshold from time to time. Uh, we're trying to be as precise and responsive as we can. And a huge uh, thanks to the diverters in the watershed for uh, working with us. It's been very responsive and uh, kind of working through us as we do send a lot of notifications and emails. So again, thank you there. Next slide, please. You can see the Shasta here where things have dipped a little bit in the last couple of uh, days and staff are actively identifying. You know, there's a pretty big step there uh, and what might be causing that. It could be related to a specific set of uh, actually groundwater wells located very close to a stream turning on, uh, resulting in a pretty significant change in flows. But staff are actively working on identifying that and what those issues are. Uh, next slide, please. We did also want to note that there is now a Power BI dashboard similar to what we showed in the Scott and, or sorry, in, in the Russian and the Delta, uh, where folks can go on and look at the uh, relative level of curtailment and whether an individual right is curtailed or not, and then look at it on a map as well. Next slide, please. Uh, we have, I think, one slide here, and I did note that Director Nemeth has joined. I would propose that we run through our last two slides real quickly and then turn it over to our colleagues from the Department of Water Resources. We'll finish up very shortly. Uh, and with that, uh, maybe turn this slide over to Julie Rosardo, who I believe is on. She's our branch chief for the enforcement permitting branch. Thank you, Eric. Um, so um, just a quick water right enforcement update. In the Scott and Shasta rivers, we're preparing to issue administrative civil liability orders on uh, March 21st. So those orders will start going out. Um, and I wanted to explain that this is following a very lengthy period of intense technical assistance and multiple notifications um, on the informal enforcement side, helping people um, comply. Now we're moving into the more formal um, ACL orders. Um, we also um, want to note that this is for diverters who um, failed to respond to information orders and also for diverters who failed to fill out curtailment certification forms. Um, in the Scott and Shasta watersheds, we have 30 pending complaint investigations that we're working through. Um, then moving to the Sacramento and San Joaquin watersheds, um, we've investigated and closed 25 complaints this winter um, during the period while curtailments were suspended. Um, and just as a reminder, we do this year round. We investigate water right complaints throughout the state. So this is our business as usual. It just gets much busier during drought. Um, the next activity we anticipate um, is term 91 curtailments um, to be doing inspections on those um, in 2022 here. Um, then for Russian River Watershed, we have already issued 60 final administrative civil liability orders, um, as previously reported, and we have 15 pending complaint investigations. Um, just want to tie in with Water Data Month. 
the various compliance dashboards that you've seen today, the online integrated maps and all these fantastic data sets we're providing to the public, they're so important. They not only help us manage compliance, but they help um, diverters and the general public to understand what these requirements are in a very easy to understand way. Um, and to me, that is, that is what these interactive tools are all about. Uh, back to you, Eric. Thanks, Julie. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so more on water data month, uh, the Office of Information Management and Assessment uh, maintains a data visualization of the day every day through month and uh, every day of the month. And for folks that are interested, the link is there. Uh, it's got some really cool graphs and visualizations and just other maps and, and things related to water data. I encourage everyone to check it out. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a, a screen capture of some of the things that are available there. And there's a hashtag that goes with it. Uh, next slide, please. And then this, this is our, our last uh, slide. One other thing to note that we will be issuing a dry year warning letter. Uh, either later this week or early next week. This is similar to what was released last year, but it's essentially going out to every water right holder or claimant in the state, noting that uh, things are very dry and they should plan accordingly. Uh, again, that will be posted in our drought webpage when it goes out. Encourage folks to sign up to our subscription list. And just as a wrap up on our set of things, uh, all the, the compliments that we've received from the board members today on the visualizations and the graphs, all credit goes to the staff that have been planning and working on you know, these issues and comments since the last drought and recognizing that uh, these things were needed. They've been planning since you know, 2013 on how to implement some of this and we're seeing the outcomes now. All credit to them and their immense uh, just forethought and work kind of moving through things. And so with that, I'll turn it over then to well, board members Thank if you. there's any questions yeah. and then to the other agencies. Thank you so much, Eric. And and uh, compliments go to your incredible leadership through all this as well. Um, it's you know, and I appreciate the deep dive on just you know, the methodologies again. And and to Vice Chair's point, um, our 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 goal here is to help folks comply. You know, we're not we're not play, trying to play gotcha in a really critical time, but we have to enforce. You know, rights come with responsibilities as well, and particularly in uh, circumstances like this that we find ourselves. So. Just again, we're come. Uh, we're here to be communicative, to be clear about um, the work that we're having to do in curtailment. Uh, but uh, I think here flagging particularly that uh, you know uh, uh, demand assessment for the coming month. You know that's really important for water rights holders to be communicating to the board, to be letting us know what what you anticipate your demands uh, to be, so that we can really balance what are going to be some really challenging months ahead. So. Just wanted to, to flag that and thank everyone for just the incredible engagement and work and the continued work. And uh, around that common theme, just wanna welcome Director uh, Carla Namath and Regional Director Ernest Conant, and thank you both. I know it's incredibly busy out there right now. There's a lot going on, but we really appreciate you joining us here for the update, the hydrology update and, and operations update, just to best understand what you're seeing and, and what we should be anticipating. So. Um, thank you, uh, Director uh, Namath. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uh, kick it to you first. Good morning, and uh, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. I, I want to thank you for your flexibility in, in dealing with my, my schedule this morning. Um, this is really important um, um, update uh, that uh, Regional Director Conant and I have to give. I. Um, I'm sure like probably every single Californian, if you were fortunate enough like me to wake up at 3 a.m. to the gentle pitter patter of rain, you felt a degree of relief on a, on a cellular level. Um, but it's, um, it's really turned into a, a very difficult year um, and um, we're really picking up um, where we left off in December um, in some in some important respects, um, in terms of um, focusing on drought actions, um, including a TUCP, including you know reductions in um, allocations, um, as we you know really watch the last couple of months unfold. 
Um, so I'll get started. I'm gonna uh, give a couple of slides and then uh, turn it over to uh, Mr. Conant and then he'll turn it back over to me and we can get to um, Q&A as quickly as possible. Um, so next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, um, we're gonna talk about um, our planning goals and our decision-making process. Um, for this year, we are really right in the thick of it with um, many important decisions um, still ahead of us um, about how we're gonna manage the system this year. And I would just observe um, while, you know, while the substance is, is very, very challenging, um, we are in a better position um, than we were last year because we're coming to these decisions earlier. Um, so we'll talk about um, the conditions we're experiencing right now and some of the actions we've taken to date and then up, upcoming um, and ongoing actions, which we would um, expect to be um, briefing the board on um, a particular cadence into the, into the future. So next slide, please. Um, so our planning uh, for dry 2022, these should actually look pretty familiar. This is what we were focused on in December. Um, and that's, uh, we have some health and safety priorities um, in the parlance of um, the Central Valley Project, that's um, minimum municipal um, and industrial deliveries, and then salinity management um, in, in the Bay Delta system. Also um, really important balancing that we need to do with endangered species, um, storage conservation, and then um, water deliveries um, in priority. Um, we're working on early communication for better planning. Um, I would just, you know, everywhere I go, I, I like to make a note, um, especially for members of the public who are um, really working to follow the hydrology and the decisions that um, my department makes, um, both planning for hydrology and then in response to hydrology. Um, it can be difficult to track um, and the sequence isn't always um, exactly as, as we would hope, but we are working on it and we are working on just overall improving our transparency of information that is, um, is helping us make these decisions. Um, this does put us in a position to take advantage of more tools earlier in the season um, and um, reducing our, our forecast uncertainty. Um, you may be aware that um, this year um, we uh, adopted um, some um, newer technologies, particularly in the feather watershed, but in other watersheds as well, that we think um, this is some of the, um, uh, the snow surveys that we're doing um, high in higher up in elevation um, that can help us, um, you know, continue to calibrate um, what we see relative to snowpack and then what we can anticipate as runoff into uh, river streams and reservoirs. So next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, over on the left, we're, we're still in winter at the very tail end. Um, you know, when we, when we saw you in December, um, we were working off of record low storage, um, a pretty terrific October, not so terrific November, and we were on the cusp of an epic December. Um, and so um, we were working down two tracks, one with uh, hope that we would have wetter conditions and then, um, and then drier conditions. So we are um, entering into spring um, with extremely dry conditions. So we are focused exclusively on the intensifying actions, um, how um, we evaluate um, the need for salinity barriers, um, pursue modified delta operations, um, and then in additional conservation in our various service areas. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, so go ahead there, you? Ernest, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, all right, and thank you. And, and uh, thank you, Chair Escobol and board members uh, for providing this opportunity for us to update you. Um, just a little bit about our uh, collective 2022 drought planning. Um, as Director Namath mentioned, we're using some updated methodologies in terms of uh, forecasting. Um, I think uh, a couple of months ago, uh, some members of Director Namath's staff uh, presented some detailed information to you all on what some of those uh, updates have been. 
in addition, for many of the uh, watersheds, we're now using aerial snow observatory data in order to help inform and, and verify a forecast and decision making process. Uh, we're also considering drier conditions than we normally do in decision making, uh, taking a look at a 99% exceedance for many of our decision making uh, steps. And uh, would also note that with uh, settlement contractors having less supply available this year on both systems, that leads to additional uncertainty uh, as to the quantities of water that might be available for water transfers. <clears throat> uh, next slide. <clears throat> so this graph really tells it all. I think many of you have seen this before. Um, you know, tremendous precipitation in October and December, and then it just stopped. <clears throat> and as you can see, for January and February, we had a total of 1.7 uh, inches. If you add those two together, that's the lowest of recorded history for January and February um, it, uh, in over 100 years. Uh, and, um, you know, those are the, the second and the third largest months. Uh, again, this is for the eight station index in Northern California where most of our runoff occurs uh, for the San Joaquin Valley. It's a similar picture. Um, and then as to March, you know, notwithstanding the uh, pitter patter last night on the roof that we were all welcome to hear, uh, you know, even if this storm yielded an inch or two, you can see we have a long ways to go to get to the average of 8.1 inches for March. Um, so this, this really tells the, the challenge that we have this year. And uh, coupled with that, you know, entering the third year of a drought, our reservoirs coming into this year were lower, of course, than they were coming into water year 21. Uh, and so then on the right hand side, uh, we summarize actions to date. Uh, you know, that we initially filed a TUCP in December and um, uh, determined uh, based on these earlier storms that the uh, relief that we had requested was not appropriate. It was not going to help uh, Shasta carry over. Um, and so we withdrew it um, in January, um, I guess actually December, right? Uh, Carla SWP issued an initial allocation of 15%. We withdrew then our TUCP, uh, the earlier one. Um, on February 15th, as provided by our Sacramento River settlement contracts and our exchange contracts, we made a determination for our senior water right holders that this was a critical year. And uh, then a little bit later in February, we <clears throat> issued our allocations to our water service contractors, which were zero for north and south of Delta agricultural use, 25% uh, for m &I and a 15% class one allocation but zero class two for the Friant system. <clears throat> so that uh, takes us up to date as to uh, where we've been. Um, and then uh, next slide. Um, so, uh, upcoming actions. Uh, Carl, do you want to take it from here? Sure. sure. Um, thank you, uh, Ernest. Um, I would also add there's like two data points that really got my attention um, about our hydrology. One is um, we need to hit four inches in March to avoid um, having the driest January, February, and March on record. We think this storm right now is going to provide about an inch. So um, we've got three inches to go in the next two weeks um, to avoid that, um, you know, that pretty incredible stat. Um, but we are planning for that um, stat to hold. So we would have what is effectively the driest January, February, and March um, on record in California. Um, I would also say, um, you know, I was, I was talking to uh, our state water project folks just yesterday, and um, uh, 
we were discussing how um, inflows in February um, may in fact be the peak for Oroville, which is something we've never seen. So that just really goes to show um, what's happening in the system. Um, you know, we typically, you know, rely on kind of a slow accretion of inflows into the reservoirs all the way up through the summer. And um, I think this year it's entirely possible that our inflows will, will peak in the reservoir, um, will have already peaked in the reservoir. So that's driving a lot of um, our decisions in terms of these upcoming drought actions. So um, the department um, is adjusting the 15% allocation. Um, it is, we are adjusting downward to account for um, these challenges. I should, um, I, I wanna be really clear to note, you know, that um, even with our 15% allocation, we were focused on meeting that through San Luis. So, you know, to the extent that a reduction in state water project allocation um, affects Oroville, it's, it's fairly minimal um, simply because um, we were only proposing to meet a very small percentage of our contracts. And that was for um, sort of plumbing reasons um, that Oroville was involved there. Um, but we are um, uh, planning to submit a temporary urgency change petition, um, hopefully this Friday, um, that would cover April through June. Um, we are in process of evaluating um, um, additional endangered species actions that can help support the species. Um, we are, um, um, if you recall, we did not remove the drought barrier this year. We typically remove that in the October, November timeframe. We did not do that in anticipation of um, uh, drought conditions. We, what we did do was we put a notch in it to help with fish passage, but um, we will be in a position to refill that, the notch in that barrier and put it to use again um, this year. Um, we are encouraging additional urban conservation um, efforts um, um, by uh, contractor agency. Um, I did send a letter to all of our state water contractor general managers about 10 days ago. Um, you know, once we got the, um, completed the March survey. We hadn't processed the numbers, but we knew that it's, it's only trending downward. And so um, they have been on alert for uh, the past two weeks about our, our drying conditions here. Um, and then we are engaged in um, cooperative um, efforts with the Feather and Sacramento River settlement contractors um, to reduce um, their water needs for this year um, to deal with um, really conserving water um, um, in storage. Um, and you know, ultimately um, being in as um, acceptable position as we can um, uh, by September 30th. Uh, so a lot of um, a lot of work to do. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, we are um, a, a couple other things sort of around this set of decisions um, for, that are specific to the state and federal water projects, but we are continuing um, a collaborative approach. Um, one, of, one of the ways in which we're doing that is this third bullet. bullet. Um, we have been working with um, uh, landowners in the Delta um, to voluntarily um, reduce their water use by changing crop patterns or fallowing lands. We have a lot to learn in that um, environment about um, what um, effective reduction in consumptive use looks like given the geology and um, the variability. Um, but that's a, that's a new program for this year. Um, we are continuing to invest in longer term forecast improvements, sort of the old adage of, you know, rebuilding the plane while you're flying it, that is the place we're in. Some of these longer term forecast improvements, I just want to note that they involve many partners, um, federal partners in particular, but they will also um, really necessitate um, scientific peer review. Um, and that's part of what is, you know, ultimately going to drive um, the two, three, five-year schedule, but um, that's a way in which we um, will be able to um, not just collect better information, but also really understand the completeness of the hydrologic cycle um, and the effects of, of warming temperatures on that hydrologic cycle. Um, and then, um, you know, last but not least, um, 
uh, Governor Newsom is, is ramping up the Save Our Water campaign. We have um, additional several million dollars to um, help promote that effort um, and work uh, collectively with uh, water agencies across California uh, to get that work done. Um, and then I, I would just say, um, you know, for the department and and uh, Mr. Conant can can join in, but um, we are um, having a lot of conversations with um, our Feather River settlement contractors. They're they're seeing the same situation play out. Um, just for clarity, we don't make um, decisions about that contract until April first, um, sort of by contract, but. Um, we are talking about um, what it all means and um, where we anticipate um, the, the system to be by the end of the year. There will be a lot of additional information um, in this um, TUCP application. Um, again, we want to make sure that we are as transparent as humanly possible. And by that, I mean as up-to-date information as possible, which can be a little bit of a challenge in terms of post-processing you know, our, our, our hydrology measurements, um, but that will be coming to you all on Friday. And I just want to reflect on um, the board's desire to have as much public process around that as possible. I agree that that's very important. Um, we're not doing what we had hoped to do um, uh, this year, which is to provide a full 60 days. I think um, with our kind of whiplashing hydrology, it's been uh, a little bit challenging to track. But, but that continues to be the goal is to provide the data, um, to provide it in a transparent way that supports um, the decisions that the department um, is making and the proposals that um, we are bringing to the board staff. Um, so I think that may be the last slide, but let's go ahead and check. Yeah, I think that's the last slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Namath, and thank you, uh, Director Conan, as well. Uh, I know, again, uh, these aren't uh, easy conditions or easy times out there, but I appreciate uh, the, just the, the work that uh, your folks are doing uh, with uh, folks on our team on the water rights side to have a comprehensive picture and understanding and response here across the state that takes into consideration these uh, incredible pressures on the projects but also how do we best enable and affect curtailments? How do we best manage the system watershed wide and importantly support the communities that are having to, to make the most important decision-making here on a household and, and community basis as we try to manage the state systems here as well. So I appreciate the transparency, the communicativeness and you all joining us here to, to deliver this personally. So we have a, a bit of a heads up that an application will be coming here uh, later this this week, and you know, we'll all uh, go to look to see uh, the information there, the, the the data that, as you said, is supporting your decision making, but also supports ours here. And and again, the continuum of decision making that we know is so critical in this drought times uh, for uh, actual communities here. So, uh, just thank you. Any questions from uh, fellow board colleagues here um, for uh, either directors or or any of the work um, here before us? Okay. Uh, board member Firestone, please. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. Um, uh, just echo all of that and appreciate the really clear priorities um, and leadership on the changes you're adopting. And, um, you know, the huge challenge that we're facing this year, um, which I, I appreciate is means really um, significant hardship across the board. And, um, I, one thing I'm curious about, and this may be something that you are um, discussing in other in, in other forums, or I think was touched on in our um, order on the, the last TUCP, was just um, how health and safety allocations are defined. And if that's in a, I just don't know, is that in a formal codified policy, or is it something that continues to evolve as we are confronting this new reality of, of having to go that low? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. And um, we are, for health and safety, we are, you know, using the board's previous direction, which is 55 gallons per capita per day. Um, we are, as things tighten, we are digging deeper to understand what um, alternative supplies um, certain agencies have. Um, 
but um, but right now we're looking at 55 gallons per capita per day as as the direction. And um, but I would also just reflect that that in and of itself is evolving and needs to evolve as um, Californians become more efficient in their water use. Yeah, and I would <clears throat> echo that uh, we have a formal uh, M&I shortage policy. It's based on 55 gallons per person, uh, similar to the state. Um, and it, it, we have certain flexibilities moved in, built into that, uh, but that's the policy that we use for several years and will continue to use for this year. Great, thanks, that's really helpful. Um, and then my other question is just, are there key, uh, this may be um, <laughs> oversimplification, but are there key metrics that you're looking at to be able to avoid having to do TUCPs, um, whether it's later in the year or future dry years that you can highlight? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, and I, I, it is very much on the department's mind to, you know, and honestly, I think um, if, if the last couple months had turned out differently, I mean, we were really focused on, on not needing one this year and making sure that people were conserving, that would help us, you know, preserve carryover storage. And I would just, you know, reflect um, board member Firestone, I think, what we want to do is, you know, it's sort of all hands on deck for this particular situation this year. But um, as soon as we get a moment to to breathe, um, you know, we we typically do a, you know, sort of what what kind of worked and what worked less well. Um, and so even within our own contractors, you know, we're really looking at that, you know, the human health and safety number and um, just trying to make sure that we have good communication about how we come up with that as an example. We're looking at, um, you know, carryover storage and, um, you know, what happens in the fall sort of as an example. How can we, you know, now that we've had a few um, runs at this and we know there's going to be more of it, um, obviously there's, you um, you know, other, in, you know, infrastructure investments that we would want to make over time to make the system work better um, and more broadly. And key to that is um, making sure that we can um, maybe lay off the system in dry years, um, but really needing to make sure that we're capturing water in the, in the plentiful times because that helps just, you know, alleviate pressure on the system. So, um, you know, you'll see um, in some of our assistant programs, assistance programs, not just for our small communities, but for the bigger urban, um, we have an urban and, and multi-benefit, you know, project list that part of what we're looking to do is um, invest in things that can, you know, again, help us relieve pressure in these moments when um, the, the real limitations of what um, the state and federal water projects can do just become, you know, so stark. Um, but I, I hear you, and that is um, an active discussion, um, maybe when we have just a little bit more brain space than we do in this particular moment, but you're very on point. Thank you, Director, and thank you, Board Member, for the good, the good questions. And, you know, uh, again, I, I want to note the good collaboration that is going on even on uh, understanding the vulnerability of systems that are dependent on M&I from either the CVP or the State Water Project. And, we know uh, the great dependence on the state water project there. So really appreciate the, the work that Director Namath and her folks are working with the Division of Drinking Water and just understanding the vulnerabilities coming into this summer. Um, that's really what, um, you know, the mode we're in, as the director said, responding to the immediate conditions, but appreciate board member, you know, we, we do need to be thinking at the same time uh, about the longer term. And, you know, I, I think there are gleams and glimpses there of uh, ways that we're, we can continue to improve the way our decision making unfolds, you know, both at the projects, but here at the boards, uh, and importantly, how that benefits local managers, local communities who are having to, to plan and understand what to anticipate for this summer. So uh, thank you. Thank you both. Anything um, further from board members, uh, comments or, or questions here for the directors? Okay, hearing none, thank you. And I know you're both busy, so uh, appreciate again, you're being able to carve out some time here and enjoying the discussion and I look forward to what I know will be a lot further. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you thank for the you opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Both. you. Uh, 
quickly. I don't know if there was going to be an update um, from our Division of Drinking Water, Division of Financial Assistance, just checking on that uh, before we go to, I think, our one commenter uh, that we have for this item. Okay, hearing none, then uh, we can transition to, or we can go to uh, Dogo Biji, our uh, one public commenter, I think, that we have currently on this. Mr. Obiji, good morning. Apologize, Mr. Obiji, you, you're on, unmuted on the platform, but we can't hear you. Does that work better? Yes, it does. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that. Uh, members of the board, I am Doug Obiji. I'm a senior attorney at NRDC. I appreciate the opportunity to present to the board very briefly today. I know we'll be talking about many of these issues tomorrow. I want to briefly highlight that the disa drought disaster we're facing this year is fundamentally not a hydrological problem. It is the result of the state's failure to plan for droughts and the overallocation of water rights and contracts. I say that because while conditions have been very dry, we can't control hydrology, but we do control, very clearly control, what happens to all the rain and snow that falls in the Bay Delta watershed. As you know, the governor's water resilience portfolio calls for the state to be able to protect fish and wildlife during a six-year drought. That's recommendation 26.3. But the past few years have demonstrated that we can't even manage two years of drought without waiving water quality objectives in the Delta and causing massive mortality of salmon. Instead, DWR and Reclamation are continuing this pattern in practice of violating water quality objectives in every critically dry year, even as they deliver more water to their contractors than those contractors would be entitled to under their claims of right. Things are really grim this year, primarily because we failed to to store enough water in the upstream reservoirs at the end of last year. The current operational forecasts show the Shasta and Orville being drained to even lower levels than last year, potentially as low as 1977 at Shasta, due to these excessive water deliveries and diversions in light of the lack of inflow. And that's particularly the true for the CVP and the State Water Project's so-called settlement and exchange contractors. These operations, if they move forward, will cause Shasta and Orville likely to lose the ability to produce hydropower this summer cause devastating temperature mortality of winter run and fall run salmon this year, and cause greater harmful algal blooms in the Delta this summer. Reclamation has been modeling the effects of a TUCP since mid-February, yet this is only now coming to light publicly. And in addition, the modeling that Reclamation has shared to date shows the proposed TUCP does not actually improve Shasta storage. Instead, it's all about Orville. I wanna encourage the board to provide as much public notice for comments on the TUCP, even if it's after the fact, and to require GWR and Reclamation to provide detailed information about whether and how they are reducing water allocations to all their contractors, including the settlement exchange contractors, while they propose to waive or weaken environmental protections. As the chair noted earlier, rights come with responsibilities. The CVP and the State Water Project have the responsibility to protect the public, water quality in the Delta and the environment as conditions on their water rights because the fish and the public don't have water rights. The only thing we have as, is the conditions on those water rights that the projects have the responsibility to implement. But all too often, as we see again this year, DWR and Reclamation are asking the board to waive their responsibilities while seeking to maintain the benefits of their rights. That is fundamentally unfair. I wanna strongly urge the board to plan for next year to also be critically dry and to prevent Shasta and upstream reservoirs from being drained to the extremely low levels at the end of the year that are shown in Reclamation's proposed modeling. For instance, allowing water transfers after September that reduce Shasta storage is a fundamentally failed strategy and just puts us back in the same hole that we started this year with. It's critically important to rebuild storage going into next year in order to avoid repeating this disaster again next year. We will discuss this more at the workshop tomorrow, but it's clear that the state is woefully unprepared for this drought and conditions are far worse than the state and federal agencies have led on. And I wanna encourage the board to take leadership to wrestle this issue because uh, it's gonna look really bad. And if we don't get a handle on this, next year could be even worse. Praying for rain is not a strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Obiji. Appreciate your time this morning and addressing the board. Thank you. Anything further from fellow board colleagues on this item? Discussion, questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, then we can conclude uh, the hydro update and drought update and uh, appreciate everyone's, again, uh, time and efforts. And again, Mr. Ecknell for doing the deep dive on the data side of things, it's much appreciated. Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break, uh, come back at 11.10 and uh, we'll continue on with item number three. 
Thanks everyone for the good morning so far. We'll see you soon here. Thank you.
All right, everyone, it's 1110. I think we can begin together back and we can proceed to um, item number three, which will be an update on monthly water production and conservation data reported by urban water retail suppliers or retail water system. All right. Mr. Darrow, good to see you. Good morning. Uh, I don't believe we can actually hear you, uh, but you are, uh -oh. uh, you are unmuted. Um. I can hear just fine. Can hear. Oh, I apologize. I is my fault. I have my wrong headset in. I <laughs> apologize for that. Mr. Darrow, I can hear you now. Usually it's it's me, so yeah, I'm... that 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 was me that time. That's sitting around here. Okay. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. My name is Marielle Rodero, and I will be providing the urban water conservation update for the January 2022 data. Next slide, please. As we entered the new year, dry conditions returned to California, making this the third dry January in recent years. January 2022 had almost no measurable rain throughout the month during a time that is historically one of the wettest months of the year. Despite this, a bit of good news is conservation messaging has helped bring residential use down for GPC from last year to 66 GPCD. Next slide, please. Ms. Rodero, I apologize. Um, can you uh, uh, completely uh, state what RG, our, PC, our GPCD is there? Oh, yes. Yeah, it was 66 GPCD for for January 2022. Oh, and, and just to make clear, it's gallons per person per day, Gall right? Yes, so, yep. <laughs> sorry. Jargon, I know. I am in academia, I should know better. <laughs> um, all right. Um, although we've entered a new year in terms of data reports, um, please note that the governor's executive order defines 2020 as the reference year for savings calculations. So therefore, January 2022 savings were calculated with respect to January 2020. And um, this will be continue to be the case. This makes sense because 2020 is the most recent year where we start to see signs of continuously hot and dry conditions statewide. With 2020 experiencing also some of the continually highest maximum temperatures since the last drought. These conditions carried forward into 2021, which is when data collections for the savings calculations began. Next slide, please. This is the first reporting month where total statewide use was greater than the baseline. January 2022 resulted in 2.6% more water consumption relative to 2020, bringing the July to January cumulative savings to 6.4% statewide. Next slide, please. San Francisco Bay Region reduced water use by 1.4% relative to 2020, and the Tulare Lake and North Coast regions were about equivalent. The rest of the hydrologic regions throughout the state increased use relative to January 2020. The spatial context does provide some additional detail. The coastal regions, which have more moderate temperatures relative to inland, also saw smaller increases in water use. However, this January was dry and hotter than usual. And even the coastal regions were experiencing daily maximum temperatures that were four to nine degrees Fahrenheit above average. Next slide, please. While we can find and fix leaks inside and outside of our homes all year long, this week is fix a leak week. So here's an annual reminder to check household plumbing fixtures and irrigation systems for leaks. The average home's leaks can account for nearly 10,000 gallons of water wasted every year, or the amount of water needed to wash more than 300 loads of laundry. 10% of homes have leaks that waste 50 gallons or more per day. Common types of leaks include worn toilet flappers, dripping faucets, and leaking shower heads, all of which are easily correctable. Common types of leaks found outside the home include broken sprinkler heads and leaky hoses. An irrigation system that has a leak of um, 1 32nd of an inch in diameter, which is about the thickness of a dime, can waste 6,300 gallons of water per month. 
uh, finally, a garden hose sometimes leaks at its connection to the spigot. If you see a leak when you run your hose, simply replace the nylon or rubber hose washer and ensure a tight connection to the spigot using pipe tape and a wrench. Next slide, please. Please remember that Save Our Water has many resources available from media packages to tips on water conservation. With that, I will end my presentation and um, open up for questions. Thank you, Mr. Darrow. You know, as we've heard, we've uh, suffered quite uh, the climate and weather whiplash here and the dryness, the incredible dryness that we've seen in January and, and in February and now here coming into March is meaning that uh, the opportunities, unlike in December where we saw record precipitation and a meeting of the governors for that month, 15% uh, call for voluntary reduction uh, uh, off of the, the uh, 2020 baseline. Uh, but we, again, see a, a real difficulty here when things dry up and outdoor uh, irrigation is such a huge component of water use that it you know, really reflects here um, some, some real challenges that we're gonna have given these dry conditions and, uh, and the need to focus on outdoor irrigation. I appreciate actually the, the gallons uh, per person per day, per capita per day numbers, because that actually also reflects that there is a tremendous amount of conservation going on there, you know, we're, we're down four gallons per person per day from previous, um, from the, the baseline in 2020. Uh, but as a percentage here, we're seeing increases. And again, it's, it's being driven by these outdoor temperatures. And I just appreciate uh, the amount of data and information that we actually have in this reporting and the ability for communities to self-reflect here and understand where are those opportunities to continue to conserve, knowing that it's, it's a really critical tool, not just in the immediate that we've seen in uh, this past summer throughout the state where we had you know, conservation of 20, 40% in uh, upwards in, in, in some communities. Um, and, and, but you know, to, to make sure to, to have that tool to respond to immediate conditions is really critical, but it's also about the long-term as well. Uh, this is, you know, as we've seen these last 20 years, an increased aridification of, of the West and of California and really truly a shift in our climate that we have to reflect in our values and the way we use water, the way we value it, both in our homes and at the system level. And there, you know, I, I have to comment because I have heard some, uh, some, some uh, complaint uh, that there's an over-focus on urban conservation as a tool and a, 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 a strategy to get out of drought. Uh, and it is not the only tool as you and uh, others have heard just uh, a bit ago, our curtailment work is really critical. That is, is helping to balance um, at the watershed scale, the diversions and, and usage of water, let alone um, the balancing that's going on as the projects are having the state's major projects here, the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project uh, managed through, through difficult circumstances. And so, uh, of course, the, the increase uh, is, is, is not, you know, we, we want to be seeing, seeing increased conservation. We are in some ways, but again, we're all going to have to really focus on our outdoor usage and know that that is where most critically, and here, um, those of you that did experience some precipitation uh, with this recent storm, I hope your sprinklers are off. Um, here, uh, again, we're just going to have to continue both at the household level, but at the system level, importantly, and it's not one or the either, um, continue to, to balance through some difficult circumstances and conservation is an important tool. We know here in the media and in the long term. So just thank you. I appreciate the numbers and um, you know, we'll continue to importantly work with uh, state water agencies, uh, communities to, to get the word out and to make clear how, how best can we contribute um, here collectively to, to conservation and drought response and uh, know appropriately that yes, household, you know, the things we do in our households add up importantly at the system level, but even at that watershed and system level, we're, we're doing work and are not here, I, I see, you know, overly focused necessarily on the conservation side, on the urban side, but is an important side to keep and continue to um, advocate and ensure we see in, increased conservation on. So thank you, Mr. Rodero. Uh, fellow board colleagues, any reflection or uh, questions around the conservation numbers that are reported here? Board Member Firestone. Thanks, I echo all of what you just said, Chair Escobel. Um, 
Uh, one thing I, I am interested in, really, this is just a, a question, is um, if we have, so given, you know, our increased um, focus on understanding racial equity and how a lot of these things are playing out within that um, sphere, do we have information on the relationship between residential GPCD, so gallons per person or um, uh, per capita per day, um, consumption, so residential consumption and median household income. Um, in other words, is it generally true that most low-income customers use less water and therefore have higher per capita efficiency at more permanently than um, higher income residential customers. I'm just wondering if we actually have data on that, if that's something that we have um, uh, the ability to understand from the data that's reported. Um, and, uh, and then I also just relatedly am interested if we have information on where water systems are instituting rate structures that are um, regressive or charge low income customer or charge low use customers um, more per gallon than high use customers. Um, and do we know if that if those regressive rate structures correspond to overall water use and conservation practices. So um, do systems with more regressive water rates tend to use more water. Um, and again, if you don't, this is really a question on do we have data on this? And is this something that we can um, better understand as we're looking at um, understanding conservation and the the um, the need to both make immediate um, emergency changes, but also just move to long term um, making conservation and efficiency a way of life. Thank you, board member. Um, I'll let uh, Mr. Oppenheimer respond, but I'll, I'll flag that I know when it comes to the long-term efficiency standard setting that we, the board is engaged with, with the Department of Water Resources, we recently put a tool on our website that um, lets folks see, I think, uh, systems usage in 19, uh, 2019, rather. Um, so not this updated um, you know, conservation data we have now, but is a reflection of where systems are generally in their conservation. And there, on our tool um, is a, an overlay of the Cal Enviro screen, which has some of that data. I don't know if it's broken down by, you know, uh, further by that uh, water system sort of boundary, but at least on that sort of side of things, you know, you can kind of generally see um, systems that maybe, you know, serve um, different sorts of communities and, and what um, aggregately their, their water usage might be. Um, but uh, Mr. Oppenheimer? Well, I would, I'll, I'll invite anyone on the conservation team if they want to expand, but um, basically what I, I think I'd say, good, really good questions, board member Firestone. Uh, I don't know is the answer. Um, I have heard that, you know, residential water use and um, income or cor are correlated. And as you said, with higher incomes, you tend to see higher water use. And it seems, you know, it, it just makes sense, you know, thinking about you know, homes and sizes of lawns and properties and things like that. Um, and I'm sure there's been studies and data that have been done to actually prove that point. I'm not familiar with them at my fingertips. It also seems like it would be something that we could look into a bit. I'm just thinking like, you know, correlating like census track income with water use. It's just the water use information we get is at the service area level for the large urban water supplier. So it might be a little bit hard to untangle it, although we may be able to make some assumptions. Um, I think probably a better approach is to look at what existing research has been done. And maybe next time we um, report back, we could summarize some of the findings or what we find or don't find on um, the income issue. On the rate issue, also sort of same response. I think we need to look into it a little bit more. Again, there may be somebody with within the conservation team um, who wants to jump in and provide a, a more expanded answer and is more familiar with the studies and the data that have already uh, been completed. Thank you, Ms. Ely. Yeah. Uh, would like to. Good morning, yeah, Chair Escabel and members of the board. Um, uh, thank you for the, the question. It's very timely, actually. The Alliance for Water Efficiency just published in January a really excellent report looking at an assessment of water affordability and uh, conservation potential within the city of Long Beach. And 
um, you know, they have identified a very, you know, strong relationship between um, with income and, and water consumption, showing that as, you know, um, income increases, so do um, rates of, of GPCD. And there are other studies that have looked into this as well, but I had just happened to <laughs> finish reading this report um, earlier this week. It's a, it's a, it's a really good one. Um, and we, I believe, um, could um, look into your, your questions um, um, using uh, data that we have from the electronic annual report, um, as well as lot size information um, and, you know, service area data. So I, I think this is a question that we, we could um, look into and um, would welcome the opportunity to, to do so. So what, what I'd suggest is that um, at the next um, conservation update, we provide you with a summary of sort of what we've found and what, what the existing research shows, including the study um, that Ms. Ely just uh, referenced, other studies. And then I don't know if by a month if we can actually do an independent data analysis, but we'll update you as to um, you know, what's possible. Thanks so much. Thank you for the good uh, question, board member. And I think it'll it, it will help. Um, you know, I, I, I hear sometimes um, a number of folks that have made uh, an permanent uh, adjustments since the last drought, and the calls to conserve uh, for some of those um, households and, and folks is is difficult, and especially those that are already low water usage. So I think you know, continuing to be able to work off of uh, the idea of budgets uh, here, you know, the number of gallons your household use, you know, appropriate for the size of your family. The, the lawn uh, size that you may have, all, you know, all of it adds up to then water systems that are living within budgets as well. And we know those budgets become very uh, constrained and require mandatory actions when we're in times of drought and shortage like this. But for the long term, as we've said, it's really important that we continue to understand best how we can contribute um, here personally, but also at the system levels to the resilience of our system. So an understanding, um, who best to be targeting and, and who are the, the water wasters, if you will, within our space can help us make sure we're actually achieving these goals and not overburdening communities that maybe are already burdened by things. So I appreciate that, uh, the line of questioning and the work there, board member, thank you. Board member uh, uh, Morgan. Hi, good morning, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering maybe for a future update, if we could perhaps maybe add a slide that highlight some of the funding that the Water Board has for water resiliency. Um, I know many of you know, the agencies out there you know, are aware of our funding, but there, perhaps there are some that are listening that are not. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about was the also perhaps the funding that also DWR has for resiliency. Um, and I believe they also have some more targeted funding that goes you know, to help with um, Conservation uh, chair, as you're talking about the outdoor um, water use, um, as we're, you know, again in an extreme, you know, a drought, this historical um, moment that we're in here. Um, the other thing, I believe, on our website, we actually, I, I don't believe it is actually our website. It's the um, the website where there's the weekly drought updates. There is, I believe, a list of the water systems that have what 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 they're doing for. Uh, conservation, what, what what they're called for. If they're asking for 15% or 20%, there's a list of agencies. I was wondering if perhaps there could be compiled a list of um, what agencies are offering as far as um, maybe like their, their rebates, such as, you know, the city of X is offering a rebate for, you know, yard conversions or something to help consumers um, understand what is available that is out there, um, you know, as we are, you know, looking forward to not only, you know, as individuals looking to make changes to our home, our landscapes, but, um, you know, just that bigger picture of what is available to us as we're looking for, for that and the assistance that is available that's out there. So just things I'm just wondering if there, if it wouldn't be too heavy of a lift to start to compile, or maybe there's others that have already compiled this information and where we can put a link to that information, um, just something to look forward for the future. 
I appreciate that. Thank you, Board Member Morgan. It's a good suggestion. Uh, I know that in the last strat, I recall, I think US EPA had a really good site where you could look up if any of your water agencies um, had uh, available rebates. And now, uh, to your point, with DWR uh, looking to receive uh, turf rebate dollars, I think it would be a really good opportunity to make sure that's uh, understood and available for systems. But really, how do we uh, help consumers, you know, households um, know how best to, to access these? And yes, you know, for, first check with your local water district. That's the, the front line here where, where many agencies are, are putting uh, dollars and rebates out, but better able to, uh, an ability to better aggregate those, I think would, would be helpful. So I um, appreciate that, a good suggestion. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Oppenheimer, anything you'd like to add? Uh, also, good suggestions. Uh, I think it should be pretty easy for us to put together a slide that summarizes available funding, especially from the Water Board. Um, it might also be helpful to look at what's in the Gen 10th budget because there's substantial conservation funding in there, although not adopted yet, um, might be a good summary. On the sort of compilation of what all the water suppliers are, are doing um, on that, um, maybe give us a chance to um, think about that. Um, and figure out how we could do that or if we could do that. That one seems like a little bit more challenging just because there's a lot of water suppliers and um, the, it's dynamic, right? What they, what they have in place changes over time. Um, I don't want to say we're, we can't do it. Let, let me, I, before I commit though, let me just talk to the team and figure out what would be involved or if anyone else has done it like Chair Esquivel um, mentioned is possible. Thank you, thank you. Other board colleagues here, uh, questions, comments, suggestions? Okay. Uh, now we, we do have a couple of speakers and we can uh, go to our comment cards. Uh, first, let's see, who do I have here? I would like to call up uh, Molly Costa. And I can wait for my scroll because she may not be on the platform. She is not on the platform. Okay. That is correct. Yeah. Then uh, I'll call up Ryan uh, Ojakian uh, and then followed by Elizabeth uh, Lovestead. Hi. Can you hear me? We yes. can. Good morning. Great. Good morning. Good to see you, Chair Esquivel uh, and board members. Um, I think what I would like to do really is echo the comments that you made, Chair Esquivel, at the top. Um, the way that we're thinking about our challenges are twofold, that there are actions that individuals can take, and that's through individual conservation. Uh, we really need that engagement um, from all of our constituents, and we are here to help. Uh, one thing building off the conversation that we just had, in the Sacramento region, there is a place to go and find what rebates are available to you, even if you're not aware of who your water supplier is. So I got to put this plug in, uh, bewatersmart.info. Uh, that maybe can accelerate some of that work if that's going to occur. But for uh, the 20 water suppliers in the greater Sacramento area, you, you can be sure that you can find what rebates are available to you there. Um, we, we are here to help. I didn't, I don't think I even said my name, by the way. I'm Brian O'Jackian with the Regional Water Authority, just for the record. Um, we're in the greater Sacramento area. Uh, and uh, so for those 20 water suppliers, we're here to help beyond just rebates, right? We're, we want to partner with you uh, if you're in the greater Sacramento area on how you can get to increase conservation. We are going to need that moving forward, um, especially as we head into, uh, you know, what uh, looks like is going to be, uh, you know, a challenging uh, condition statewide at this summer. Um, the second thing, and you touch on this, Chair Esquivel, and I certainly, sincerely appreciate that, is that we're focused on systemic change and how do we adapt to uh, climate change. And one element in the numbers that were reported in January that you guys don't get to see, but that we track here is what, what are we doing in terms of our surface water and groundwater use? Um, and in this January, uh, as, as you all are likely to recall, uh, we had had a wet December and Folsom Reservoir was in flood operations. And so what we wanted to be doing during that time was to be taking more surface water and less groundwater. And that's actually what we saw reflected in our numbers. So uh, just wanna be clear that, you know, that we have to be um, thoughtful how we unpack some of this, this data. 
um, and and be mindful of what are we trying to accomplish, uh, it, it, you know, in holistically. And so I just wanted to make sure that the board was aware of that, that um, in our January numbers that we were seeing the kind of systemic change that, that we would like to be seeing. Now, I, I wanna be clear that as we can do more on, on individual conservation, that there's a lot more that we can do still at the system level, but that um, we are uh, confident that we're headed in the right direction. Um, and that, you know, uh, we sincerely, again, appreciate your all partnership on those efforts at the systemic level and, and would like to um, continue that moving forward. So thanks for the time, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate you addressing the board and the continued, I know, good collaboration that's going on, not just here in the Sacramento region, but up, up and down the state, the watersheds that the board and the rest of the state and federal agencies are engaged with. Um, it's, it makes all the difference uh, in all this work is the local leadership and the right um, view of the challenges we're all facing. So appreciate that incredibly. Uh, Ms. Lovestead, uh, next, I'd like to call up Elizabeth Lovestead. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, I'm Elizabeth Lovestead. I'm a water resource manager at the San Diego County Water Authority. And I just appreciate Chair Escobol and the members of the board kind of listening to our comments and, and the comments that were made both by staff and, and, and you about, you know, the, the challenging weather patterns that we're seeing and we saw in January of 2022. Um, I just want to, um, reiterate that um, San Diego County Water Authority and our member agencies have, have really invested in resiliency. And in, in, in addition to um, putting together those, having um, resilient supplies, desalinated um, seawater and um, Colorado River um, supplies developed through conservation, we also have a long-term long push for water use efficiency. Uh, we saw that after the last drought, we, we didn't have the same bounce back that some people did. We, we continue to keep our numbers low. But even with all of that, we have implemented our water shortage contingency level. Even though we're not seeing any sort of um, shortage at our local level, we, we put the voluntary level in place. We're, we're really pushing a region-wide conservation message. We have a lot of those programs that we were talking about before, um, turf rebates, uh, um, audits for residences, commercial properties, um, and ag customers as well, um, education opportunities that really focus on landscape and how to make sure that that long-term changes are put into place. And so um, we also have a, a to toilet direct install program and a controller direct install program that's the same at the low-income communities that can help them, um, again, where they might not be able to make um, investments up front, it, it'll help them um, make changes to improve their water bills and also improve efficiency across the region. Um, I just want to um, look look forward to continuing to work with you as we, we go through this drought and hope to continue to rely on the, the tools that have been um, put into place since the last drought that we had, the um, annual water supply and demand assessment that's, that's being developed right now and will be released in um, June to give information about what, are, what is the condition across the state of supplies and demands, and then continue to rely on our water shortage contingency plans to um, address any shortages that are that are in place. And so, again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak and um, I look forward to continue to work with you as we move through this drought conditions. Thank you, Ms. Lovestead, much appreciated. Thanks for the time today. Really appreciate you addressing the board and continuing to engage on what we know is really a critical aspect of our response here, conservation, so thank you. Okay, looking to my fellow board colleagues, anything else for the good of the order here? Thoughts, reflections? Um, just again, thanks everyone for the great work then. And that concludes uh, item number three. So that brings us to actually an uncontested item that we had tucked here in the middle of um, our board meeting to be able to make sure that um, we had prioritized some of those other discussions. So um, with item number three um, now uh, concluded, do we have any, uh, Ms. Townsend, uh, is this still uncontested? And uh, board members, any comments and or otherwise would entertain a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt item number four. Thank you, board member. I'll second. Thank you. And as we go, uh, Ms. Townsend, to the roll call vote, just thanks to the staff on this item, uh, the fact that it's uncontested and we can 
uh, quickly adopt it um, doesn't lessen what has been, I know, a lot of good work on it. So thank you. And uh, Ms. Townsend, can you call a roll call vote? Certainly. <clears throat> Board Member Morgan? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you all. Thank you as well. And uh, the item carries. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stevens. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. That then brings us to item number five, which will be a, a public workshop on our proposed statewide sanitary sewer systems general waste discharge requirements order, uh, our, our sanitary sewer order. And excited actually quite a bit about this. Um, it comes here uh, this year, 50, 50 years anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And um, so uh, an opportunity here to discuss our, our, uh, our sewer systems and, and how we can, and their collection systems and how do we continue to improve our oversight of them is, is, is welcomed. So thank you, uh, Ms. Mobley. Thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Esquivel. And good morning, members of the board. My name is Walter Mobley and I am a water resource control engineer in the Division of Water Quality's MPDS Wastewater Unit. In the following slides, I will go over the proposed statewide sanitary sewer systems general order that was issued for public comments on January 31st of this year. Next slide, please. I'd like to begin by introducing our program staff that have worked closely to develop the proposed general order. Today we have Afruz Farsimadan, the statewide NPDS wastewater program manager. In future slides, Afruz will detail the major changes from the existing 2006 order. I'd like to give a special acknowledgement to Diana Messina, the Surface Water Permitting Manager, and my colleague, Steve Chung, a water resource control engineer supporting the proposed order development. In the upcoming slides, I will provide background information on the proposed order development process. Next slide, please. To give some context and history, in 2006, the State Water Board adopted the first statewide sanitary sewer systems general order for consistent regulation of publicly owned systems through spill prohibitions and local system management requirements. There are approximately 1,100 public systems currently enrolled under the existing order. For the past nine years, enrollees have required have been required to follow the amended monitoring and reporting program as approved by the State Water Board Executive Director at the time. Next slide, please. The existing order requires all enrollees to submit an electronic report whenever a spill occurs from their system. This spill data has been collected in the online California Integrated Water Quality System Database, best known as CWIGS. This slide here represents spill volume fluctuations based on spill data entered into CWIGS. What we can visually see and quantify in this graph is that since the adoption of the existing order, there has been a decrease in the total number of reported spills represented in the graph by the blue line. And although the total spill volume fluctuates as shown by the green line, there are still years where high volumes of sewage are leaving the collection system. For example, if we look at 2017, the total spill volume of sewage reported reached as high as 10 million gallons. And most recently last year in 2021, enrollees reported approximately a total of 5 million gallons of sewage spills. We acknowledge that all collection systems have small spills from time to time. And as I previously stated, the number and volume of spills on this slide are what is reported by the enrollees. Through analyzing consecutive no spill reporting data from numerous enrollees, staff has concluded that not all spills are reported. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the annual number of spills 
based on enrollee reported spill data and highlights the difference between the total number of spills and the spills to surface waters. What this slide represents is how important it is to capture every spill occurring due to the public health and water quality impacts of raw sewage in the environment. Regardless of if a spill makes it to a surface water or not, the spill may cause a nuisance or simply remain in the environment for potential future discharge. When a spill does reach surface waters, 100% of the volume of sewage cannot be feasibly cleaned up in the environment. Additionally, staff has also heard from operators that they have restraints from cleaning up sewage due to no local coordination with storm drain agencies during a spill event. Thus, at times, sewage is left to flow through the storm drains without being stopped and or cleaned up. The proposed order addresses sewage that leaves the sanitary sewer system but is not cleaned up and enhances the certification and enforcement of spill reporting to allow water board staff to pursue enforcement on agencies that fail to report a spill and the agency's reporting, um, false reporting. Next slide, please. On this slide, I'll briefly go over our program's development process for proposed order reissuance. We ban began our discussions with internal staff and interested parties back in 2018. In April and May of 2019, staff conducted five outreach workshops throughout the state. From the preliminary feedback, staff developed an informal draft order and issued it in February of 2021 for informal feedback through public workshops and focus meetings. We took all informal feedback very seriously. On January 31st of this year, the State Water Board issued the proposed order for public comment period. Water Board staff held two staff public workshops this past February to clarify the proposed order requirements and to respond to interested parties' questions about the proposed order before public comments due date at noon on April 8th of this year. Today, we are here to present to the board the changes made to the existing order and answer your questions. Our next steps in the development process will be to respond to public comments and develop a final draft order. Because this order reissuance is a state water board 2022 priority project, it is our goal to present the final draft to the board for consideration of adoption this year. Staff proposes the reissued order's effective date is 120 days after adoption. Next slide, please. There is a reason that the existing order reissuance is a state water board 2022 priority project. The entire order has not been reissued in its 16 year existence. Staff have, has determined a need for the waste discharge requirements and compliance expectations to be updated per current state water board resolutions and enforcement needs. In addition, reissuing the general order will address climate change impacts and system resilience. Staff has placed on, focus on developing the proposed order to address enrolled agencies' costs of compliance as well. To mimic other water board orders, staff saw a need to update the electronic reporting requirements in CWIX, allowing our regional board and Office of Enforcement staff a better opportunity to prioritize water board inspections and enforcement actions. Next slide, please. Staff proposes the general order continue as waste discharge requirements. State Waste Discharge Requirements is a general order issued by the State Water Board under the authority granted by the Water Code. These waste discharge requirements are not a permit to discharge. These waste discharge requirements are an order prohibiting discharge of sewage. During our informal discussions with interested parties, staff heard that the existing general order should be reissued as an NPDES permit. However, we are proposing that this order continues as waste discharge requirements. The proposed waste discharge requirements places a clarified focus on protection of surface waters and groundwater. 
We've heard some concerns about third party lawsuits. It is important to note that an enrolled system's non-compliance with waste discharge requirements is not subject to third party lawsuits unless it is a Clean Water Act violation. Next slide, please. Before I pass this presentation on to Afruz, I would like to acknowledge our collaboration both internally and externally during the development of this proposed order. Throughout the entire development process of this proposed order, staff has been fortunate to collaborate with all nine regional water boards and the Office of Enforcement. Next slide, please. Staff has been fortunate throughout this development process to hold meetings and collaborate closely with interested party representatives from the following organizations. The California Native American Heritage, Heritage Commission. We also met with the California Association of Sanitation Agencies and their partners, which include the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, the Central Valley Clean Water Association, and the Southern California Alliance of Publicly Owned Treatment Works. We also met with the California Coast Keepers Alliance and the California Water Environmental Association, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and the University of California representatives. This concludes my presentation. Next slide, please. Without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Afruz Forsimadan, who will now give an overview of major changes from the existing 2006 order. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bubbly. Thank you, Walter. Good morning, Chair Escobol and members of the board. My name is Afruz Farsimadan. I'm the statewide NPDES wastewater program manager. Today, I will provide an overview of the major changes in the proposed order compared to the existing order. Next slide, please. The 2006 general order is a 20 page order in numbered paragraph format not organized in distinct section. The 2006 monitoring and reporting requirements were amended in another separate 2013 order. The proposed order has an updated format consistent with newer water boards orders and includes organized sections and attachments. It facilitates reference to specific requirements and supports consistent enforcement. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to explain the proposed orders process regarding the continuation of regulatory coverage for existing enrollees and the application requirements for new applicants. Next slide, please. Existing order enrollees may continue regulatory coverage through electronic certification in CVEX. This electronic certification must be completed within 60 days prior to the effective date of the order. If an existing enrollee does not certify the continuation of existing regulatory coverage in CVEX by the effective date of the order, the enrollee is considered a new applicant and must submit a new complete application package. An enrollee continuing existing coverage is not required to submit an application package or pay an, an, an application fee. The annual fee due date for existing enrollees remain the same as the previous order. Next slide, please. New applicants within 60 days prior to commencing operations or taking responsibility for operation and maintenance of a sanitary sewer system are required to submit a complete application package. The complete application package includes the application for enrollment form in attachment B and the application fee per the current state water board fee schedule. The proposed order 
also provides regulatory coverage for private system owners that are ordered by a regional board to obtain coverage. This application process therefore applies to a private system owner per the regional water board order. Next slide, please. The proposed order includes additional new findings. Next slide, please. New findings include information on existing water quality control plans, policies, and resolutions addressing the source, sources of drinking water policy, the board's response to climate change, cost of compliance, human right to water, and open data. The findings also include information on the state water boards, include uh, existing funding assistance for compliance with water quality orders and provides the water, board, water court definition of waters of the state. Next slide, please. Now I will go over the proposed new prohibitions in the order. Next slide, please. This slide shows all the three prohibitions in the order. The orange font text shows the proposed changes made, the to, made to the 2006 general order. Prohibition 4.1 is a new prohibition that reads, any discharge from a sanitary sewer system that has the potential to discharge the waters of the state is prohibited unless it is promptly cleaned up and reported. This addresses the graph that Walter showed earlier, showing the amount of sewage released into the environment, but it's not reaching a surface water. Prohibitions 4.2 and 4.3 are similar to the existing order, with the exception that the proposed order expands the prohibition to waters of the state. This includes groundwater, not solely surface water. The board's priority to protect drinking water sources are reflected in this prohibition. Next slide, please. Let's now have an overview of the proposed specifications and provision. Next slide, please. The proposed order has separate sections for specifications and provisions. The specifications are specific requirements on the enrollee to comply with this order. The provisions explain existing regulations and policies and additional procedures to implement and enforce the order. The attachments include detailed information defining the ter terms and how to comply with the specification. The attachments are an enforceable part of the order. Next slide, please. The first column on this slide shows the proposed orders added emphasis on the implementation of the sewer system management plan, system resilience, and proactive operation and maintenance. The second column shows the newest specifications in the proposed order, which are the requirement for a certified operator or a professional engineer to certify the sewer system management plan updates. The requirement for the enrollee to include a system specific performance analysis in its annual report. And the requirement to submit a sewer service area boundary map. The third column shows the proposed orders effort to reduce the cost of compliance. Staff has proposed to extend the internal program audit from every two years to every three years and extend the sewer system management plan update from every five years to every six years. 
The proposed order also includes an incentive for reduced reporting of small spills of less than 50 gallons. Next slide, please. The sewer system management plan is a major component of the order. So I will provide an overview of the required elements. Next slide, please. For consideration of the cost of compliance, the proposed order has built on the sewer system management plan elements in the existing order. Therefore, the existing, the enrollee's existing plan does not need to be rewritten, but modification is needed in order to address new requirements. The proposed order has extended the audit period from every two years to every three years, and the Swiss system management plan update from every five years to every six years. The proposed order requires the plan to provide procedures for system management and prevention of spills. No additional plans are required. Also, the enrollee is required to provide a justification in its plan if any of the required elements does not apply to its system. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed requirement for the plan certification. The existing order requires the legally responsible official to certify the plan after the governing board approval. The proposed order has added a requirement that if the legally responsible official is not a certified operator or a professional engineer, a second plan certification is required by either a grade two or higher collection system operator or a grade two or higher wastewater treatment plant operator that's employed at the plant serving the collection system or a professional engineer. Next slide, please. To address system resilience, the proposed order requires to plan the plan to include procedures to address short-term and long-term system resilience and to pro proactively prioritize system operation and maintenance activities, condition assessments, and repair and rehabilitation. Next slide, please. The proposed order adds additional emphasis on prioritizing condition assessment of high-risk system areas that hold a high level of environmental consequences if, system, if the system fails, are located in or within the vicinity of surface waters, steep terrain, high groundwater elevation and environmentally sensitive areas, or are within the vicinity of a receiving water with a bacterial related impairment on the most current 303D list. The proposed order emphasizes the prioritization of repairs for high-risk areas and system components. Next slide, please. The proposed order adds requirements for interagency coordination with drinking water purveyors for protection of drinking water sources with storm drain agencies for coordinated spill response and with other impacted parties during planning and implementation of capital improvement projects. Next slide, please. I will now go over major proposed changes to the notification, monitoring, and reporting requirements. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed changes to the notification requirements. The existing order requires notification to the Office of Emergency Services, CALO-ES, 
within two hours of becoming aware of a spill greater than or equal to 1,000 gallons that potentially results in a discharge to a surface water. The proposed order has modified the notification requirement to address discharges of sewage to waters of the state. This is consistent with the Water Code Section 13271. Next slide, please. The proposed order has added requirements for, for electronic submetal into CVEX. The required electronic submetal is for supporting documentation for spill reports, audit reports and the plan updates, system specific performance analysis graphs, and the sewer system service area boundary map. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed modifications to the spill categories. The proposed order defines a category one spill as any volume of sewage that results in a discharge to a water of the US or a drainage tributary. The existing order defines category one spills as spills to all surface waters. I will explain why we made this change in the next slide. On the second row, you will see that the pro oh, can you go back to pre thank you. On the second row, you will see that the proposed order defines category two as a spill of 1,000 gallons or greater that is not a category one spill. The existing order's definition is for the same, same size spills that don't reach a surface water. The last two rows show that we split all other spills into two categories. A category three spill is for 50 gallons or not to 999 gallons. A category four spill was added solely for the reduced reporting incentive, which I will go over in the future slide. Next slide, please. The proposed order has modified category one spill from spills that reach a surface water to spills that reach a water of the US. The reason for this proposed change is to distinguish spills that are in violation of the Clean Water Act and therefore subject to third party lawsuits. It is important that enrollees identify if surface waters adjacent to their systems are waters of the US or not and also to identify if storm drains within their service area drain into a water of the US or to a stormwater infiltration structure. Regional water board staff are available to assist enrollees to identify waters of the US per their basin plans. Next slide, please. The reason for the proposed category four for less than 50 gallon spills is to incentivize employment of certified operators. Certified operators bring a standard level of professionalism and workmanship to the management of collection systems, similar to certified operators for wastewater and drinking water treatment plants and certified professionals for stormwater management. The incentive reads as follows. An enrollee may qualify for record keeping instead of reporting if the enrollee certifies that at least 50% of the system's operation and maintenance staff are certified operators. And for five consecutive years, the system had less than two spills per 100 miles of system per year total volume of each individual spill did not exceed 1,000 gallons and spills did not discharge to a water of the US. 
staff knows that this incentive as proposed has flaws. We maintain this language in the proposed order to purposely hear other ideas for this incentive. Next slide, please. The existing order includes requirements for receiving water visual observation for spills that reach a surface water. The proposed order requires visual observations to include photographs and GPS coordinates and also requires receiving water spill sampling for pH, turbidity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. We are receiving comments on these sampling requirements and we are prepared to address them in the final draft. Next slide, please. For spills of 50,000 gallons or greater to a surface water, the existing order requires receiving water sampling within 48 hours of knowledge of the spill. The proposed order has reduced the receiving water monitoring time frame to 12 hours due to the urgency of raw sewage in flowing water. In addition, the proposed order requires three receiving water samples per day during an ongoing spill. The samples must be analyzed by an ELAP accredited lab. Next slide, please. The proposed order renames the previously called collection system questionnaire to the annual report. The reason for this is to be consistent with other water boards waste discharge requirements. The proposed annual report must include a system specific 10 year performance analysis graph that is generated from CVEX data. Next slide, please. Now on to the proposed requirement to submit an electronic service area boundary map. Next slide, please. The proposed order requires enrollees to submit an electronic map of their service area for the water boards to identify areas not served by sewer systems for future regulations and to address regulations that affect both drinking water agencies and wastewater agencies, and also to implement the Senate Bill 1215, the Wastewater Consolidation Program. Water board staff is available to assist disadvantaged communities that lack technical expertise or funding to develop these maps. Next slide, please. This order is adopted as proposed. Staff proposes the effective date of the order to be 120 days after the adoption date. This time is needed for staff to modify CVEX to accommodate new requirements and for existing enrollees to certify continuation of coverage in CVEX. Next slide, please. The next steps include the end of the public comment period on April 8. Then we will respond to comments and issue the final draft order. Staff plans to present the final draft for board consideration of adoption in 2022. Next slide, please. This concludes my presentation. Our team is here to answer questions and provide clarifications throughout this workshop. I would like to remind everyone again that the due date for written public comments is known on April 8. We, ha we have provided links uh, to our program website where every people can find the proposed order and other corresponding information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Farsima Dunn. And thank you for your entire team's good work on this. I, I really appreciate 
again, just the, the, the thought that's been given to this, the, the fact that we've updated its structure to make it more clear. Um, and here, uh, done some important policy adjustments as well. Um, appreciate um, just the, the good work that's gone into to all of it, truly. I know we have a number of commenters. I'm trying to balance out um, here when we should best take our lunch. Um, we have about 12 or so commenters. Um, it would, you know, we could um, in here want to provide space for any questions or, or further comment from board members, but we could try to take those all in block and then have a late lunch. Probably sometime it, it'd be optimistic if I said one, but um, you know, it might be a little bit past that. Let's try to uh, carry on a conversation here um, and, and just uh, keep going through. If it looks like we're going to be well past one, we'll, we'll pause, take a break, and have lunch. But um, I'll go ahead and say here, we'll, we'll try to keep moving through the items. So thank you, everyone, for um, I know some hunger that may be developing. And please do stand while we're here. Um, board members, any any questions um, around the, 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 the general order uh, or the waste discharge order as proposed currently? And or thoughts? Yeah, I have a, I have a couple questions. Yes, uh, first, let me just say that this has been a really great example of a really extensive outreach and collaboration process from staff. Um, I've heard nothing but good feedback in terms of the workshops that have been held, the stakeholder engagement meetings, you know, the administrative draft, the public comment period here. Um, and I think it's just really serves as a model and emphasis for the types of transparent um, dialogues that we can have and hopefully, you know, the outcomes that, that come from that, which is ultimately a better and updated permit, um, which is what we're all looking for here. And so, you know, with that, I just have a couple, um, well, I won't call them nitpicky, but there are my questions. So sometimes they get in that area. <laughs> so the first goes to, you know, you, you spent quite a bit of time talking about the changing changes in categories from you know, reporting spills to surface waters versus now waters of the state versus waters of the United States and changing those categories. And I, I understand, I think the, the rationale why you would do that, but at the same time, it, um, you know, as, as you know, the waters of the US definition and such is in a bit of flux still and is, is a little bit undefined. So we are putting quite a bit, I think, on the dischargers here and sorting through that. And so I appreciate that you're available to help walk them through that issue, but I was just, you know, wondering, um, you know, is it reasonable to expect that? And did you think maybe is, you know, is this the best approach? So could you, could you just walk me through a little bit more of that rationale and your thinking as to this change? Absolutely. Afriz, I'm going to start this one. Uh, and good afternoon, board. This is Diana Messina with the Division of Water Quality. Um, Yes, we, un we do understand the fluctuation of a water in the United States. Uh, we've had continued conversation with CASA on this. Um, here's my perspective as we look at all our permits. If the sewage goes into a municipal stormwater system that is regulated with an NPDES permit, you can assume it either goes to a water US or a stormwater infiltration BMP. Um, very important to know. But if it does reach a surface water, it would most probably be a water of US. Um, on, on the enforcement side, we believe it would be easier for the regional boards to categorize you know, any future ACLs uh, they have to do on um, unpermitted discharges to a water of US if it was all in one category. We are not married to what we're proposing. In fact, one of the reasons we really look forward to this workshop is to keep the ball rolling. And we know there will always be changes until uh, you adopt this order in the future. So uh, we keep listening to the concerns, uh, but just generally, I would say that we only have probably a small area in the Santa Barbara region, maybe the desert region, that there would be really concern on if a sewer spill goes into a water of US or a non-water of US. Um, just topography and so forth. Um, we know just in all our other regions that most spills go into water of US because that's how 
the hydrology and the drainage goes all into you know surface waters that drain. Um, even if a sewer spill goes into an ag drain, like in region five, we know that's a drain that if it's not cleaned up, it will most probably go into a water of the US because they're engineered to drain. Um, we just think it's important if cumulatively, everyone does not like the way we've categorized category one, um, we're not married to it and we're open to changes. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, that's helpful. I think sure. you know, for me, I'm, I'm interested to hear, yeah, you know, I always put myself in the shoes of sort of the operator, you know, the guy, the boots on the ground, the guy who's out actually trying to manage the crisis in that moment of the spill and, and trying to deal with things that are happening and having to report, you know, in a short amount of time and such. So I'll be interested to hear from the commenters, you know, their thoughts on this and whether- sure. May I add just one more thing, yeah. please? Um, we are so focused on cost of compliance that uh, we also broke it up because category two has less reporting. It doesn't have the technical report, the draft and the final and so forth. We've, you know, we've heard from some stakeholders that they rather have it combined and they don't mind about the increased reporting. Um, I'd like to think that maybe there's some utility managers out there that do mind about the increased reporting and they'd rather, you know, scout about their, their service area and kind of confirm what's an infiltration basin versus what's a water view US and so forth to save that ongoing uh, reporting that's necessary. So that was another um, difference there. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, and I think then my second question is um, to sort of that, um, the incentive-based reporting. So going back to your cost of compliance comment that you just made, <laughs> Um, you know, thinking about slide 34 and a bruise, you, you sort of mentioned, you know, in your comments <laughs> that I think you said it was a flawed or right, let's go, just go with imperfect proposal as it's laid out there. Um, and I guess my question is just to sort of tee up that discussion and maybe folks have, you know, when we hear comments, they have ideas or they'll submit written ideas, but it, do you have any sense, at, you know, based on what you laid out there, um, how many systems would qualify? for the incentive-based reporting under, you know, current, you know, present day? Do you have an idea? And um, Afruz or Walter, did you want to answer that or would you like me to answer? Go ahead, Diana. Okay, very good. Um, well, I will start by just letting everyone know that we started off with this incentive, just really wanting to find a way to incorporate certified operators into this order for the reasons that Afruz presented uh, in her presentation on the importance of certification. Um, we spoke to union reps and to agencies and we could not find a way to uh, require certified operations um, that would just have a brick wall in front of us. So that slowly molded into an incentive and that slowly kept going and kept going. Afruz and I were going to uh, recommend taking it out and we thought, let's just keep it there for further discussion. Um, we know right now there's probably not a lot of agencies that can qualify for that, yet it is really hard to reduce or to make that more lenient because we can't applaud or award a system that is either violating the Clean Water Act by discharges to waters of the US or having a larger quantity of sewage going into our waters. Um, so again, we're open to discussion and suggestions and we, we know that there won't be very many agencies that have that high of a performance level that could qualify. Thank you. That's all I have right now. Thank you, board member. And thank you, Ms. Messina, for that. Board member Morgan. Thank you. Um, you know, I echo um, board member McGuire's comments, you know, just an appreciation for staff's collaboration and working with stakeholders, you know, through, through this process and this important update to the general order. Um, my first question is actually a follow-up uh, 
up on board member Wire's first question and regarding category one spills. Um, and so, you know, those need to be reported within two hours. And just knowing a lot of times some of these spills, they occur like in the middle of the night. Um, and so, you know, the, that two hour mark is going to be like at 3 a.m. So they're not going to be able to reach out to regional board staff to help, the, to help identify if it's going to be a water of the U.S. prior to hitting that two hour mark and needing to do that reporting. So, you know, many are going to err on the side of caution and go ahead and say, hey, yes, this is a category one, report it that way. If, you know, that next business day when the regional board office is open and they can talk to their um, you know, talk to staff and they find out, okay, no, that was not a water of the U.S. Can the agency then go back and correct that report? How, how, how will that work? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, board member Morgan. Um, any enrollee can go back and change reported information with more information they have. Um, the two hour requirement is for notification to Cal OES. So not to a regional board. Um, and we maintain that two hours uh, after knowledge of the spill. We do know a lot of these spills happen overnight, but Cal OES is always open and the regional boards always have uh, an assistant executive officer or a key manager um, on call in order for any emergency. So for that notification, we just believe it's important. And of course, I can't remember, does this come from the water code or maybe if Bill Wiles is here that can assist us on the origin of the two hours? It is per the water code and it's per the existing order requirements. We, we have not changed the, the time frame for notification to Cal OES. Okay. Thank you. Right, and understandable. I just wanna make sure just we get that sequence down because it does go to Cal OES who then turns around and Cal OES calls the regional board and the um, agency also calls the regional board staff on call. So those two calls do come in and that report from Cal OES also gets emailed in the middle of the night. So, you mm. know, while it may not be reported into CWIX, there is a report that comes into the regional board in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. um, you know, prior to, you know, business hours. And I just wanted to make sure that while that initial report is coming in, that then the reporting into CWIX can then be identified as this actually did not go to a water of the US or it did. And so that the we can get the correct reporting into CWIX so that it can be identified um, with, with the you know, most up-to-date information available. Yes, and for clarification, uh, the two hour notification correct is to Cal OES. The reporting does not come until days later. And so, um, okay. Afruz or Walter, can you assist with that on when the actual reporting into CWIX so, takes place? Okay, the reporting into CWIX, okay, yes. Yes, it's just the, it's just the notification, that's yes. two hours. And oh, I do see Tim Regan's here. I'm sorry, Tim, I didn't know that you were here. Um, right, um, Diana, thanks. I just wanted to mention that the water code provision dealing with this water code 13271 requires reporting to OES immediately. And it's not necessarily defined as two hours. Um, what is the meaning of immediately? I, you know, as soon as they know about it, really, it could be less than two hours. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, I just have one more question. So basically, um, and so you know, there, with additional reporting um, requirements, I was looking at some of those and some of those look like, you know, maybe a little challenging for some of our small systems. And so I was just wondering if you guys know if technical assistance will be um, offered for some of those small systems to um, create these, the, the additional reports or graphs that are being asked for, for the additional reporting requirements in the proposed order. Yes, uh, board member Morgan, I think that's a really good question for us to ask CASA. Um, we are hoping that more attention gets placed on sewer spills with the adoption of an upgraded order and that we can um, hopefully see more funding programs. Um, but I also see our chief deputy director with his hand up. So I will let you talk, John. 
I just wanted to add a little bit of context to the two hour notification. That was in the existing order um, and it was added about 10 years ago, probably by a um, uh, order of the uh, executive director to modify the, um, the reporting because of the issue of what is immediate and how do you determine when it needs to be reported? And we had some instances of reporting that was um, fairly delayed. And um, and so the executive director issued a, a, a update to the monitoring required to, to, um, to clarify um, timeframes for reporting to OES. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, that's helpful. And thank you, board member. Uh, board member Firestone. Yeah, I will um, just have a couple questions. Um, one is in the prioritization of the condition assessment for high risk areas, and maybe I'm not fully understanding this, but um, the prioritization was really around um, uh, risk to the environment. And I'm wondering if we have a place for um, public health or you know public health and safety or nuisance um, as well as just looking at um, disproportionate impact on um, BIPOC communities and communities disproportionately burdened by pollution. Is that something that um, fits within that section or we could look at trying to add um, in, in terms of prioritization of assessing risk? Thank you, board member Firestone. That is very good input. And I know just recently we've had a lot of new discussions on um, impact to disadvantaged communities from utilities. That would be an appropriate place to place that addition. Um, to be honest, I think this is the first time we're really thinking about the specific impact on disadvantaged communities. Um, I, I would say our order does kind of put environmental consequences all together, but is not as specific as you're asking. And there is room to do that. Great, yeah. And I know I've heard Region 4 um, continues to give updates on um, the Carson spill that also went into Dominguez Channel. And just Dominguez Channel has a, a number of different um, uh, real problems that have have come up, um, but impact, uh, you know, nuisance, human health, and and disproportionate impact um, in in that community. Um, I just as an example, and I know you know systems obviously care about this um, and want to be assessing where there's risk um, of any failures, and especially that would affect their customers um, more directly. So. I, this is really just, I, I think, a ability to um, to emphasize the prioritization that we all have on that, um, and make sure that we're helping to to pull that out. And part of that, I think, goes to my my second question, which is really, I know we have a number of efforts now, um, including we're going to be talking later on today about our amendments to our intended use plan and. Um, and doing a wastewater risk assessment. And um, I just wanted us to think about as we're adopting this order, if there are um, ways to um, help uh, identify or get, I, I think we're doing this in terms of collecting data on um, boundaries, which is one of one key data point that I think we need. Um, but just trying to figure out how we work through defining and um, and tracking ultimately where there's failing systems and at-risk systems mm -hmm. so that we can prioritize them for funding. And I think that would include also this issue of where there's um, really high risk areas of failure like we saw with Carson within, you know, maybe a the system itself isn't what we would call a failing system, but there's areas that really should be prioritized for 
um, within our funding pots, especially as we have a lot more funding coming around this. So just, I just wanted to flag that in terms of um, as we refine this, um, just thinking about how we can enable um, prioritization for both funding and technical assistance um, as we as we look at risk and um, and how to target the new funding that's going to be coming down. Very good, thank you. I, I believe the more information we have submitted to our board electronically, the easier those type of evaluations will be. Also to address um, your question about are we, um, you know, how are we address, addressing disadvantaged communities? Um, one of the foundational reasons we believe it's important to um, include waters of the state, including groundwater, is that um, exfiltration, even though lots of people do not like that word, um, could mean sewage seeping its way into groundwater, especially when groundwater rises. And lots of disadvantaged communities do get their water supplies from their own domestic wells. Um, so that I just wanted to point out is another um, important reason we want to make sure if this order clarifies the protection of waters of the state, not just surface waters. And I do see Walter's hand up, Walter. Thank you, Diana. I just wanted to go back and um, answer board member Morgan's question uh, regarding the reporting timeframes uh, for the category one and two bills. Uh, which is that we did not modify what's already existed with already in the existing order, which is within three business days, a draft spill report is due into CWIX, and then um, 15 calendar days, um, we require that it's certified within that time frame. Thank you, Ms. Mobley, and thank you, Ms. Messina. Uh, board member Firestone, uh, was there anything uh, further? I, I appreciate that. And, and I think it mirrors, I, I appreciate your comments and it, they really do mirror as well. Uh, board member Morgan's request around uh, support, uh, technical support and assistance for particularly the smaller systems here. But to your uh, point as well, it, it really is a continuum to the infrastructure dollars we have and the informational basis that we have to make those, those investments, like on the drinking water side, where we've seen a, a lot of advancement in our ability to really understand and assess the, the condition of our, our, our systems with the systems themselves and here, you know, help prioritize investments and be able to see better those communities that are, are really needing us to better bridge um, our services, our, our work, uh, both on the technical assistance side, but also on the, the infrastructure funding side to help, help uh, meet the mission of the Clean Water Act, which again, I think it can very easily be taken for granted here uh, and Porter Cologne, which the, the waste, charge, uh, waste discharge requirements are uh, the legal uh, hook for here, but uh, all together, um, you know, provide us this opportunity to really continue to, to emphasize the needs of, our, of our, our most vulnerable communities, but especially these essential systems that as we've talked here can, can really impact public health and challenge our ability to uh, protect drinking water sources, which is, you know, our other hat uh, here as a board. So just thank you both board members for the, the good questions and emphasis here. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, any, any other uh, comments, questions, thoughts? And if not, we can uh, begin to go to some of our, our commenters and hear uh, their reflections on what we're getting right or wrong. And reminder everyone uh, that this is a workshop. And so um, we have the benefit of just being able to explore these. It's not a decision point and do and really appreciate everyone's time and engagement here. So uh, I think our first commenter is Debbie Webster, who will be followed by uh, former uh, State Water Resources Control Board member, uh, Stephen Moore. And looking forward to, to seeing our former colleague here in a moment. And seeing you here now, Ms. Webster. Glad well, you can join us, hello. Thank you, Chair Escobar and, and board members. I appreciate this. I, I, I do want to start off with uh, thanking um, thanking you and thanking staff. Um, we've had some good discussions with the informal staff draft. We're starting some good discussions with um, the proposed order. And um, 
it, and they've been super helpful in that um, really coming to a common understanding of what the goals and um, uh, what the goals are and trying to get the, the wording right. Because I think in the end, what we've seen is a very successful order of, you know, it said 16 years, I've been thinking 15 years, but a 15 year or so successful order. And we'd like to, I, I would be happy to get the wording right so that we have another 15 years of success. And so I, pre that just that collaboration, I've really appreciated it. And, um, and in today, I'm gonna just kind of focus in on two areas with a couple sub areas, but I also, um, wanted to say is we're looking forward to meeting with staff further um, and potentially with you board members to talk about some of these issues because we really do think that a lot of these can be hammered out and um, and, and really address the concern. So the two areas, two greater areas I want to talk about is, is a path of compliance and then also some of the cost of compliance. And, and um, I want to just start that with uh, some, these are some areas we've already talked to with staff. I think we've got some uh, potential ways through. We will be submitting written comments with potentially some specific language changes. But again, these conversations are so important to get there. Um, right now, the current order as written, it's unclear as to uh, exactly when uh, agencies would be required to have their SSMP updated or to do different aspects of the order. And in talking with staff, it seems like there's a way that we can submit some of that. But I do want to let, you know, just bring to, to your attention is right now it's unclear. And path of compliance is super important because we don't want our agencies out of compliance from day one when they certify, hey, I'm going to I'm going to comply with this order and get their SSMP hasn't changed. And the intention is not to have their SSMP in compliance. Um, all those changes made within the first that 120 days that was referenced earlier. So that was one of the areas that we felt like needed some air, um, some work. Um, also with de delinquent enrollees, they're considered to be a new enrollee. I think that there are some provisions where, okay, it makes sense. They'll have to resubmit an application. But then what happens with their SSMP? What happens with their auditing? What happens with those type of requirements that come down? Are they all, is it appropriate that they're all under the new enrollee timeframe or should there be something that just brings them back into compliance with what where they're supposed to be um, at that point? I think an, another path of compliance issue that, that we've identified is, um, is the certification requirements. Um, right now, there's a phrase at the end of the certification requirements um, that requires a operator or the, um, the uh, LRO the, uh, to certify that everything that's been submitted in the past is uh, meets the conditions of the order. And that is, I think, I, we have a, a problem with that in that they can certify for what they're certifying, but to certify for other people's products and other areas just is an overreach and probably would continue to be a, um, an issue. So those are a couple of the areas. My, uh, our, our clean water um, some of partners and, and other speakers will speak to some other areas that are super important in those two. I don't, but these are the ones I wanted to at least draw to your attention. Um, on the, it also within the path of compliance, um, I, the, you asked about the small agency, the small agencies, and I appreciate the attention that's being brought to them. Um, I do think that this new order with, with some of the requirements are a heavy lift. And um, as we deal with the path and the cost, there's some carryover between the two that I think are important. Um, the, the, the SSMP, which is kind of the meat and potatoes of the program, the purpose a little bit is changing. Um, I think you were told about the idea of incorporating procedures, changing some prioritization. I think one of the other big things, and this is where I think some thought needs to be put into it, is that if you say it in your SSMP and you don't do it, it's a compliance problem versus 
hey, I've got a small agency. We recognize we have to do this much work. And it becomes a planning tool, which is what the first, uh, what, what it really was set out initially to do. It becomes a planning tool. And you look at it and you say, okay, I'm going to try to do this much but I might not be able to get to this without additional funding or if something comes up um, that, that takes precedence, I'm not gonna be able to do this. So there's, there's, a, little, it, there's a little bit uh, with the compliance and some of the discussion that we're still trying to figure out how to, how to thread that, that needle well and, and meet both the objectives of the planning tool that this could be and the usefulness that this could be, especially for the small communities that need additional funding versus um, this is your this is your plan and you are going to implement it and this is how you're we're gonna we're gonna judge compliance. Um, okay, then something that that I I first of all I want to tell you I really appreciate the idea of putting carrots in versus sticks is looking at those ways of how can we um, incentivize. Um, how can we incentivize uh, uh, certified operators? And um, I will tell you on the category four, we, the, I think across the board, regardless of sizes, our agencies uh, appreciate the idea of a category four, but the, the incentivization area, this is an area where if, if uh, category fours didn't have that same level, you know, it wasn't a trigger. This could be a huge cost of compliance uh, area. And I think you're, again, you're gonna hear some more about this, but I will tell you from Savikwa and from our membership, this rose to the top because for many of our agencies, they feel like this is a, uh, not a good use of public funds. It's very time consuming and there's not a lot of uh, uh, benefit to the environment or to human health that it, it, they're not balanced. And then finally, I just wanted to, uh, to touch on one other area is, is on the sampling. We've been having a lot of the sampling if there is a spill to a surface water. We've been having a lot of discussion about that and what, what is appropriate. I think we still have more discussion to uh, make. We have some agencies that that field sampling is, is really critical for others. They're like, it's easier for us to take it in a bottle and take it to our, um, our laboratory. And having that flexibility, I think is going to be important. So I think you're gonna see some stuff. I don't, what I'm trying to, I guess what I've been trying to say all this time is I don't have all the answers. We're working through them. We're hoping that, that through collaboration with, with your staff, with you, uh, with others, that we can really get to um, a smart permit that again, last 15 years that, that we see benefits from and, um, and, and meets these requirements. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webster. Appreciate the, the good constructive comments here, but also just the, the engagement um, around uh, all of this. And to your point, uh, this is a real opportunity to, to make sure that we're understanding how we can, as a board member Firestone pointed out, make investments wisely here and get systems themselves to evaluate, understand uh, the investments they need to make. But you know, when it comes to those plans, I understand they're also about the definitive steps one takes when there is a spill, right? And so there is maybe, you know, yes, the investments that will continue to you know, draw down the, the incidences of them, but um, it's, again, they're, they're, they're accomplishing uh, multiple things, um, it seems. So I appreciate uh, the good feedback on that. Um, uh, Mr. Regan. Thanks, Board, board, uh, board Chair. Um, I do understand Ms. Webster's um, concern about the lack of clarity on when the SSMPs need to be updated. And a few days before we sent out the most recent version of the draft public comment, we added some parenthetical clarifying language to specification 5.5 that I, I hope will do the job. But if, if not, it would be helpful to hit, get feedback in the written comments. Um, Great. Thank you. And thank you for flagging that. Thank you again, Ms. Webster. Thank and you. it's with great honor that I, I, I call up Mr. Stephen Moore. How are you doing, <laughs> sir? Good to see you. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to see you, uh, Chair Escabel, honorable members of the State Water Board, and all staff, uh, whether your faces or your names, uh, it's great to see you all again. 
Um, and uh, I was hoping for a trip to Sacramento, but I'll just settle for the virtual trip today. Um, thanks, I'm Steve Moore, former state board member, but now general manager of uh, the Ross Valley Sanitary District. We're a collection system agency in central Marin County of 200 miles of sewer, serving a population of about 50,000. And that makes us a medium-sized enrollee in the statewide order. And when you look at the pie, the medium and large are a little less than a quarter of the agencies that are enrolled. And so we're kind of in that smaller section of pie. Since yesterday was pie day, I thought I'd mention that. So there we go. So uh, anyway, um, what I wanted to uh, also let you know that I'm, uh, we're part of the Joint Powers Agency. So we have, we're part of this, uh, we own the Central Marin Sanitation Agency Treatment Plant. And that's where most of the compliance issues, you know, over the decades have been focused, right? So in my comments, I want to emphasize two points. Uh, we have been heard and the existing order is a good enforceable order. So let me uh, expound on that a little. First, I want you to know I appreciate staff's management of this process so far. And I was not surprised uh, because I know staff's understanding of the need to partner with local government to tap into knowledge of best practices on the ground. And so that, that's, I think, you know, the process to date. Emphasize that. I think, you know, one uh, interesting nuance to all this, I'd like to point out is after all, this year, the board is going to allocate millions of dollars to convert septic systems to sewer systems, recognizing that sewer systems are a solution, not a problem to water quality challenges, but they are infrastructure to be operated, maintained, and periodically re rehabilitated, which is really the substance of the existing statewide order. And a good thing to remind ourselves of. So I, I do believe we collection systems have been listened to uh, and the changes from the informal draft order to the current draft order reflect that fact. Uh, out of the top 10 areas of concern uh, that the BACWA members put forward, I believe you've addressed eight or maybe seven and a half, but, but eight and eight out of 10. Uh, we'll round up. Magic 80%. <laughs> so I'm very confident that with your support, uh, from the board members that we can continue to collaborate and avoid unintended consequences of some remaining proposed changes to the statewide order. So that leads into my second point, uh, that any changes I do believe should be a fine tuning exercise, uh, including in some cases, relaxation of requirements based on what we've learned in 16 years of managing the program. And that has to do, you know, in 06, we may have made some conservative assumptions on water quality risk and that sort of thing. So things are not getting worse, they're getting better. So this order does not need to be intensified or significantly more prescriptive to protect water quality. And uh, for example, we've talked about it, you know, the proposed small category four spills only to be summarized in an annual report is a good idea. Um, you know, it's, it can, it's a performance metric, but it's not necessarily a water quality risk metric, right? So uh, we think this I, good idea should be in, available to all enrollees. And, and um, I want to support the idea of incentives um, and encourage maybe uh, more of a, it might be better applied to some kind of certificate of exemplary performance or, or that kind of pathway. So I've I also struggle with how you link it to compliance and, and look forward to more discussions. And then I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts, you know, in terms of the history, you know, the regulating collection systems was a new challenge to the water boards in uh, 06. And it continues to be somewhat opaque because we are not dischargers. You know, the statewide order is a discharge prevention program, not a discharge regulation program. So unlike effluent dischargers, which can be measured and linked to water quality outcomes, it's difficult to define what good looks like for a collection system using waste discharge requirements. And cert certain uh, monitoring requirements are not very useful for what are fairly rare short-lived events. So we wanna fit the right tool to the right application. 
So I do believe the 06 order is one of the water board's successful water quality programs. It's reduced the volume and, and frequency of untreated wastewater spills. Um, perhaps more importantly, it's created a culture of accountability and commitment in local agencies to sewer systems while mindful of cost of compliance. You know, I do think the existing order takes into account some things and, and you hear them being continued into the proposed order. And I think it is appropriate. Uh, before 06, most money went to the treatment plants. The 06 order was the first major, major incentive for local agencies to invest in the sewer systems, raise rates and other revenues to make the investment. So it's paid off in many ways that we don't know because that's the nature of prevention. But I am convinced we've prevented many disasters, like big sinkholes in, in major arterials, for instance, and, uh, and the commensurate emergency costs. So it, it's a great order. It's a fine tuning exercise and, and it's great working with staff and we look forward to continue to rolling up our sleeves. And it's great to see uh, the water board members uh, doing great work today, dealing with a very challenging drought uh, my thoughts go out to you, and uh, thanks for welcoming me so warmly to speak today, uh, Chair Esquivel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore, uh, for you know your good, quiet, and good leadership, uh, both at your time here at the board and then now uh, at at the the sanitary district. So just uh, appreciate your your good comments here on on this order, um, and glad you know for your perspective here now. You know, having engaged with. Uh, the, the, the public process and I'm glad that it continues to live up to a standard. I know we as board members continue to really expect where, um, you know, I, I was you know, uh, gonna reflect on Ms. Webster's comment when she said um, that she doesn't have all the answers and, and here you can trust uh, neither do I or here any one of us, um, but it's collectively through this engagement and through exploring these uh, here, understanding what's working and what we can improve and having an honest engagement and assessment around the cost, the trade-offs amongst it that uh, help us get to what can be those answers. So um, just thank you. And I appreciate your, again, your good contributions here and look forward to continuing to have them. So thanks for the kind words as well. Uh, okay, next I'd like to call up Mary Cousins. Good afternoon, Chair Escabel and members of the board. My name is Mary Cousins, and I'm representing the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, or BACWA. And first, I, I wanna express my appreciation to Diana Messina and her group in hearing and understanding our comments on last year's informal staff draft. This version is indeed a big improvement over that version. BACWA continues to have concerns about several elements in the public draft. And the three requests that I bring to you today that would lower the cost of compliance are first, the definition of category one spills. Second is reporting requirements for the smallest spills. And third is the monitoring requirements for receiving waters. Now, first we are going to probably request that the definition of category one spills be expanded to include all spills to surface waters instead of restricting that definition to waters of the US. As we've talked about today, I've heard you mention, we do understand there is a legal rationale for the distinction, but operators from BACWA have expressed loudly and clearly to me that it is just not practical to make that legal distinction during the rapid spill response period, whether it's hours or days. If there needs to be a distinction made, that can be made during the enforcement process, which is longer and more contemplative, or perhaps the distinction could be made elsewhere in the order. Um, our second request is to simplify the reporting requirements for those smallest spills. We are huge fans of this order's new concept of category four spills, which are those less than 50 gallons. And we propose to further modify that definition to clarify that these category four spills can't have potential to reach surface water or cause a nuisance. The draft order proposes a complex and frankly unworkable incentive system in which certain agencies with low spill rates would qualify for reduced reporting of category four spills. We request instead that all agencies automatically qualify for that reduced reporting 
it could go in annual reports instead of monthly reports. And our comment letter will identify complete details for this proposal. Our third and final request today is to simply remove the new receiving water testing requirements for turbidity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and pH. The proposed testing would require that each of those um, 1,100 enrollees go out and purchase several new rather expensive field probes for these parameters. They would need to train their field crews to use them. And these probes are finicky to operate. They require frequent recalibration. They can't just be left in the truck until a spill happens. Despite the expense and effort required for data collection, the data wouldn't be usable for enforcement because at least in our region, the water quality objectives for pH and turbidity and so on they require you to know what the background non-spill conditions are. So for example, the turbidity objective is based on an observed turbidity change. Now currently field, crew, um, field crews go out and they collect grab samples for bacteria and ammonia. They can keep those sample bottles ready in their truck. Then the samples go back to laboratories for analysis. This makes sense because there are numeric objectives for bacteria and ammonia that aren't based on background conditions. So the grab samples can actually be used for enforcement. By contrast, the new requirement would provide much pain for field crews and no gain for enforceability. So we respectfully request its removal. Thank you so much for continuing to work with us um, on improving this order. We look forward to working with your staff as the new order is implemented. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Cousins. I appreciate uh, the good comments here and, and again, the constructive feedback on uh, what is uh, causing the most cost. And it's a balance ultimately here between the protections and you know the goals of certainly um, eliminating discharges, but uh, the cost ultimately here balanced amongst it. So thank you. I'll note here we are at one o'clock and I apologize because I know we are um, here uh, in the middle of our commenters, but uh, I also want to acknowledge that Senator, uh, Senator Portentino has joined us for item number six. Senator, uh, we're still in the middle of item five. We will, we will be in this for a long while and I know you have uh, a, a, a packed schedule. So what I wanted to offer up here is that we'll go ahead and take a pause on item uh, number five and the comments that we've been receiving. We'll uh, hear from the Senator and his feedback on item number six, which although we haven't heard yet, we all know the topic of and, and would gladly take your comment then. We'll break for lunch and then we'll come back and continue on uh, hearing our commenters for item number five. A little messy, but I appreciate everyone's uh, patience and hope that works well and gets us here to a lunch so that uh, folks can recharge a bit on item number five as is. So. Thanks for that. And uh, Senator Portentino, I appreciate you joining us today. I know again, your your, your calendar in, in, is very busy. And so want to be able to take a moment to be able to take your comment on the intended use plan uh, and the changes to the drinking water and uh, clean water state revolving funds that we're um, in guidelines that we're uh, gonna be discussing in item number six later. So by all means, thank you. Thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Board. And I know we're all busy. Uh, you know, you guys are, are just as busy and you guys have been at it all day, but I really do appreciate you letting me speak now because um, I'm, I'm up against a, a deadline uh, in, in a half hour. So I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for, for doing what you're doing and in particular with uh, septic to sewer conversions. Um, as you know, I was a strong advocate to make sure that we, you know, gave you the funding to necessary to do that because communities around the state uh, are struggling with that issue. Um, certainly the environment warrants us to, to get off the septic systems as quickly and urgently as possible because you know the nitrites that go into the water and the nitrates and the, the effect on the water table uh, in particular in Los Angeles County um, is significant. And it's a subject that goes back to my days on the city council uh, being a strong supporter of uh, getting communities off septic and onto sewer systems. So I really appreciate the partnership uh, in that goal. Um, I do want to strongly encourage you on the criteria you're using that there are some special circumstances out there. There are communities that have tried to self-tax, who have put ballot measures on their ballot to, to 
create local districts in order to fund it, but because of topography, engineering challenges, other significant issues, those costs have been exorbitant and where one neighborhood in a community may have different topography and been able to afford it, uh, other neighborhoods have engineering challenges that have made the costs prohibitive. So I, I'm here to A, say thank you for all of your work on this important issue, but B, to encourage you to adopt a set of criteria that allows you to take into consideration those types of special circumstances. And some of you may have read the letter that I sent. I'll just go through it briefly. There are cities where a household hookup would be in excess of $100,000 per per household. That's that's a sizable amount of money, which is why when it was put on the ballot, that community, you know, that neighborhood, you know, couldn't afford to to, to vote for it. There are cities, as I said, that have put things on the ballot. That should be a criteria that you weigh. You know, I, I'm not here to say a community that hasn't made an earnest effort uh, should be treated differently than a community that has made an earnest effort. And so I would encourage you to include that criteria uh, as you move forward. Those cities that have tried um, with preliminary design and gone out to the ballot should be given some weight versus a community that hasn't tried uh, to pass a local tax measure. Um, cities that have significant geological and engineering challenges. Uh, you know, as you know, in throughout California, there are, you know, bedrock places and, and sand places and some places it's just easier to, to, to tunnel and pipe and, and others. And, you know, you should give weight to that. There are communities that have already sewered, you know, up to 60% of those communities. And it's the balance that's the tough. That's a criteria that you should look at. And then, uh, you know, communities where the cost of one neighborhood might be three or four times what another neighborhood in that same city is. Um, so, I, and then there are cities that can afford to put up, you know, a 25% or 30% match. So uh, I'm encouraging you to look at some creative ways to help communities in those, you know, unique situations uh, work with you. And so uh, to the most amount of discretion you can give yourselves where you can sit down and look at a community by community decision. Uh, that's what I'm encouraging you to do today. Um, don't lock yourself into something that is so rigid that you can't take into consideration uh, those outlying communities that, that have tried in earnest and have unique topography. So uh, that's a long winded uh, request. Um, it's in my letter as well. And uh, please err on the side of discretion um, because this is important. Um, and as you know, the state is in a good situation uh, Budget-wise, uh, capital improvement pro projects and, and infrastructure projects are not part of the GAN limit, and so you know we should use these this unique time to solve problems that if we don't take the advantage of solving now, we're never going to solve. And so those communities that are up against these hardships really rely on this moment in time to get them over the hump. And so thank you for letting me go first, and thank you for all the work that you do and. Uh, my office is available. I know David will stay online as you go through your discussion as I have to run into another meeting. Um, but I really, really encourage you to give yourself as much discretion and breath as you can to make these unique situations palatable for, for California taxpayers. Thank you so much, Senator, for your leadership. And to your point, we are really at this generational moment where we have, uh, with the 1.3 billion on the drinking water, half drinking water, half wastewater that we were provided, thanks to your leadership, the legislature and the governor this last summer, uh, a real opportunity with as well federal investment coming down. Right. And so, you know, as we'll as we go into the item, we'll we'll definitely have your your good um, suggestions and, and thoughts here in mind. You know, we are looking to and here um, in the IUP will be looking to be more flexible and uh, continuing to make sure we're providing and bridging um, what are these really needed investments in so many of our communities. So thank you for advocating for, for these resources and appreciate you engaging with the board in our process here um, as we develop these, these guidelines to make sure we're, we're getting it just right. And even you know, reflective of the item we were just on around um, our, our sanitary sewer systems, the data that we're collecting on that, and again, the need to bridge to communities that are currently on septic. And again, easy to take it uh, for granted here 50 years after Clean Water Act, after right. Porter Cologne, all this great progress, but still yet um, a, a number of inequities. Uh, so thank you for, for all of it and for your leadership and I uh, appreciate the, the time that you provided here today. Thank you, Chair and members. I appreciate it and everybody be well today. You too. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, there I'll kind of pause. What was a, a comment on, on item six? I'll bring us back to item five here now. We're taking a pause on comments and I, I appreciate and uh, hate to have to ask our folks to stay on here uh, through the lunch, but um, to give that uh, discussion justice and to not stretch us too long before we have a lunch. Let's go ahead and take a quick 30 minute uh, that'll bring us to 140, and then we can continue item number five at that time. Thank you all. I look forward to the continued discussion. Have a good lunch, and uh, see you here uh, soon.
All right, everyone, it's 140. We can begin to gather back. I hope everyone had a good lunch. And I want to thank everyone again for their patience and allowing me to here uh, divide our item up a bit and um, have a lunch here in the middle and appreciate folks hanging on. I believe our first commenter will be Jared Voskel, uh, followed by Chris Dewars. Oh, and apologize. Our first commenter actually be Alan Shear. I'll pay attention to my scroll next time better. I'll give a moment for perhaps Mr. Shear, who will be followed by uh, Mr. Voskel and then Mr. Dewars. Provide them a moment here, I guess. Now, Chair Esquivel, I will point out that uh, Mr. Shear had indicated if necessary. But at this point in time, we've offered him multiple opportunities to unmute. Okay, thank you. And uh, I actually had my wrong headset in at the same time. So thankfully, um, they didn't actually respond. Uh, next, then, I would like to call up Jared Voskel. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you, Chair Scabell and board members. Um, you know, I was, uh, Bobby Larson was supposed to provide comments today uh, and she wasn't able to. So I was going to also do those uh, as a separate item. And um, I think she was first in the order, so I could do her. She was, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, that, that worked and, and thank you for doing that. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, uh, Jared Voskel and standing in for Bobby Larson, uh, my brother wears size 18 shoes, um, but I think hers might pale in comparison. Uh, she was going to deliver these, but had another appointment she had to depart for. Uh, but they were on behalf of CAS and the Re Regional Clean Water Associations today. Um, we want to begin by conveying our appreciation to the WDR team for the processes they've undertaken and for the ability to dialogue and provide our members input and expertise from the field. Uh, the focus of this comment is on the addition of a new prohibition, uh, 4.1. Uh, the other two prohibitions, 4.2 and 4.3, those have been in place since the 2006 order uh, was adopted, and they're clear and unambiguous. They prohibit discharges of sewage to waters of the U.S. and dis discharges that cause a nuisance, and the Water Board's authority to regulate these discharges are clear. Uh, in contrast, this new prohibition, 4.1, is unclear. Uh, we're uncertain about its necessity and, and, it, and it might be legally flawed. Um, the prohibition states that any discharge from a sanitary sewer system that has the potential to discharge to waters of the state is prohibited unless it is promptly cleaned up and reported as required in this general order. Uh, a prohibitions need clarity and several key elements of this newly proposed prohibition are open to interpretation, uh, such as whether a spill has the potential to reach water of the state uh, what counts as promptly and as cleaned up. Um, during the workshop discussion last month, staff advised that potential in the context of the prohibition has its ordinary dictionary meaning. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines potential as possible as opposed to actual. Uh, so in other words, this prohibition would establish liability for discharge that does not occur. Um, pr similarly, prompt means without delay. And so there are questions for the meaning of that um, must be cleaned up in one hour, a day, um, somewhere in between. And if it is cleaned up and there's no environmental impact, but it doesn't meet um, a definition for being promptly cleaned up, would that be subject to enforcement? Uh, as maybe an example of, of the conundrum we, we feel this creates, uh, on its face as currently drafted, this provision uh, would deem a spill of any volume to pave surface near a storm drain inlet that did not reach the drain or waters at all and was 95% cleaned up uh, to be a violation of the order. Uh, to be sure, we don't expect enforcement to be overly punitive or unreasonable here, uh, but the point is the clarity, and the problem is one of due process, ultimately. Uh, due process requires prohibitions to be sufficiently clear for an enrollee to understand what is required and to conform its conduct to the, the law. Uh, during the staff workshops, legal counsel noted that interpretation of whether a spill has potential to reach waters of the state would require a case-by-case -case analysis uh, by the Office of Enforcement. And the first notice that an enrollee has of its obligations should not be at the enforcement action stage when it's commenced. 
Um, in addition, the Water Board's purpose is ish in issuing this order is to protect the quality of the waters of the state and keep sewage from entering those waters. And so we have a question whether the board has the authority to regulate a release of sewage that does not impact waters based on the mere possibility that it could have, but it didn't. Uh, we understand that staff may believe that spills that do not reach waters of the United States may be an indicator that a system is not properly operated and maintained, uh, but that consideration alone um, can't justify the prohibition when releases themselves are not unlawful under the water code. Uh, there are many other, also there are many other resources and avenues available to evaluate system performance beyond this prohibition, um, including over a decade of reporting and, and plans in CWICS already. So to close, um, this prohibition would sow confusion and lend itself to uneven and inconsistent enforcement. I think moreover, the ambiguity of the terms would hamper rather than enhance enforcement by opening the door for enrollees to argue about the meaning of uh, the terms we discussed. And we also are concerned it doesn't substantively add uh, anything of importance to the order as there are pages and pages of very specific requirements for how systems are operated, managed, maintained, and how to respond when there is uh, sanitary sewer overflow. So for these reasons, we request that uh, prohibition 4.1 be deleted and we thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. Uh, you bring up some good points when it comes to perhaps some of the ambiguity there. Um, with the request to completely remove it, you know, at this point, I'd like to continue to make sure I understand, um, you know, how maybe uh, either some of those things can be cleared up or or how we continue to talk, uh, maybe talk further around it. So I appreciate though the, the real flag and concern about the ambiguity of the language. So thank you, Mr. Vosco, appreciate it. Um, should I proceed to- Yes, you can, you can uh, proceed. Well, I should have said, thank you, uh, Ms. Larson. And now, you know, you can proceed to Jared Vosco's comments. All right. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Chair Eskwell and board members. Um, Good afternoon, Jared Bosco. Uh, on behalf of CASA, the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, uh, CASA represents more than 125 public agencies and municipalities that engage wastewater collection, treatment, recycling, and resource recovery, and numerous members uh, who manage the sanitary sewer, sewer system pipes uh, that are used to transport wastewater to treatment plants um, will be affected by this order, uh, which governs the, their systems. Uh, at the top, uh, we want to thank the numerous members of your team who have worked on and developed this updated draft order over the last five or so years. We've had numerous conversations about so many topics and elements in this order, and we are very appreciative of your team listening to our operators' practical concerns with implementing the order so that you could arrive at a version that achieves your objectives without a sharp increase in that local cost of compliance. Uh, for those participating in today's workshop uh, who haven't popped a manhole cover or, or don't dabble in the sector, Sanitary sewers are the underground systems of pipes around the state that trans transport residential wastewater containing urine, feces, cleaning products, and food waste, amongst other items that are put down the drain. Uh, as that classic children's book, Everyone Poops, documents, uh, our member agencies expertly perform and provide an essential and necessary public service for society by collecting and treating multiple waste streams and then recovering the resources contained within them. Uh, to place that sentiment in context, I read recent scientific estimates that each person's contribution to the sanitary sewer system results in an annual uh, 66 pounds of biosolids. Um, so the order and discussion here though pertains to the beginning of these complex systems and how we manage, maintain and operate the pipes that lead to the treatment facilities. The board adopted the first order governing this in 2006 and there are now 1100 enrollees around the state who daily manage their systems under the requirements and provisions. And since that 2006 order went into effect, enrollees have dramatically reduced the spill frequency and volume. Uh, category three spills comprise approximately 80% of the current uh, listings in the CVICS database. And so as to say four fifths of the incidences that are reported are for very low volume SSOs that don't reach another water. And, and those have dramatically increased over time. Perhaps a more critical concern is the category one SSOs, which are those incidents that do reach a water of the US and those only comprise 15% of the CWICS database. And under the current order, those have decreased by nearly two thirds since 2008 because of enrollees proactive and diligent management of their systems, uh, which entails routine inspection, assessment, repair and replacement. Um, so we'll provide written comments by the deadline, but to highlight some of the remaining concerns with the draft order, uh, you've heard or will hear from others today who will um, deliver detailed remarks seeking refinements on items 
including the definition of exfiltration, the designation of the LRO and the different documents they certify, um, the term changes in waters of the US and waters of the state and the new receiving water monitoring requirements. Uh, it, additionally, it should be noted that nearly 600 enrollees or about 50% of them are very small systems, less than 20 miles. And another 330 are small systems that have less than 100 miles. And combined, they comprise about 80% of enrollees. So it's critically important for the success of this new order that we consider their needs to ensure that smooth transition. But all that said, we really do like how this draft has retained the structure of the 2006 SMP and how it structured the compliance pathway for enrollees um, by requiring they complete that final 2006 uh, scheduled SSMP update before they begin um, moving forward with the audits and the new uh, update that they'll perform in the sixth year of the new order. Um, we think that this provides time for the transition so that there aren't significant cost increases. Um, and I think beyond the intent, which we're in alignment with how this is provided, there are some concerns with the language, but I think it's just technical um, type of wordsmithing that would produce the clarity and, and eliminate the confusion about how those terms are to be applied. And Debbie touched on that earlier, but we're optimistic that language will be ironed out and clear. Um, with the category four spill reporting, what I'm hearing from our members is a bit of a variation on, on what's been proposed in the draft. Instead of using criteria to incentivize uh, reduced reporting for category four spills, um, which is a proposition that seems to imply, in fact, that it's a data point of less interest or less priority, uh, we would alternatively propose that those two issues are decoupled. So instead of reduced reporting of category fours of, of well-performing systems as um, potentially defined in the draft, instead, all enrollees would still report those category four incidences, um, but they would be filed in their annual report. And so um, that helps with the administrative burden of not having to file a CVIX report for those really small incidents um, that are no threat to water quality nor nuisance, but they're still documented and preserved in the enrollees records and in the states. So if they're, they ever need to be considered and, and whether there's a broader systemic issue with that enrollees management of their sewer system, it would be accessible and it could be identified. And then last in the enforcement section of the current order, there's a provision allowing uh, for the recognition of extreme circumstances and discretion for enforcement for discharges that are uh, quote exceptional, unintentional, temporary, caused by factors beyond the reasonable control of the enrollee. And that comparable provision has been um, eliminated mostly and reduced to consideration of the spill duration and factors causing the event. And we would like to see that language um, it folded back in in some manner um, into the into the new order to provide for those extreme circumstances that really are beyond the control of an enrollee. Um, so with those comments, I would like to close out and um, again, thank your team and your staff for all the wonderful work they've done to meet with us and to really try to understand our concerns. And as a uh, former board member more recognized, um, so many of the concerns really have been eliminated and processed and there are now viable ways forward that achieve your objectives. And we're happy to have this part to collaborate and uh, work on this forward for the next order so that the next one can go another 15 years or so. And with that, I'll close. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Bosco. Really appreciate uh, both the comments delivered here. And uh, just give my thanks to <coughs> uh, Bobby Larson uh, and her incredible uh, continued leadership I know in this space. And thank you. OK, I'd like to also, uh, call up now Chris Ewers, uh, who we've followed by James Fisher. Thank you, Chairman Esquivel and, uh, and board and staff uh, for the opportunity to comment on this important, uh, this important update. Uh, I'm, by way of introduction, I'm a civil engineer uh, in California. I've worked in a few states uh, over the past, uh, good God, 24 years, and um, principally in water, wastewater, and stormwater. About eight years ago, a little more than eight years ago, I started a consulting firm, uh, uh, Ewers Engineering, that does water, wastewater, and stormwater principally for uh, municipalities. And it was a natural uh, pairing of our design, planning, and, and uh, implementation uh, skills and experience that we work on emergency response planning. Um, particularly around water systems. And that, that uh, planning changed pretty significantly back in 2018. Um, 
So uh, that's when the America's Water Infrastructure Act passed, and that's when water systems began to be required to do resilience planning. And uh, uh, so it's, it's out of that experience that I wanted to make some comments on the draft uh, WDR general order um, and, uh, and provide a little bit of input. At this point, there should be some slides up. I'm wondering, are, can you see them? Uh, they aren't up yet. And Ms. Townsend, uh, do you have those? Yes, they'll be okay. pulled up here shortly. OK, great. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. They should be here momentarily. And I, I kept them pretty simple, but, uh, but I hope they add to, the, add to the, the message. And as uh, we're waiting for them to come up, I just want to thank you for uh, kind of cross-pollinating there uh, between what our federal requirements and work and obviously then uh, the order here uh, before us. And you know, I appreciate the perspective and, and your, your time here with us. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, and that's a, great, that's a great point, that cross-pollination. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, there we are. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to focus, as as I am, as I implied, I'm going to focus on the resilience planning aspects of the draft WDR. Um, there's there's a lot to love about this about the uh, the draft, uh, and uh, and so I'm going to go over some some praise of why that resi those resilience planning requirements are great. Uh, some gaps that might be uh, filled to, to better the effectiveness and suggestions to better the effectiveness. Next slide, please. So uh, praise. Uh, resilience planning does something that's fantastic. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack just a little bit for um, a couple of comments that, that I heard from a, uh, a, a board member, uh, Firestone, I believe, and it was about uh, risk assessment. And risk assessment um, or risk analyses are really required to do anything associated with resilience planning. It's the first step. You have to do it in order to do resilience planning. So um, by requiring uh, resilience assessment, you're going to be requiring uh, risk assessments as well, or risk analyses. Um, uh, so uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, so the, uh, the resilience assessment does uh, uh, many things. One of the things it can do is to make emergencies into everyday occurrences out there in our, in our wastewater collection systems, in our, in our uh, water systems, in our treatment systems. Um, if we can build resilience in, then they stop being emergencies. They stop being spills because, because our system is able to take a bump. And, uh, and uh, it also improves uh, the, that core mission of protecting public health. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of things, uh, particularly around the AWIA uh, implementation uh, that is so seasoned because it came out of the 2002 Bioterrorism Response Act, a build on, on response from back in 9-11. From that seasoned response, the resilience assessment requires that we do some things that are pretty peculiar, and I haven't found them anywhere else. Um, there, number one, you have to take a failure-based perspective of your system, which is a, a, a remarkable uh, twist in perspective for a lot of folks. Um, and it also, as it's, as it's applied in the uh, uh, RAMCAP, uh, J100, one of the standards that was developed by standard agencies uh, uh, for water implementation, it requires that you consider the resilience impacts or the risk impacts to the community rather than the utility. Uh, consider, for instance, pg e shutdown of uh, power to communities all across the, the Sierras uh, this past summer and the summer before. It cost pg e almost nothing to do that. There's you know, some monthly cost that gets washed down the drain, but no big deal. If you're the fuel station that I pass near Colfax on the way to a hiking trail fairly frequently, and you're shut down for two weeks, can you imagine the impact to you for that risk implemented? implemented? So typically the community costs to, uh, for a utility failure dwarf massively the cost to the utility itself. And that is a, that's a wonderful thing about doing resilience assessments. Next, next slide, please. So in this resilience assessment, you've got the potential to have an even-handed consistent approach that accommodates a lot of the inequity 
and social issues and ecological issues that we've been discussing or that we've, and that are up front, um, and it, the potential to do simplified compliance checks. But to get there, we need to do some things. So next slide, please. So take a look at what makes an effective regulation. I know I'm. <laughs> this is kind of bizarre for me to be talking to you folks about this, but I look at it through a lens of useful, scalable, and enforceable. Those those three things. So what I'd like you to do is work with me through an implementation of resilience assessment. Let's say I'm a general manager of a mid-sized uh, collection system in California, and I've got plenty of time. I'm, I'm getting on and taking a look at this thing. And so uh, next slide, please. We're going, to, we're going to implement resilience assessment. So I, the first step is right in the, in the glossary uh, in our WDR. So resilience is the ability to plan, prepare for, mitigate, and adapt uh, to enable rapid recovery of physical, social, economic, and ecological infrastructure. Okay, and, uh, and then I'm gonna have adaptive capacity. So there's something missing here right away as somebody who's done this work, I can tell you that there's an element missing that says that if you implement it correctly, you can withstand hazards. Um, there's also, if, if, I'm, if I'm the enrollee, I'm on the hook by this uh, definition for social, economic, and ecological infrastructure. I have no idea how I'm, going to, how I'm going to accommodate those, but let's keep going. Okay, next slide, please. So under section 5.6, I'll implement system sp specific procedures, great, uh, to proactively prioritize, not do anything, I'm just gonna prioritize operation management, condition assessment, repair and rehabilitation to address ongoing system resilience, whatever that is. Um, okay, so I, so I need to set procedures to prioritize things and I'm gonna, and, and hey, apparently all I have to do is look at O&M condition assessment and repair and rehab maybe. Um, and it's going to address ongoing system resilience, which uh, as compared to something that's not ongoing. Okay, next slide please. So uh, I'm now going to, this is, this is the, the meat and potatoes of, of the, the document really in the attachment D. This is how I'm going to do something. Um, and so I'm going to, according to this, I'm going to address short-term and long-term system, resili re system resilience. That's not defined, um, but I've got a list of, of what are essentially BMPs uh, in a way, uh, proactive planning, which is a little uh, redundant, um, uh, updated operations and maintenance, identification of high-risk system spill areas, implementation of capital improvements, sufficient budget, and training. Okay. So as a, as a, 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 a general manager in, a, in a, a great system, I'm going to take these on, and I'm going to do my best to implement them. Uh, but let's shift chairs one, one slot over and just call me a general manager of a system that has no resources and no time. Uh, at this point, I could conceivably, as far as enforcement goes, I could conceivably do nothing. Uh, proactive planning, well, we do planning and decision-making. Yep, uh, check. Uh, updated operations and maintenance. Yeah, I talked to Bob about that. Uh, and identification of high, oh, of course, we identify things all the time. Um, implementation of capital improvements, of course, we, we do that all the time. Uh, sufficient budget. Hey, we've got a budget and we've got people, so that must be sufficient. And updated training of staff and contractors. Uh, if we do any training, it must be updated. I mean, it's happening right now. So if the, the idea is to put something in place that is needed, um, check the motivation and the enforceability and the usability of this language. Um, <clears throat> to get to those benefits that we were just talking about, we really need to do some tweaking. Next slide, please. So what's missing in, in this is standards, a process, resources for getting it done. There's there are some BMPs kind of mentioned in there, but boy, they're, they're limited and buried. Next slide, please. So a suggestion, change the definition of the glossary to start with. Resilience really is the ability to withstand an upset event without functional loss or to recover the function quickly after the event. Um, and that's a paraphrase from, from the RAMCAP uh, risk assessment methodology. 
uh, for critical asset protection uh, developed back in 2010. Um, it's a it's a fine it's a fine uh, definition, and it gives gives the it's broad enough to give people the ability to work with it. Uh, next slide, please. And then implement standards. Now that RAMCAP standard, it ain't perfect, but it's got a standard, <laughs> and and it's not bad. Um, the system resilience assessment um, really has a ton of lessons built into it. And rather than trying to ask all your enrollees to to reinvent the wheel, uh, maybe give them a lift up and say, you know, here's a here's a a piece of the AWIA or the RAM cap that really works. Uh, maybe focus on operational resi resilience calculations. They're fantastic. Um, and it, just, just in case you think I'm only talking about um, small uh, systems or, or scalable systems or disadvantaged systems, you know, back in, um, back in fe on February 11th, the Hyperion plant blew uh, 17 million gallons of, of sewage into the into open waters. Um, uh, back in 2020, uh, in August, mid-August, it was East Bay mud that uh, blew 3.7 million gallons of partially treated uh, sewage into the bay around Oakland. Um, I, I don't mean to take the stuffing out of these particular agencies, but it's more to say that uh, we don't have to look to disadvantaged communities to find fragility, to find system fragility, and to find a benefit from, a massive benefit from implementing resilience assessment, but it needs to be a little more toothy than what, what we've got here to work. Uh, next slide, please. And then define the process, um, required a structured approach of some kind. So the risk analysis is up front, and that focuses effort and prioritizes risks, quantifies the risk into, into a cost of upset events. And I admit that cost, determining the cost of an upset event can be fairly tough. Uh, what is the cost of, of uh, people getting sick, people dying? Um, there, it's a significant cost. Uh, my firm worked very carefully and I'm proud of our work to um, to define those costs through uh, uh, monetary values that are available through the through the feds. Uh, but I admit it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a push to get there. Um, so uh, the resilience assessment then quantifies the benefits in dollars by the foregone uh, risk happening. Um, and then you can do uh, benefit cost calculations, prioritizations, and it's transparent so that you can communicate it to uh, decision makers and to the public. Um, and then it's repeatable. Fantastic stuff. So uh, next slide, please. And then uh, the scalable part. How do we help the small systems? Well, again, maybe borrow something from the federal side. Uh, define small systems. And, and the Fed say 3,300 to 50,000 customers. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe more, maybe less, but define them so that they can get some help. Uh, risk and resilience can be done under the AWIA by filling out a form. Okay, now it doesn't get you all the benefits that I just talked about, but it gets somewhere and, uh, and it gives people some out. Or um, have the state board economist calculate the values of threat asset pairs and countermeasures. Uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is. If you're going to make people do this, then help them do it. Provide resource. Uh, and then uh, next slide, please. So to sum up, what we're looking for is useful or what I'm looking for is useful, scalable and enforceable. Um, the, what is on this draft WDRs is fantastic for the potential, but to make the potential happen, there are really some, some jumps that are needed to uh, specificity um, and to pull the confusion out of them uh, so that if, if nothing else, um, have some sympathy with the person who has to enforce this. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. And, uh, and if you have a committee on implementation, I would love to participate. I would love to help out. So any questions? Thank you for that, Mr. Yours. I appreciate your, your very thoughtful comments here. And again, the cross-pollination to some existing work on the federal side. Uh, we'll really take uh, these comments to heart as we uh, continue to, to discuss this. And please do just uh, track our website, <clears throat> the yep. opportunity to engage, to participate in further workshops and to be part of implementation as well is definitely always there and open to, to the public and yourself.
and really appreciate the good synthesis here. So thanks. Thank you, Chair. Take care. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up James Fisher. Thank you. Janine, can you, do you mind running my, uh, I have a PowerPoint too. I could maybe have you run through some of these. And thank you, Chair Escobar and honorable board members and the staff. Um, done a great job here. I have about 10 minutes. I have more suggestions I wanted to get in here. I echo a lot of the, the same comments, you know, kudos for staff really reaching out to the industry. So I'm Jim Fisher of Fisher Compliance. Um, I worked uh, with this order for about 12 years or so when I was at the Water Board and retired in 2020. And I'm out helping people now uh, with compliance and enforcement for WDR. So next slide, please. And you can just run through these, Jenny, if you want to. Um, I just want to put these up. These are all uh, the suggestions that I have in this presentation, um, starting with uh, formal implementation committee. A little more time for transitioning, maybe some review of the order and citizen enforcement. Again, this is a lot of feedback what I'm hearing from enrollees that I'm talking with and helping. Streamline enforcement for small spills. And I have a few more suggestions uh, at the end. Next slide, please. I haven't asked to sort of put together a, a 30,000 foot level. What's going on with this order? And this is what I came up with. I did this for SCAP. And yeah, you can see there's quite a bit of difference between the two orders. Uh, we Bruce did a great job earlier. Um, I broke it down in more of the line by line items. You can see the gap here in the, the, the additional items that are gonna be needed for each one of these. Next slide, please. This is more of the big ticket items here. And as you can see, you know, you, no surprise, the LRO requirements, resilience planning, uh, more legal authority industry standards. This is a lot more stuff. So in light of this, I came up with these next slide, um, kind of higher level comments and suggestions for running through here today. So a formal implementation committee, uh, I mentioned this during the workshops. I think there's some big benefits to this. Um, the state board has had this data review committee when I worked there, it was fantastic, but really designed for CWICs. I'm talking about something here that's a lot more um, uh, focused and a lot more uh, accountable really to smooth the transition to uh, technical guidance back for staff, being proactive, it really getting help in regions, helping the industry avoid violations. That's what I'm all about. And then the benefits to the state board, again, it's kind of mirroring those two, um, technical assistance, uh, feedback, and smoothing the transition. So really going with that. Next slide, please. I came up with a couple of just, uh, yeah, next slide. Right here, just some just basic language you might want to think about to put into the order somewhere in 317 or, or somewhere else. Next comment, next slide. Number two would be more time for transitioning. Um, I know you're you're thinking of a transition. That's fantastic. Um, I would recommend at least six months. And I know that uh, during the workshop, you know everybody knows this is not a new order. It's we already have an order. There's a brand new order with more requirements, so it's not like it's a brand new thing. However, the people I talk with, I think that's going to be tight. 60 days, 100, 100 I think it was 120 days. Why not going with something like six months? Next, uh, next slide. Got a couple of uh, um, just something real quick there into the language for recommendations for the uh, implementation. Next slide. Uh, ban review of the order. Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, uh, this used to be done fairly often when I worked at the board, maybe every year or two, they were, you were going to the board saying, hey, here's the effectiveness of this order. I think this would be fantastic every other year to really, you know, transparency, improve compliance, really help these and really get out in front of this thing especially with all the new requirements and it helped the board too, get some data that maybe support some future updates like was mentioned earlier. Next slide. This is uh, some suggested language for that. Uh, really, I came up with here, just some basic stuff here. Hey, do you have an annual uh, ongoing performance of the order? Yeah, actually in the order itself to make sure it goes through. Next uh, comment or next slide. This is an example, just if you haven't read these, um, you can go ahead and scroll through this. This is up on your website, but really good information here, really to really nail down how the orders work and what's not working, where the compliance caps are. So something like this every couple of years would be really super helpful. Next slide. Uh, number four, um, updating the citizen enforcement. Most of the enrollees that I'm talking to, you know, they really uh, could stay could use a hand staying uh, engaged and aware of some of these notices. So I know the state board is, um, next slide please, is uh, they're already uh, being CC'd. In 2011, there was a fantastic uh, job done here by the state board on kind of what's happening with the citizen actions. Something like this being updated regularly, again, another uh, well, comment I have. Next slide. 
streamline enforcement for small spills. Uh, there's tens of thousands of these in there um, that are not tens of thousands accruing monthly, but a lot accrue monthly. 90% of the spills going in there are less than a thousand gallons. Uh, that's been trending for many years, um, at least when I was at the board, and it looks like it's still doing that. So there's a lot of incentives to maybe sitting down. I'd be happy to sit down and talk about ideas to how to really incentivize, you know, getting those off the books, really focusing the, the limited resources we know the board has on enforcement of the largest spills. Next slide. And you can scroll through these, Janine, so I won't take up a lot of time. I have, yeah, sorry. Uh, Allowing more flexibility for the determination of the LROs, is, I think, is important. Um, I think you're probably going to hear from some of these. Um, I know you will from me uh, when I'm in writing. Uh, Cal OSHA already has a program that designates a qualified person. Number seven, um, allowing private entities to train LROs, too, for more flexibility. Eight, incentives for certification. The region uh, central or the San Francisco region, too, is do, does this with culpability in their assessment of a penalty looking at staff, how many are trained, how many are certified, more importantly, that's a real driver. So I think really number eight, continuing to look for ways to incentivize the enforcement, uh, less enforcement or reduce enforcement for those that are certified would be great. Uh, next slide. Uh, I got three more. Yeah, so here's a couple more here. Sign-offs by the uh, SSMP and updates uh, between our engineering operations, preventing CWICs from uh, allowing people to say, I don't have a spill when I actually did to really help that reporting compliance and see uh, updates to the library. I think the library is one of the most useful tools the state board has developed. That really could be updated every year, maybe every year would be absolutely fantastic to help with a smooth transition here with this order. And the last two, um, dedicating that I mentioned earlier, I heard a lot of the technical assistance. I think the technical assistance grants that I, um, I knew about when I worked at the board for wastewater treatment plants, uh, something like that to help really get out in front of these smaller systems, who we know we have hundreds and hundreds to really get somebody out there to really help them um, to identify their issues and really, again, help them reduce violations, get into compliance and move things along. So 10 could be really helpful and not just for capital, but for assistance grants to really for help them for technical help. And number 11, um, you know, really guidance and publications ongoing to really give feedback to the, in to the industry about what, how to comply what's expected from the permit, et cetera, et cetera. So that really is all my comments. And um, next slide. Just a couple of concluding, concluding remarks. Um, you know, I just want to say that, you know, the key implementation uh, beyond the adoption is really key here so that we can really, really reduce compliance, reduce enforcement. We have the same goals. These are the people I'm helping. They want to comply. But it's just a matter of uh, really having that feedback before the state board, before the regional board takes an action to really know where they need to do more would be super helpful. That's really an implementation resource. I encourage that. I look forward to providing more feedback through an implement implementation committee. If you go with one of those, uh, like I recommend, I really think that would be important. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. I have Fisher. A question. Yes, please, Vice Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Good to see you again. Thank you for yeah. your comments. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, your thoughts on streamline enforcement of small spills? I'm taking notes and going as fast as I can. I know I'll get your comment letter, but. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I know this is a little bit long today, but no, I would say um, just in people I'm talking with, I think, you know, like a fix it, take it approach. It was floated in 2012. I know when I worked there and the, I think the regions didn't like that. And I, it's understandable. Um, but looking at now where we are today with what? 15, 20 years of data coming, 15 years anyways, of data in the system with tens of thousands of violations that are accruing with these, you know, less harmful spills, many are even way less than a thousand that are in there if you look at them. Could there be a way to um, address those formally by the state board? It's probably a legal question. You've got some great attorneys, obviously, um, to really look at, at getting those closed out both for the board and for the enrollees. So they're kind of off the books. We can focus attention on like really where the resources need to go with the larger spills. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you, Mr. Fisher. Appreciate the, the very good, specific construction com uh, constructive comments here. So thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Robin uh, Morishida, who will be uh, followed by Cody Phillips. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Good afternoon. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Chair Escobar and state water board members. 
Uh, I'm Robin Morishita. I'm the Director of Technical Services at the Lucadia Wastewater District. Now, first of all, I'd like to thank the, um, the board, uh, the staff, the water board staff, uh, under direction of uh, and leadership of Diana Messina for the exceptional, exceptional outreach that they did um, during the, with stakeholders during the um, WDR reissuing process. They actively listened to us, considered, and applied some of our comments and concerns. Now, they should be commended for their patience, diligence, and hard work. Um, the topic I'd like to talk to you about today is the certific certification of the Sewer System Management Plan, or SSMP, and the updates uh, by the legally responsible official and grade two operators, which is um, a collection system maintenance operator or a water treatment plant operator or higher, or a professional engineer. The concern we have is the addition of those two um, secondary certi certifications to the SSMP. And we request that those two, that those secondary certifications be removed, even though the, S, the LRO may not be a, class, a grade two operator or a professional engineer. Uh, uh, LO, LRO may be a general manager of a agency that does not have either a class two certificate, grade two certification or BLPE. So um, during the workshops in February, it was mentioned that the operators were added to the SSMP certification because um, during the interactions with staff, with operators, the operators mentioned, hey, you know, we weren't part of the, the development of the SSMP. So it's hard for us to operate under or follow the SSMP. Um, that, that is understandable. You know, we include our operators when we develop the SSMP and when we do our audits and when we do our updates. So, you know, in a practical sense, you know, that makes, makes a lot of sense. However, being involved in the development of an SSMP is totally different than certifying an SSMP, okay? Um, we, you know, we like to propose, I like to propose that the operators be involved in the audit process of the SSMP. And they can make their comments there because the audit is how the SSMP is implemented. And they can affect changes to the plan, the SSMP plan, and not have to certify the SSMP. And because, you know, implementation of the plan is more critical than actually developing the plan because the plan can always be changed, right? While you're doing your operations. And we think that this will alleviate the concern of having a grade two operator certify the SSMP. And I have asked our, our grade two and grade three certified operators at, in our district if they would certify it, the SSMP. And they, they said, no, they wouldn't be willing to do this. And part of the reason is section 5.9 is the reporting certification for the SSMP and it, it includes words like penalty of perjury, significant penalties, and other submitted reports and plans comply with the general order. Now, if you're asking a grade two to certify under penalty of perjury and the possibility of significant penalties, that places them in a precarious situation that is in relation to their position, his or her position. And so, um, you know, we, we look at this as the, it may be a cost of compliance issue where the cost of placing an increased responsibility on the operator. And also with the professional engineer, um, cost of compliance for services to obtain that professional engineer if it's a small or disadvantaged agency and they may not have an engineer on staff. So that concludes my comments. I thank you for the time and the opportunity to address the board on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Morishita. I appreciate, I know it's been a long day and so I appreciate you sticking with us and, and here uh, providing us comment on, on a concern and important one I know and I'm sure will be uh, further discussed here as we as we uh, continue on on the order. So thank you, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up Steve Jepson. <clears throat> And who will be followed by Cody Phillips. And our last commenter will be uh, Carolyn uh, uh, Balas. 
Hi, hello, Chair Esquivel, members of the board and water board staff. This is Steve Jepson with the Southern California Alliance of Publicly Owned Treatment Works. And uh, we represent uh, over 80 public water, wastewater agencies in Southern California. I wanna start off by pointing out that since the 2006 SSSWDR, sewer spills have been trending down, as Jared mentioned. Um, the current system is working. It's a, it's a good order and um, I was involved with it uh, back then and, and I think it really helped out the wastewater community a lot. While the current order is mature, we don't see any need for major changes. Having said that, I don't want to miss the opportunity to commend the WDR staff who have been accessible, responsive, and professional during this process. Not to say we agree on everything, but the process has been productive and they really should be commended. They have been great. SCAP supports the comments from our other clean water partners today. My comments will focus on exfiltration and sewer system maps. Regarding exfiltration, it should be noted that the effects in the watershed from exfiltration are a theory currently being studied in the San Diego region. Um, we shouldn't be crafting regulations around a theory. We need to know what's going on. Specific comments on the draft SSS WDR are for a simplified definition of exfiltration. The current definition definition includes specific pipeline conditions where exfiltration could possibly occur, such as cracks or corrosion or misaligned joints. And this is problematic in a few ways. Uh, the pipeline condition descriptions may not cause exfiltration and are not proven to cause exfiltration. And there's not a statewide uniform system to describe and rank pipe defects. The NASCO PACP system is probably the most widely used, but not, not all agencies use it. Some agencies have their own uh, more California centric system or even a more local collection system specific ranking method. So as such, there's not complete uniformity um, and defect descriptions for agencies in the state. So we propose a simple definition that simply says, exfiltration is the underground exiting of sewage from a sanitary sewer system. Leaving out uh, what the uh, current draft says through cracks and or corrosion in pipes, misaligned, jo misaligned joints and broken failed infrastructure. We think that still meets the need and, um, and, and works a little better. Uh, also, uh, in the SSMP Section 8.1 System Evaluation and Condition Assessment, text reads that uh, the plan must document procedures to utilize observations slash evidence of system conditions that may contribute to sewage exiting the system. And we'd like to propose that added in there is such as severe fractures or separated joints we think it's important to put in some criteria of the type of defects that really could be an issue. Um, and those are those defects tend to, they need to be rather severe before you're really gonna have an issue with the pipe. So regarding sewer system maps, uh, the current draft SSSWDR suggests uh, maps should be included with the SSMP and uploaded. At least that's our, my interpretation, our interpretation. So we support that agency should have accurate and up-to-date sewer system maps. That's essential. It's required in the 2006 order. But depending on the agency's size and budget, uh, the, map might, might, the map books might be very bulky, 11 by 17, three ring binders, or huge GIS digital files. It's not practical for the mapping to be submitted with the SSMP, and, and we'd like to just maintain the current requirement that the agency must have up-to-date mapping. So we'll provide written comments on these uh, as well as other topics. And thank you so much for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you, Mr. Jepson. Appreciate uh, the engagement and uh, hear the summary of some of the concerns and 
look forward to uh, uh, yeah continuing to make sure we're reflective of what we're hearing today, but uh, getting to final adoption. So I, I appreciate the, the engagement here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call Cody Phillips, and again, uh, last will be Carolyn uh, Ballas. Hi, um, my name is Cody Phillips. I'm the uh, policy analyst for California Coastkeeper Alliance, and I'd like to first off just thank the staff and the board for their willingness to accept comments and listen to our recommendations for the Jack's general order now and throughout this whole process. Um, echoing what everyone else has said, it's been very, people have been listening and it's nice. Um, so I have two things I'd like to comment on today. Uh, first is the issuance of the order as a WDR instead of as a NIPTES permit. And the second is exfiltration requirements in the sewer system management plan. So first, uh, I'd like to urge the State Water Board to reissue this permit as a combination WDR and NIPTES permit instead of just a WDR, and this is for two reasons. Um, one, NIPTES permits have the added benefit of empowering and engaging California citizens, and two, this order already regulates discharges into waters of the United States very much like a NIPTES permit. So as to my first point, um, NIPTES tools allow for far more community engagement. Take the sewer system management plans required by the draft order as an example. Um, these plans establish that the core elements uh, for dischargers uh, to plan and to control pollution, much like stormwater management plans required under phase one and phase two MS4 permits. Under the phase one MS4, the NIPTES permit program requires permittees to submit their management plans to public review and comment period that provides for community engagement and allows for community stakeholders to evaluate the plans and ensure that the needs of their particular communities are being addressed and prioritized. Adopting this order as a NIPTES permit would ensure the same level of community engagement in the development and implementation of sewer system uh, management plans in communities throughout California. Um, public disclosure of these plans would thus be required upfront um, rather than after the decision has already been made as it currently is under the draft order. Um, in addition, as envisioned under the Clean Water Act, which is having its 50th anniversary this year, an NIPTES permit gives individuals the power to enforce and protect their natural waterways in a way that a WDR does not. Um, second, while the general order prohibits all spills, according to the Seaweeks database, um, since 2006, there have been about 9,500 Category 1, 2,500 Category 2, and 52,000 Category 3 overflow events. This totals over 400 million gallons of sewage overflowing from sewer systems in California. Despite its absolute prohibitions on these spills, this general order expects these spills to occur and regulates accordingly. It requires system-specific plans to reduce and prevent spills and to respond with monitoring and porting when the spills inevitably do happen. This is how a NIPTES permit works. Um, this is just a NIPTES permit dressed up as a WDR, but without the benefits of a NIPTES permit. Um, during this workshop on February 24th, uh, staff provided two policy justifications for not issuing this order as a NIPTES permit. Um, first, they cited the jurisdictional hurdle of identifying which sewer systems have or currently spill into a water in the United States with the added burden of having to do this identification every five years when the permit needs to be reissued. However, as shown by the spill data on CWIX, nearly every, every sanitary sewer system has had an overflow event into WOTUS, and there is no question that these spills will continue. Um, in the rare circumstances of an enrollee that has never spilled into a WOTUS, the board could allow these enrollees to just check a box and receive coverage solely pursuant to the Porter Cologne Act, kind of avoiding this jurisdictional hurdle. Uh, second, staff noted that NIPTES permits only apply to waters of the United States, uh, not waters of the state, and waters of the state is a much more inclusive set of waters. This second justification um, seems to be a red herring. The state board regularly issues NIPTES permits and uh, combined with WDRs like the MS4 permits, industrial stormwater permits, construction stormwater permits, and the Caltrans permit. Regional boards do the same when they issue permits to industrial process water uh, discharges. Likewise, the permits for discharges from wastewater treatment plants are all issued under the board's Porter Cologne and Clean Water Act authority and contain provisions to protect all state waters, including groundwater and surface waters that may not be WOTUS. Um, and it is also worth noting that NIPTES permits can have zero discharge requirements. The state board has the power under the Porter Cologne Act to prohibit discharges into all state waters, as it's already done with this draft permit. These prohibitions can act as a backstop to the management, planning, and pollution control elements of the general order. In this way, all enrollees can have identical, identical discharge prohibitions for all waters, state or WOTUS, with the added benefit of public engagement for those systems that have already discharged into a WOTUS. 
Um, and then second, I'd like to comment on how this permit addresses exfiltration. So we recommend that the State Water Board make the requirements under Section 8.1 more clear to ensure that areas where exfiltration could pose high risk are identified and prioritized accordingly. Um, your staff has already done an excellent job requiring a condition assessment of high risk areas of a system that pose a high level of environmental consequences if there's a collapse, failure, blockage, capacity issues, or other gross system deficiencies. We recommend that exfiltration is just specifically added to this list. Um, in addition, the same section requires prioritiz uh, prioritization for areas within the vicinity of surface waters, steep drain, high groundwater elevations, and environmentally sensitive areas. We recommend that porous substrate and unconfined aquifers are added to this list as well to better identify when exfiltration is likely to travel underground and when aquifers lack the protection of a ceiling aquitar layer. Um, so those are my comments and we do plan on submitting written comments. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your time. And uh, again, patience, I know it's been a long day for folks. And so thanks for sticking with us and providing uh, your good comments here, Mr. Phillips. Thanks. Uh, we have our last commenter. Carolyn uh, Palas. Good afternoon. Oh, I apologize. Uh, we can't hear you. You are unmuted on the Zoom platform. It may be uh, you need to change your microphone. Uh, at the bottom left where the mute button is, uh, there's a little carrot should be able to see uh, your microphone that's currently selected. Maybe try selecting a different one. No, still can't hear you, unfortunately. Uh, now you're muted. Here, we'll ask you to unmute again. And uh, maybe if you try selecting, a, if there's another microphone amongst those there, there isn't another. You're on the other one. Um, gosh, uh, Mr. Loffer, I, you're my backup uh, tech help here. Uh, Miss uh, Miss Ballas, actually, what we can have you do is call in. Yes, in the uh, email you received from the clerk of the board, there should also be a phone number you can dial in. You can leave the video going if you'd like, uh, but if you have access to a phone or um, your cell phone, either would work, and just dial in on that number, and we'll patch you in. Great, and we'll we'll wait for you to just uh, be able to have a moment here to call in. And as we do, um, well, I, I won't transition to, to board member comments yet. We'll we'll allow you a moment here. And thanks. Chair Esquivel, just so yeah. you know, Alan Shear, we might want to try him. He's still on the platform. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Mr. after this, Mr. One, Shear. We might yeah, as we're um, waiting for Miss uh, Ballas to be able to get on, uh, Mr. Right. Shear, did uh, you want to? Uh, provide a comment. You want me to unmute him? Yes. And if not, no worry, Mr. Chair. I know you were, I think, speak as uh, needed or necessary. Uh, I, I, yes, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, oh, members yes. of the board. Um, it, uh, you know, I uh, had originally intended to uh, to speak, but uh, all my comments uh, have been um, presented by uh, other speakers, so I will okay. um, uh, waive my time. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, though. Of course. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thanks for participating. Um, Ms. Balas, uh, I'll give you a moment more here. Apologies. Oh, Mr. Loffer, I don't think I can hear you. Nope. Uh, we have not seen uh, Ms. Boss call in yet. So if you wanted to start a dialogue amongst your colleagues, uh, we can keep an eye out for her and uh, at an appropriate time, get her unmuted again. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Loffer. And uh, so colleagues, uh, anything that you want to uh, either highlight, uh, reflect on, or uh, point out in any of the comments that we heard it was, um, you know, I think for for me at least, um, I think the need to continue to to really focus, I think, on uh, maybe four point one and uh, what were some you know strong concerns heard from Casa and some of the ambiguity perhaps of that language. But here again, not supportive of um, wholesale uh, removing it, but really would like to figure out um, how to 
to, to address uh, if we can some of the, if there is ambiguity there or challenge in, in folks trying to, to just uh, have a pathway to compliance as we say here for it. That would be my you know my, my main um, sort of flag at this point that you know I, I'll want to uh, further discuss and along with Mr. Ewer's um, general comments around ways to maybe um, I, I, I wouldn't use the word teeth um, here with the, the regulated community but how to make sure um, we're really getting a best value, um, the, the work that's being done here within the order, but as also as it's reflected in some of the, the federal requirements that are coming down around resilience and risk assessment. And you know maybe again, there's ways of, of making sure there's some consistency there that even brings us um, some benefit in our work, but I'm not too sure um, what I'll, um, it, although there was good um, suggestion here around the definition of resilience and other things, how best to, to maybe do that. So that would be the only, uh, the other the other space that I think I've um, heard and, and really interested in uh, kind of exploring further. Other colleagues though? I have a few thoughts, um, Chair, and mine are very, um, uh, very general. Um, I concur with um, the comments that you just made. And uh, first off, I want to start off by just really thanking people. This was one of the more interesting workshops that um, I've sat in on a lot of really good um, suggestions, but it just strikes me. I'm really glad that I'm paired with board member um, Morgan on this because she has that practical side of experience that I don't have. And so I just wanna be really mindful that just because something sounds good, I don't really know how that's gonna be implemented in the real world. Um, I do th um, think we need a little more time um, to digest these comments, get back with staff and uh, encourage um, some additional stakeholder meetings. I'm looking for practical solutions, anything that we can do to address cost of compliance, but also be looking at water quality protection. I think that's what we're all looking for. You know, these are just very general comments, but do uh, really appreciate um, all of the specific suggestions. Thank you, Vice Chair. Really appreciate that. Uh, we just had a caller come in. Is uh, Ms. Ballas, are you uh, prepared to provide a comment right now? We're going to check and see if that was actually uh, her that came in with the phone number ending in 872. We're providing the opportunity to unmute on that phone line just so we can identify the individual. So if you are, if you just called in, you can press uh, star six on your phone and that should unmute you. And so far, Chair Escavel, we have not received any response um, okay. from you. Yeah, and the, again, it's uh, star six, and if you're able to unmute, great, and then otherwise, um, we can continue on our discussion here. Uh, other board members? Yeah, I'll jump in. So, you know, I was, uh, I, I did know all the comments actually so far with from both you and Vice Chair Diadamo, I think. You're, you're, you're spot on. And, but I, I do want to focus a bit on that discussion that was teed up in the beginning about smaller systems. And uh, I think we heard a lot of comments today about that, um, suggestions for you know, implementation committees, suggestions for technical assistance grants for smaller systems, um, a lot of neat you know, recommendations around the, SS, uh, the, the resilience assessment, risk assessment, and providing some more um, clarity as to what's expected or not expected with those. Um, and just that, you know, the heavy lift that might be expected of systems and just recognizing that for the smaller systems, it's it's more challenging, their resource constrained, it makes sense. Um, but I, I really don't have a great understanding of, you know, did they struggle significantly with the current order you know, are we anticipating lots of challenges here in making that transition? So I don't really want to come out today and say, you know, I expect, you know, X, Y, or Z action other than to say, I'd like to better understand um, what we might be anticipating as the challenges coming up with implementation, um, what type of training or other guidance staff might feel could be helpful to that community, just recognizing that the, the vast majority of these systems are on the, the smaller side. 
So I just, you know, again, echoing a lot of the comments other board members and, and stakeholders have made earlier. Um, but I think <laughs> that's a good area to focus on as we're working through some of this kind of wordsmithing, kind of dialing in some of the language. I think we can have a mind to, you know, how will this really work for some of these uh, systems that uh, maybe have a lot to do here to, to get up to speed with this order. You're here. Thank you, board member. Board member Morgan. Hi, thank you. Just want to thank everyone for the good comment and the suggestions. Um, I too, you know, really want to go through and you know just digest everything that we've heard today, um, and you know work work with staff and you know perhaps you know talk to stakeholders a little bit more to really understand some of the comments. You know, and also, I want to go back and look at the draft order and really go through it a little bit more to kind of put everything together. Um, one of some some of the things that you know did stand out or some of the definitions and also the, you know, just the, the certification requirements, um, just, you know, as you know, that's part of where I want to go back and look at the order and the certification language, just, you know, my thoughts is, you know, being a licensed engineer, if I were asked to stamp or certify something, a work that someone else did that I was not familiar with, I too would be very hesitant to do that because I'm putting my license on the line for work that I did not do. And that work that I, you know, unless I was able to go back and to fully review it and to ensure that I was comfortable with that work, you know, and so it's like there, there's the, you know, what, what is that ask really? So that's where I wanna go back and really to understand what is that ask that we're asking individuals to put their licenses and basically their careers on the line for, uh, for you know, you know, it, is it really work that is not done under their control um, that has been done by others um, that they may not have knowledge of. Um, and so, you know, want, want to understand that more and really um, go through that language. Um, and also just the, you know, understanding of the um, the the thought process under talk to staff more the thought process around the the testing requirements the um, you know the field tests and everything and with the focus on being really the the, the small agencies and um, the j just as we move forward being conscientious of the what 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 all the additional asks are of the smaller agencies, um, you know, just being involved with this order in 2006 and knowing what went into implementing it at that time and understanding what the additional requirements are now. And, you know, just kind of, you know, that timeline of getting the agencies to transition to complying with this new order and what we're asking for, um, want to, just take, take that time to talk to staff and really get the understanding of what these asks are and um, you know that, that transition time to come into compliance and to um, you know, with, with this new order and these additional requirements. Because definitely you know the goal is to protect water quality and want to make sure that that's where we're, we're going to and we're not setting the systems up for failure as we are moving into this new order. Thank you, board member. Board member Firestone. I don't have anything else to add. I think um, folks have covered it and just appreciate all the continued work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, appreciation all around. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's a good timing, again, with the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act here to be reminding ourselves of the, the how easy it is to take for granted our uh, sanitation and wastewater systems here and the need to continue to reinvest in them. And you just appreciate, uh, again, the spirit that everyone's brought to this discussion and look forward to getting us to uh, final adoption of the order and continue to refine here those these last uh, bits that really can be, can be focused on. Um, before I completely conclude, I did wanna provide one last chance uh, for, for Carolyn Ballas to perhaps uh, provide us for a comment as well. Um, 
believe so she's coming right back into the Zoom platform at this point. We'll give it another. She's not yet attached a microphone, so bear with me. And apologies, Ms. Paulus. We'll hopefully be able to to get you in right now. So, Ms. Paulus, we've tried to unmute you. Let's see. Can you go ahead and try to talk now? And we'll see if we're connected. Can you hear me now? Yes, we, we can. can. Oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Oh, I apologize. you didn't even be sorry in the least. It's you know, welcome, welcome to the modern age, right? Now, thank you. I'm thank glad we were you. able to, to get it sorted out. Glad to, glad <laughs> thank to be able to hear you so your much. comment on this. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Carolyn Balas. I represent the Sacramento Area Sewer District and the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District. And I appreciate you allowing me to provide comments, especially with the difficulties I've had. So thank you. Um, first of all, we definitely want to acknowledge and thank the State Water Board staff and their willingness to work with the enrollees and the other stakeholders. I know it probably was not an easy process and I know that they were probably receiving a lot of conflicting um, requests, um, but I think they did a really good job in listening to everyone and incorporating some of the changes that we requested. Um, we also agree with many of the other um, comments that were made today, including Jared with CASA and Steve Jepson with SCAP. Um, one of the first things that we would like to do is to request an extension um, for the implementation period from 120 to 180 days. Um, that little bit of extra time will really give us and the enrollees enough time to comply with some of the new requirements and make significant changes to our plans and procedures um, as called out in the new order. And then another thing, we respectfully ask that your board recognize that there are specific differences between the sewer systems. For example, uh, the Sacramento Area Sewer District, they own and maintain the lower laterals, whereas many enrollees do not own and maintain the lower laterals. So this responsibility for the lower laterals results in an apparent increased number of spills from systems that do own the, lateral, the lower laterals. And these spills are low in volume and typically are lower in risk to the public and the environment. So we request the following change um, in the reduced reporting that you take into account that um, the spills for reduced reporting um, be from main lines and not necessarily lower laterals, because that'll make it look like we have an increased number of spills compared to others. And again, I wanna stress that these are very small volume spills. Um, um, next, I just wanted to mention that in attachment D section seven, um, that was a requirement that was previously for the fats, oil and greases program. And I think uh, what staff has tried to do is address the problem with pipe blockages um, by uh, changing that section to become the sewer pipe blockage control prep program. So while section is intended to address the concern of pipe blockages, the causes of those blockages may vary. So therefore the approach and strategies for a control program will be different depending on the type of blockage. Um, additionally, not all requirements will apply to the pipe blocking substances. So one example um, in section seven in the second bullet, it requires a plan and schedule for the disposal of pipe blocking substances that are generated within the sewer system service area. So um, this requirement may not apply to other types of pipe blocking substances, for example, roots. Um, previously, the requirement was specific to fog and that made sense. Um, so what we're just asking that you acknowledge that um, all of these different um, items will not necessarily be expected to be treated the same. And then lastly, um, we will prepare a comment letter and we plan to provide specific language at that time. And again, thank you so much for your time and um, sticking in with me and having resolved to listen to my comment. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate your patience uh, with you know this platform, and and I know the challenges that come with it. But importantly, really appreciate the good 
constructive uh, comments here and I look forward again to the continued engagement around this. So thank you for again that time and for, for providing your comment. Thank you. Okay, I think that then uh, we'll hear, it wraps up our, our item. Appreciate again, everyone's um, uh, patience here. It's been, I know a long day um, and just a really, as uh, the vice chair said, just a really great workshop and discussion. I appreciate everyone's time and patience uh, to provide for it. Uh, that allows us to now uh, conclude, I said, as I said, item number five, and now we are on item number six, which is a consideration of a proposed resolution to adopt implementation plans for administering the drinking water and uh, wastewater allocations and uh, our state uh, fiscal year. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. It's the intended use plans too. And to, to help lead us on it, uh, I'd like to call up uh, our staff. Thank you. Ms. Chase, good to see you. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, board chair, Lavelle, and members of the board. Uh, so my name is Bridget Chase, and I'm a supervising engineer in the Division of Financial Assistance, or DFA. So the following slides will go over background details on the Budget Act of 2021, our proposed implementation plan for the funding, and then comments that we received on our draft implementation plans. Next slide, please. The Budget Act of 2021 appropriated $1.55 billion to the State Water Board through Senate Bill 129 and Senate Bill 170. This particular board item is in regards to DFA's draft implementation plans for the $1.3 billion allocated to drinking water and wastewater projects in particular. So $650 million is available for drinking water projects with priority given to disadvantaged communities. And then 650 million is available for wastewater projects with priority given to septic to sewer projects with local investment. Because up to 5% of the funds may be used for administrative costs, approximately 617 million will be available for grants under each funding program. These funds need to be committed to projects by June of 2024 and dispersed by June of 2026. So there is a quick turnaround time for this funding. For this reason, the State Water Board adopted resolution number 2021-0030 on August 18th of 2021 that delegated necessary authorities for DFA to encumber and award an initial 100 million from each of the allocations. Since then, DFA staff have been working with stakeholders on the proposed implementation plans for the remaining funds. The budget bill specifies that state funds that are being discussed today may be utilized as state match against federal funds. In November of 2021, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act significantly increased the capitalization levels and the associated principal forgiveness available to the Drinking Water SRF and Clean Water SRF over the next five years. So when we posted the draft amended intended use plans or IUPs, uh, we did not propose committing any of the general fund money, the, the grant funding that I'm talking about today, for match of the federal funds. However, DFA staff further evaluated and we are now estimating that California may need up to 85 million to match an estimated 670 uh, million in funds for federal fiscal year 2022. Plans for administration of the federal funds will be incorporated into the 2022-2023 intended use plan, which will come before the board for consideration of adoption this summer, so right around the corner. Next slide, please. DFA staff are proposing to rely on the existing funding processes outlined in the Drinking Water SRF and Clean Water SRF Intended Use Plans or IUPs. As amended, um, the basis for administering the remainder of the drinking water and wastewater allocations from the Budget Act of 2021. If adopted, the amended intended use plans would serve as the implementation plans for the drinking water and wastewater allocations from the 2021 Budget Act, respectively. DFA staff are proposing these amendments to the intended use plans to maximize opportunities for eligible projects and to streamline funding processes. If adopted, the proposed amendments will apply to multiple funding sources currently administered under the intended use plans so not just the allocations from the Budget Act of 2021. Draft amendments to the DWSRF and CWSRF IUPs were posted for public comment on January 6th. 
followed by a board workshop on January 20th to discuss the proposed changes. And then written comments were then accepted through February 7th. Next slide, please. So the next few slides will discuss proposed changes to the drinking water SRF IUP. First, I wanna go over some of the terms that will be used in the discussion. So a disadvantaged community or DAC for drinking water projects is a community with a median household income or MHI of less than 80% of the statewide MHI. DFA utilizes the American Community Survey data or ACS data set to determine the MHI of a community. ACS data is updated annually using a five-year ruling average with new ACS data utilized by DFA as of April 1st of each year. So we're really coming close to the new data. Current data defines a disadvantaged community as a community with an MHI of less than 60,188. Then a severely disadvantaged community or SDAC is a community with an MHI of less than 60% of the statewide MHI, or according to our current ACS data, less than 45,141. For drinking water projects, a small community is one with up to 3,300 connections or 10,000 people. An expanded small community serves more than 3,300 service connections, but no more than 6,600 connections or a population of more than 10,000 people, but more, no more than 20,000 people. And then lastly, we are proposing adding a new definition for a medium disadvantaged community. This would be a community that serves between 20,000 and 100,000 people with an MHI of less than 80% of the statewide MHI. A consolidation is considered the joining of two or more public water systems state small water systems or affected residences not served by a public water system into a single public water system. Lastly, proposed grant funding is split by the project type. The drinking water SRF policy defines eligible project categories A through F. I'm just gonna talk about the category A through C projects. As far as definition, those are projects that address public health issues. So some examples include those that will address waterborne disease outbreaks, attributable to the water system, contamination in excess of the maximum contaminant level or MCL, insufficient source capacity or water delivery capability, surface water that is not adequately treated or filtered or uncovered distribution reservoirs. Then the category D through F projects are gonna be any other eligible project other than those essentially. Next slide, please. This colorful slide summarizes the changes that we are proposing for grant and principal forgiveness eligibility for drinking water construction projects. These details can be found in Appendix E of the draft amended drinking water SRF IEP. So as mentioned previously, category A through C projects are those that address the public health issues such as a primary MCL exceedance or water shortages. Because category A through C and consolidation projects are considered priority projects, the grant eligibility table in the current and proposed intended use plan has higher grant limitations for these projects than category D through F projects. In the current intended use plan, expanded small disadvantaged communities and small non-DACs are eligible for funding, but only up to set for grant funding, but only up to 75% granting grant funding for A through C and consolidation projects. The proposed amendment would make these higher priority projects for these systems 100% grant eligible. DFA staff are proposing to keep the maximum grant of 60,000 per connection with the ability of the deputy director of DFA to approve up to 80,000 per connection for good cause. And in addition, the proposed amendment includes adding medium disadvantaged communities as eligible communities for grant for category A through C and consolidation projects only. During stakeholder engagement meetings, there was some concern that funding medium disadvantaged communities and small non-DACs would take grant funds away from the small disadvantaged communities. For this reason, the proposed amendment includes a project cap of 20 million for projects that serve medium disadvantaged communities or small non-DACs. The proposed amendment also specifies that small non-DACs 
eligible for these grant funds must have an MHI of less than 150% of the statewide MHI. So going back to our current ACS data, a small non-DAC that would qualify would have to have a MHI of less than 112,853 to be eligible in that case. And again, that data is gonna be updated in April. Grant funding is currently available for category D through F projects for small disadvantaged communities and expanded small DACs only. So again, up to that population of 20,000 people then. Small severely disadvantaged communities are eligible for grant funding regardless of their drinking water rates. But other communities are currently required to have rates of at least 1.5% of their MHI to qualify for these grants. The proposed amendment would remove the minimum drinking water rate requirement for small disadvantaged communities to qualify for grants. The proposal also allows 100% grant for all small disadvantaged communities and eligible expanded small DACs with rates of over 1.5% of their MHI. The proposed amendment keeps the existing maximum grant per connection for category D through F projects at 45,000. DFA staff considered increasing the maximum grant per connection limits in the intended use plan, but we found that the majority of the projects we are working on are within the current limits. The exception that we are seeing is for projects that serve really small communities with less than 60 connections. Uh, the current intended use plan does allow the deputy director of DFA to approve up to 2 million per project, regardless of the cost per connection. And when DFA staff looked back at the existing projects in house, uh, we did see that projects are coming back significantly higher in cost the last couple of years than their original engineering estimates. For this reason, the proposed amendment will allow the deputy director of DFA to approve up to 6 million rather than the current two per project, regardless of the amount for residential connection. Next slide, please. The Drinking Water SRF IUP makes incentives available for receiving water systems to encourage consolidation. So that's the system that's gonna be taking on the smaller systems, the one that's gonna exist at the end of the consolidation. A public water system that fully consolidates a community of at least 15 connections or 25 people may receive up to $10 million in 0% financing towards an incentive project. When I'm talking about an incentive project, that is a separate project than the actual consolidation project. It is a project that solely benefits the receiving water system. And the receiving water system may also receive up to $5 million in grant towards this incentive project, depending on the size and type of community that would be consolidated. The proposed amendment clarifies that a receiving water system may receive additional incentive funding if they consolidate multiple communities. In addition, the amendment proposes to make consolidation incentives available to receiving water systems that consolidate a small non-disadvantaged community. Language has also been added to clarify that the receiving water system must be a voluntary participant rather than a part of a mandatory consolidation to qualify for this incentive funding. The executive director or designee can approve a case-by-case -case exception for could cause then. Next slide, please. The next two slides summarize comments that we received on the draft amended drinking water SRF intended use plan. We received a suggestion, a suggestion to reduce the funding that will go to the State Water Board for administrative costs. DFA staff recommend that the full allocated 5% is available for administration costs because these funds are necessary to support staff time to review applications, approve funding, and disperse funds in a timely manner. We received comments suggesting to include multiple different set-asides. One recommendation was to include a set aside for resiliency projects such as backup power, uh, backup water supply, metering and leak detection. Another recommendation was to include a set aside for all sizes of non-disadvantaged communities. At this time, DFA staff don't recommend including either of these set asides in the amended intended use plan. The reason why the proposal includes small non-disadvantaged communities as grant eligible for category A through C or consolidation projects is because of economies of scale and because of the large amount of systems on the human right to water list. DFA staff 
do not believe drought resiliency projects should be prioritized or set aside funding over projects that address public health issues as well. These types of projects can be funded under the existing um, intended use plan, but most likely they would be ranked as a category D through F project. And then we received a request to expand our definition of a disadvantaged community to include pockets of disadvantaged communities within non-DAC service areas and or communities with a low service connection density. DFA staff are not recommending changing how we define a disadvantaged community at this time based on the high demand from current eligible systems. And we recognize that per connection costs per projects in lower density areas are often higher, but staff do not recommend including this as a factor for priority. Next slide, please. Comments were received requesting that the new income limit for small non-disadvantaged communities with category A through C or consolidation projects is either increased or removed. Alternatively, DWSRF projects with complete applications in-house can be awarded funding based on grant criteria identified in the original 2021-22 intended use plan. DFA staff recommend incorporating flexibility to fund complete applications based on either the original or the amended intended use plan. So we're proposing leaving the 150%, but having the flexibility to use the existing IUP. We recommend a suggestion, or we received a suggestion to increase per connection grant limits for connecting domestic wells in particular. DFA staff looked at existing applications in-house and feel that the existing per connection limits should generally be sufficient. However, staff are recommending to raise the maximum amount the deputy director can approve regardless of cost per connection to that 6 million per project that I mentioned in the pre or couple slides back. We received a suggestion to further clarify how the State Water Board will determine if a MHI is representative to specific households for funding on private property. DFA staff will work with project proponents to clarify whether limitations for funding on private property are relative to the project. As more examples are observed and criteria are refined, more specifically, more specificity <laughs> may be added to future intended use plans. We received a request to report on different things, including the amount of grant funding that goes to medium disadvantaged and small disadvantaged non-disadvantaged communities, uh, the pace of encumbrance and liquidation of the funding, and the time to approve disbursement requests. DFA staff are working towards an online funding dashboard and we're looking to including these items as part of that. Lastly, we received a suggestion to organize the fundable list by county. The fundable list is not being updated as part of this amendment, but DFA staff will consider this recommendation for the 2022-23 IUP that again, will be coming before the board this summer. Next slide, please. The proposed amendment clarifies that work on private property for public water system consolidations, such as mobile home parks, can be grant eligible for facilities that the receiving water system will own and operate. Other work on private property will be subject to DFA review of the owner's ability to pay. However, change sheet number one recommends incorporating flexibility for the deputy director of DFA to have the authority to waive the ability to pay analysis if available information indicates the system owner doesn't own other commercial assets. Next slide, please. So I will now summarize proposed changes to the Clean Water SRF intended use plan for the wastewater appropriation for the Budget Act of 2021. The current IUP shows that grants are available to small disadvantaged communities. For wastewater projects, a small community is a little bit larger. It's a community with a population of less than 20,000 people. Many projects have a grant loan split uh, in the current intended use plan that depends on consideration of degree to which the community is disadvantaged and their wastewater rates. The proposed amendment to the intended use plan would provide 100% grant funding for all small disadvantaged communi communities, regardless of their wastewater rates. The proposed amendments will remove the maximum grant per project limits 
Rather, grants for small disadvantaged communities will only have a maximum grant per household connection, similar to what we're doing on the drinking water side. In addition, the proposed amendments would increase the maximum grant per connection for septic to sewer projects to 125,000 and other projects to 45,000. Similar to the proposed amended drinking water SRF intended use plan, the deputy director of DFA may approve financing for construction projects with a total eligible project cost of up to 6 million, regardless of the amount per connection. So again, this is gonna get those projects that are serving a very small number of residents. Per the Budget Act of 2021, the State Water Board shall prioritize septic to sewer conversions with local investment for wastewater projects. The proposed Clean Water SRF intended use plan amendment creates a new septic to sewer set aside of 350 million to be funded solely with the Budget Act of 2021 General Fund Wastewater Infrastructure Funds. The proposal would allow projects for small disadvantaged communities with local investment to receive grant funds on a first come first serve basis as applications are complete. Then any remaining funding will be available to larger disadvantaged communities. Uh, so no cap on the size for that or small non-disadvantaged communities with wastewater rates of at least 1.5% of their median household income. The grant criteria for these communities is limited to 50% of the total eligible project cost. In addition, grants for large DACs and small non-DACs would have a maximum grant for pro per connection of 75,000. And then they're also gonna have a maximum grant per project of 25 million. So again, going back to the small DACs, they don't have a project cap, but these ones we are proposing would have a project cap of 25 million. Per the proposed intended use plan amendment, larger disadvantaged communities or small non-DACs that are interested in applying for any remaining septic to sewer set aside funding must at a minimum submit a clean water SRF general application for their project by November of this year. A complete application would need to be submitted by March of next year. And then because of the quick timelines associated with these funds, projects will need to start construction by spring of 2024 and complete construction by the end of 2025. The deputy director will prioritize projects that have local investment, higher cost per connection, and projects that mitigate impacts to public health or water quality and may offer only partial funding if demands exceed available funds as well. The set aside will reserve funds for septic to sewer projects that can often take longer to develop. And then because small disadvantaged communities with local investment will be eligible for the set aside funding as their applications are complete, they will have the opportunity to compete for these funds ahead of other community types. Lastly, for this slide, 100% planning grants are available for small disadvantaged communities. The proposed amendment eliminates the current planning grant cap of 500,000 Rather, the change is anticipated to be able to fully fund the necessary planning for a project so applicants won't have to apply for additional funding sources. Similar to the drinking water SRF intended use plan, planning grants count towards the total cost a community is eligible for in a five-year period. So that's gonna include all planning, technical assistance, and construction funding for wastewater projects that they receive from the State Water Board. Next slide, please. The slide includes a summary of the comments we received on the proposed draft clean water SRF intended use plan amendments. Similar to the drinking water SRF, we received a suggestion that the state water board should not use the full allocated amount available for administration. DFA staff do not recommend a change to this um, in the IEP because these funds are necessary to support staff time to administer funds in a timely manner. We received input from that the per connection cap for septic to sewer projects should be increased. DFA staff reviewed the estimated project cost for the projects that we currently have in house. And we found that it would be beneficial to increase the per connection limits to 125,000 with the ability of the deputy director of DFA to approve up to 175,000 for good cause. So this is something that we changed based on comments received. 
These projects often serve a low number of connections and have a high cost per connection due to necessary work on private property, to decommission the septic tanks, uh, connection fees, and other necessary pipeline that's needed for the projects. Similarly, the per connection cap for large disadvantaged communities and small non-disadvantaged community septic to sewer projects was increased from 50,000 per connection to 75,000 per connection. So matches um, what we're doing for the small DACs only just eligible for half of that. We received a recommendation to include a variety of additional rec recommended priorities for septic to sewer projects. Change sheet number one incorporates prioritizing septic to sewer projects serving large DACs and small non-DACs if they have a higher cost per connection, in addition to projects that mitigate impacts to public health or water quality. The wastewater construction grant criterion Appendix D was modified so that small communities with an MHI of less than or equal to 150% of the statewide MHI, rather than the current 100% of the statewide MHI, may be eligible for grants uh, for 50% of their total project costs, so long as their wastewater rates are at least 4% of the community's MHI. We also received a recommendation to consider census tracts or block groups when determining a community, if a community is considered disadvantaged. Uh, so when determining if a community should be considered disadvantaged, DFA does look at the MHI data that best represents the community that will be served by the project. So sometimes that is us looking at multiple block groups and um, coming up with a MHI based on those block groups. Next slide, please. So the last thing that I wanna mention is included in change sheet number one. The proposed IUP amendment incorporates reference to an estimated 4 million from the Drinkwater SRF administration funds to be used for contract services to complete a statewide wastewater needs survey. We were originally planning on that um, using the Budget Act of 2021 20, funds for that, but we are planning on using SRF administration funds instead. So just wanted to point out, because we did have discussion about doing the wastewater needs survey in a bunch of our stakeholder meetings, and we are still planning on doing that. So this slide concludes my presentation. Staff are available for any questions you may have on the proposed amendments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Chase. I just appreciate, I know it's been a lot of uh, just really fine tuning work here and trying to ensure that we're maximizing as we often do in all of our work, but maximizing this investment that we have this opportunity to, to ensure is, is bridging the inequities we know exist in our communities and here preparing them for the realities of what the climate crisis provide us. So just incredible work. Thank you for you. And I know uh, so many folks at TFA for their involvement in this and, and continue good reflection of, I know what is a lot of um, discussion that's going on with water agencies, with communities, with um, community, community advocacy, advocacy groups, just uh, really appreciate it. Uh, any, I don't have any questions at this point. I, I feel that <clears throat> at, especially with the workshop we had, the opportunities for engagement, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, where, where things have landed. But um, board members, please, um, any comments or, or questions here for Ms. Chase? And we have a couple of commenters uh, to hear from, um, but just two actually, so plenty of space uh, for further discussion. I think I just have a really quick question and I'll wait to comment for till after, but just, um, just to clarify, you know, we just had this, um, sanitary sewer um, collection system discussion. And so I know in clean water, in the clean water SRF, we talk about wastewater treatment a lot of times, but I'm assuming that um, sanitary sewer collection systems are also eligible, um, but I don't, I may be getting that wrong. So I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, All right, great. We could fund pretty much anything for the wastewater system, collection system, repairs, um, treatment. Yeah, if, if um, cluster septic system is needed, we could fund that too. Great. I think rest I have our comments, so thanks. Board member. Uh, any other members at this time? Okay. Hearing none, we can uh, go to our commenters and first like to call up uh, Jared Boscoll, who would be uh, followed by Eric Oriana.
uh, Hagen, uh, Chair and board members. Uh, Jared Bosco on behalf of CASA, uh, just want to quickly uh, thank your staff and your team for all the work they've done on getting these amendments to the IUP. Um, the changes that staff made, uh, we're really excited about, and we know they're going to expand the eligibility and the types of communities that can get in here because of those increased caps. Um, as we can, you know, help and partner on this going forward, uh, be it sewer system maps for boundaries for needs assessment or getting that technical assistance uh, to the right, you know, folks who need it and making sure they're paired and connected to you all. Uh, we're on the ready and we're eager to help on these projects. We know they're really important uh, for the state. So thank you to your team and uh, for your leadership on, on this effort. Thank you for that, Mr. Bosco. Uh, yes, I think as Ms. Medina had said, um, whether it's implementation on, on the sanitary sewer order or here, making sure that agencies are aware that these amendments and changes to the programs have been made, that they may now qualify for uh, increased grant uh, dollars or just uh, it's the loans as well that are important components. Having folks really um, understanding and assessing the projects that they need to be investing in right now and coming to the board um, and here, you know, have the time and, and opportunity to even provide technical assistance to, you know, develop that work um, is just really needed. And, and it's a continuum, importantly, and, and just appreciate what CASA continues to do to be that bridge to smaller agencies that don't um, often have the, the resources, are, are larger, more progressive, and, 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 and leading agencies um, can have. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Eric Oriana. Uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, board members, and staff uh, for the opportunity to uh, provide comment. My name is Eric Oriana. I'm a policy advocate with Community Water Center. Uh, I wanted to first start off my uh, comments uh, by saying a huge thank you to staff uh, for their work. Uh, really, the staff have been really responsive to our comments, uh, made themselves available, and, and had a great workshop on, on a topic. So really couldn't say uh, enough thank yous to the staff. Uh, and then also want to also say thank you particularly for DFA staff and, and being creative with uh, these amendments, right? Uh, we have really historic funding um, that we need to get out the door uh, and uh, staff was able to do that uh, and, and will be able to do that um, because of some of these changes and particularly staff removed significant barriers for communities, uh, buy into drinking water projects and uh, as a technical assistance provider uh, to the state community water center is very, very thankful for, for those changes. Um, and the board is also expanding eligibility for uh, drinking project, drinking water projects. Uh, and we got the chance to work with staff to uh, ensure that small disadvantaged communities are still being prioritized. Uh, and we believe that the expansion will help more Californians uh, while still prioritizing those who need help the most. And so really thankful uh, to staff on that. Uh, and then really just wanted to sort of center us in, in the fact that uh, the IUP is a policy for uh, the state water board to invest dollars into making the human rights of water a reality for all Californians. And we want to sort of, um, you know, center that, uh, you know, this is a historical funding for us. Uh, and many of our communities have, have dealt with tricky water challenge for decades. And so uh, this opportunity that we have is a really great opportunity. And so uh, we're looking forward to continuing to ensure that these investment dollars are maximized and are used efficiently. Uh, and also, uh, you know, you know, the, le the level of investment that the state is making uh, also brings light to the importance of the state protecting these dollars uh, by managing our sub-basins. Uh, and uh, that brings into mind sort of the, the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, by ensuring that uh, the implementation of it uh, isn't making problems worse, uh, by implementing mitigation programs uh, similar to those as the CV salts uh, management zones, uh, coordination agreements that the state water board has has put in place and so wanted to, to just uh, you know highlight that we're, we're sort of planning on implementing close to three or four billion dollars and uh, the state water board needs assessment has identified uh, a, a greater cost than that and so we still have uh, funding gaps that, that we'd like to uh, address and uh, we think that you know those who are uh, worsening water quality and uh, degrading our groundwater aquifers have a responsibility to be at the table as well. And so we look forward to ensuring that mitigation uh, guidance coming from the Department of Water Resources uh, in the coming months uh, works closely with the State Water Board and existing programs and funding mechanisms that we have. 
Uh, and so just wanted to end uh, on a note to say that we look forward to working with the State Water Board uh, in the summer as well uh, as the 2023 intended use plan comes out. And so looking forward to that and looking forward to work, uh, continue working closely with you all. So thank you for the opportunity to provide a comment. And thank you for your time and for sticking with, I know what's been a, a long day of a uh, number of items in discussion, but this one is incredibly critical and appreciating your engagement and others here in, in helping make sure that, again, we really take uh, best opportunity here and maximize uh, this, this chance to really invest in our communities. So thank you. Uh, that wraps up our, our commenters. And so board members, uh, thoughts, comments, uh, questions, feelings, I can go. Um, I, uh, you know, again, thank you to staff. I think uh, we've done, and to stakeholders that have helped with us. I think it really is indicates a really strong commitment to using these generational opportunities of funding to achieve the human right to water, um, to create resiliency for the high risk systems, and to proactively prevent failures for Californians. So, um, you know, I. I have seen these really addressing those um, by uh, in many areas, including expansion of eligibility for um, a little bit larger systems, both it, not just um, expanded small systems, but up to medium DACs. And um, that's important given that we have some of those medium systems on our human right to water list. And so, um, you know, if we're going to address critical needs, we need to expand that, which which we've done here, where we are doing here. Um, you know, additionally, just um, furthering, I think, safer and this um, state's commitment to building resiliency. So I think we know we have 1,200 communities that rely on a single source, um, and we are pouring in as much as we can to incentivize consolidation so that we can build economies of scale and really address the extreme fragmentation that leaves um, small communities extremely vulnerable. And so, um, and I know in our needs assessment are really looking at um, uh, the um, infrastructure needs and identifying needs to invest in resiliency measures um, more generally as required under SB 552. Um, so, uh, you know, I think um, staff have done a great job of including that. I'm really, um, I think we're, uh, have a good path here. Um, I think as we have the opportunity now, um, you know, pretty quickly here, we're gonna have to adopt an, you know, next year's IUP um, with additional federal funding. And there's not that big of a gap in between this, but, um, you know, thing, things I wanted to flag for us to be thinking about between this adoption and then is um, just whether the, the overall community funding caps, um, if we, if that is limiting for, um, for sort of comprehensive projects that are, um, I know we're trying to make sure that we can address high risk for both water quality and water supply resiliency. And so I think just curious as we're moving forward, and we may not know this in time before this summer, but you know, are we running up against um, caps if we're trying to expand um, and address both water quality and water supply and, and sort of build that resiliency? I think we're, we're really wanting to encourage systems to address it all together um, in one, one rather than having to have extra uh, uh, time and costs and doing multiple applications and contracting and everything. Um, and uh, let's see, I wanted to um, make sure, I guess just again, look at um, between now and then how to make sure that anything we're identifying as high risk within SAFER is able to fit into those highest priority needs here. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna get the letters wrong of the tiers, but um, that, um, so it, uh, certainly um, public health and, and water quality, but I'm also thinking maybe some of the water supply kind of urgent um, drought or water supply um, emergency uh, resiliency measures that may be for very high risk systems. 
um, just thinking about how that plays and if that if, if that's going to fit into the tiers that we have and um, as we think about uh, certainly it's going to be eligible it's going to be prioritized to some degree but just just thinking about if that needs to be um, a little clearer as we move to the next IUP adoption um, that that really all high risk systems um, would fit in those highest categories. Um, and then uh, let's see, there is discussion on the septic to sewer around local investment um, and the requirement in the legislation that requires us to um, uh, include some local investment in the septic to sewer. I'm really concerned about that for, um, for DACs. And um, I have a lot of faith in our staff and stakeholders to make sure that that isn't a barrier. Um, and I think just in, wanted to just get on the record to encourage um, us to be really as flexible and creative in identifying um, how we're defining that so that it can include um, uh, things like in-kind um, uh, funding and staff time um, for, for really disadvantaged and, and, um, and severely disadvantaged communities that, uh, that really are gonna need that funding to connect to wastewater systems. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I wanted to um, flag, we had some folks and I know there's gonna be this, there's gonna be some discussion at the, in the next item on arrearages, um, which is the, um, huge help and work that associations put in to um, help outreach to their members and to the drinking water and, and wastewater communities um, around the arrearage program. I, as, as I think Jared and Chair Vosco and, and, you know, discussed, the more that we can be partnering to, um, to just reach as many systems as possible to understand the opportunity here, um, you know, in particular, I think understand where there's opportunities for larger systems to partner with nearby smaller systems um, and the, the um, pretty significant incentives um, that we are looking to invest to make sure that we can use this opportunity to, um, to really accelerate the kinds of um, consolidation and partnership solutions that are going to be needed to address immediate and, and long-term sustainability. Um, so I just look forward to continuing that. I know our staff is and will be doing that um, and just, uh, you know, will offer my time to help with that as well. Um, and then uh, two other things. One is um, DFA, I know you have, um, so there's a lot of great tools. This is data month. <laughs> Um, and one of the tools that I think um, uh, may, I think may answer some of the questions or be helpful is, I believe we have a um, kind of a project lookup tool where if folks aren't sure of the status of their um, of funding applications for a system, they can look up where it is. And so, um, if that's right. <laughs> It'd just be great to make sure that um, that folks know about it because I, I do think often there's a question of you know where where is this in the process and um, and you know because if I think making sure folks are able to utilize the tools we have is important and I just I know DFA um, and our staff in general are just really great about being accessible and transparent um, as we're all trying to get funding out. Um, and lastly, just would love to, as we are reporting back on all of this, just see, um, I know DFA has done this, but um, with, with safer reporting out, um, but just like love to see um, a racial equity analysis on where our funding's invested, just as we report back and, and sort of track how this money ends up um, being, being applied and, and um, invested. That's it. So I, I otherwise I and and in conclusion, I really appreciate I'm in high support of um, all of these changes. I think it's um, ex incredibly exciting to have this opportunity, and I think this allows us to to do justice to that, and we'll continue to.
to iterate and, and make sure um, that we can do that. And I'm happy to make a motion once folks have said what they want to say. <laughs> Thank you, board member. And I completely agree. Um, and just uh, appreciate that you know, we continue to want to be very transparent around not just you know here with the intended use plan and its adoption, the relaxation and the way that we're looking at the uh, programs, you know, maximizing this investment. But to your point, also uh, where folks are in in their applications and continuing to make sure that we're we're coming into the 21st century a bit. Um, what comes to mind as well as like the digitization of signatures, uh, which you know recently had to do, and what the help the help and that is provided to the processing then of of um, a lot of the work that goes on. So anyway, uh, just thank you. I completely agree with your comments and um, would uh, turn it over here to board member Morgan. Thank you. And I echo um, the chair's comments and also board member Firestones. I just wanted to also thank stakeholders and staff and you know, just with 2022 being the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act as the chair has you know commented through the meeting, I appreciate the expanded, the expanded opportunities to address providing equitable access to sanitation and the protection of groundwater by an increased focus on septic to sewer and other wastewater projects. As we know, you know, the you know, filling sewer sy septic systems can impact also impact our drinking water um, supplies. And so these projects are also very critical. Um, you know, I just also looking forward to the great work in this area and with safer with, with the safer program just to continue to build Californians resilience and so thank you all for all the great work thank you board member board member wire <laughs> yes thank you I was, <laughs> I was trying to think of something to add to all of this uh, the great comments that have already been shared so I'll just um, I'll throw something out there and that is that this you know, Yes, absolutely. Kudos to everyone who's worked on this and what a great opportunity we have here. And this is this, I'll put this in the bin of good problems to have. You know, having money to spend, you know, and the challenge of trying to figure out where to invest it is a good problem to have. Um, when I see things like on the septic to sewer, you know, the, the dates, you know, the application due November, uh, well, you know, that's, uh, that raises a little flag for me. Uh, just, just in terms of, you know, concern about the applicants actually getting to get, you know, organized in time, actually prepared to be able to even apply for that funding. Um, you know, I'd asked staff about that and they said there's, you know, quite a few projects in the queue actually. And, and you know, so hopefully that'll work out okay, but I still think there will be challenges. And so for me, I just, I just wanted to mention that this is a good reminder that we should always be looking for ways to expedite project delivery. Because one thing here is that we've, we've got all this funding available right now, but there's so many projects that just aren't ready yet. And I know board member Firestone, you brought this issue up before as well. And this is just another reminder um, that anything we can be doing to help um, get projects ready to go or get them in the driver's seat to be eligible to receive funding. We've done the needs assessment work. We're, we're providing so, you know, so much technical assistance right now. Let's figure out what projects are, are high need, high priority, but are lagging for one reason or another that need help to get across the finish line so we can get them this money during this really unique moment here where we have it uh, and we can connect them. So I, I, again, not a specific request, more so just something we should keep in mind going forward here and maybe brainstorm or explore different ideas to expedite various projects and, you know, on top of everything else that I know everyone is already doing. Um, but nonetheless, I, I just, um, I would feel uh, poorly if, you know, we got to the end of this and realized there was just a whole slog of projects that just weren't, because of their lack of resources and capability, just weren't able to be ready in time for funding. So just wanted to mention that, but other, otherwise, fantastic job. You're here, board member. Uh, I think you saw probably a lot of nodding heads here amongst us as, 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 as your colleagues um, really agree uh, that we, we should be doing that um, insofar as just really Making sure we're evaluating where folks, you know, need a little more outreach, and we do have so many more technical assistance resources that, you know, really dovetailing that technical resource ability to create the pipeline. To your point, of projects is going to be really important. Note, um, we have this time limit on this 1.3 billion we received this last summer, um, and as we know, though, there are additional federal funds coming because of the bipartisan infrastructure law. So um, I think our 
we need to try to maximize these grant dollars, particularly because you know, we know that it'll be some share of uh, loan forgiveness grants and, and loans that come from uh, the federal resources. Uh, but these, this can really help accelerate that pipeline, right? And, and maybe even if it can, if there are projects out there that don't absolutely are able to, to meet this deadline, and at least uh, we know that there are additional funds from the federal side that can still complete it. So I think the message is get here, get, get to us early and let us, you know, if we need provide uh, technical assistance even to make sure that the projects are moving. And again, these communities we know um, often get missed um, in the last federal tranche of um, American recovery dollars or, or otherwise. So um, here, here, uh, and thanks for letting me add to your comment there. Other board members? Or all that's left is vice chair. Apologies, vice chair. Is there yeah, anything I, further? I don't have anything to add. Just my thanks, and I agree with everything that's been said. What well, good work all the way around. Thank you. Thank you, vice chair. And I think we're we may be prepared for a motion then. Okay, I can do a motion. I'm on yeah, adopt. Yes. Sorry. Let's see. I can do a motion on um, item number six. And I, are there, how many chain sheets are there? Looks like three. There's three. 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 Okay. With all three chain sheets, um, move for adoption. I'll second. Thank you. Ms. Townsend, can you please call a roll call vote? Certainly. Board Member Firestone. Aye. Board Member Morgan. Aye. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. Chair Exquivel. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The vote is unanimous and uh, it carries in the IUP and, and the item is adopted. So thank you. Really appreciate everyone's good work there again. Let's go ahead and, you know, I know it's been a long day. Let's give ourselves a quick uh, 10 minute uh, break here. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll even call it 15. We'll come here, we'll come back here right at four um, and uh, finish up with our, our last three items, the update. Uh, these are all informational items at this point. There'll be an update on, on the rearage program on the wastewater side and uh, board member reports and executive member reports. So hopefully um, might be able to get out of here uh, here by, by five or so is the, the goal. So let's give ourselves 15, come back refreshed for good discussion and see you then uh, here at four.
All right, everyone, we're at four o'clock. Appreciate everyone's uh, time and attention today. It's been a long day. And uh, but I got you know, two breaks in and a lunch. So I think I should be, I, you know, I, anyway. Now we're refreshed for item number seven and uh, appreciate uh, just, you know, I, I really have to continue to remark that if it wasn't a drought year, if it wasn't a year as well that we received 1.3 billion for infrastructure, if it wasn't for all these things, this would be the thing that we would only be talking about is our arrearage program and the incredible uh, just Herculean effort that everyone has done uh, both uh, in, our, in our space, our, our folks in the program, and also water agencies and communities to come together to provide this incredible opportunity where the board has been able to support systems to forgive water debt, uh, both on the drinking water side and then here what we're now gathered to discuss on uh, the wastewater side and an update on it. So just, just thank you everyone, appreciate it and look forward to the update here. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. Uh, I'm Jennifer Tony. I'm a senior in the Division of Drinking Water in the Arrearage Program. And here with me today, I also have David Zensius, who is the other senior in our Arrearage Program. And we're here to present an update on the water portion today. Next slide, please. So the Arrearage application, it opened in October and it closed December 6, 2021. We did um, accept late applications until January 15th, 2022. What we told the water systems that were submitting late applications is that we couldn't, we couldn't guarantee that funding would be available. We were able to accommodate those late applications and issue funding to um, all communities that submitted late applications. So we couldn't extend that deadline past January 15th any further because our legislation required distribution of funds by January 31st, 2022. The application was open to 763 community water systems um, and the eligibility was determined on that they were a community water system, they charged for water, they submitted our survey and they reported arrearages. We did receive 668 applications and altogether those 668 applications collectively serve more than 80% of the state's population. During the course of our program, approximately 120 water systems received technical assistance. And our division of drinking water team put in 8,500 hours to our arrearage program. In addition, the Division of Financial Assistance, the Division of Information Technology, Division of Administrative Services, and our Office of Chief Counsel put in thousands of additional hours. Next slide, please. 301 million in arrearage funding was awarded to community water systems and will provide relief to 535,550 residential and commercial accounts. The program was successful in awarding funding and meeting all the legislative deadlines. However, our implementing divisions were impacted. The Division of Financial Assistance hired limited term staff from the tanks program to run the program and to issue the 582 payments between October through January. The Division of Drinking Water redirected staff from the SAFER program to assist in building the survey and the application with the assistance of the Division of Information Technology. The Division of Drinking Water also redirected field staff to contact water systems, assist with the survey and applications and complete follow-up reporting. Next slide, please. So here is an overview of the numbers from all three of our programs, our phases of our program, excuse me. In the survey phase, we started with 2,128 eligible community water systems and that charge for water. And we received 1,845 submittals for a response rate of 86.7%. And um, our rearage team really spent a considerable amount of time doing outreach to all those 2,128 water systems to make sure they knew about our program 
and to make sure we had as many submittals as we could by the deadline. During the time of our survey, the estimated arrearage amount was 333 million. The second phase of our program was the application. And as we discussed before, um, we had 763 eligible water systems that reported arrearages. And um, we had 668 submittals for a response rate of 87.5%. The Division of Financial Assistance issued 582 payments. The difference between the number of submittals and the number of payments is due to aggregating the applications. We combined multiple applications to issue one warrant or check to an umbrella agency. And we issued $301 million to water systems. So the last phase of our program is the reporting requirements. We're currently accepting these reporting requirements surveys. Um, this opened January 31st, and we anticipate that it will be open until July, 2022. So any water system that received funding from our program is required to submit the reporting requirements. Currently we have 270 uh, reporting requirements started and 108 submitted. Thank you, next slide. So this chart shows the number of eligible water systems in blue and the number of submitted for each phase in orange, same numbers we reported previously, but we thought it would be helpful um, in a bar chart. And so we just wanted to point out again that you know it, it took many, many team members across all divisions to get these numbers um, to where they are and to also point out that the reporting requirement phase is ongoing. We still have some important work to continue on with seeing how the water systems utilize the funding. Now I will hand it over to David Sensius. Thank you, Jennifer and members of the board. This chart shows the received applications broken down into water system size categories and indicates that 54% of the applications came from small communities. The largest segment of the chart, which is shown in green, represents applications from systems with up to 500 connections. And the second largest segment, shown in orange, is applications from systems with 501 to 3,300 connections. Next slide, please. This slide compares the arrearage amounts estimated in our initial survey to actual funding amounts that were requested later in applications. Because customers paid off debt, requested amounts were lower than initial estimates for most water systems. The amount requested by aggregated applicants was slightly greater than anticipated. We received some questions about the amounts of funding that went to systems in the smaller categories. Systems with less than or equal to 3,300 connections requested a total of $8.37 million. And systems with 3,301 to 10,000 connections asked for a total of $17.6 million. Next slide, please. This chart compares numbers of funded water systems to the numbers of eligible water systems and shows that the percentage of eligible systems receiving funding was greater among larger systems. 91% of systems with more than 10,000 connections received funding. Percentages were lower in the smaller size categories. Next slide, please. Water systems are now using the electronic annual report portal to provide data regarding their use of the arrearage program funding. The portal will remain open for this purpose through July as Jennifer mentioned. They're required to report on the number of accounts credited, the amounts credited, enrollment and payment plans, and administrative costs. Unused funds must be returned within six months of receiving payment. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps? The arrearage team will continue reviewing reported information and tracking returned funds. In addition, 
the team is going to be working with the Division of Financial Assistance on the closeout process and also audits. As we conclude this presentation, we'd like to acknowledge staff in the Division of Drinking Water, Division of Financial Assistance, Division of Information Technology, and the Office of Public Participation. We also greatly appreciate legal assistance we've been receiving from the Office of Chief Counsel. This program was on a tight schedule and depended upon coordinated efforts by all these divisions and offices. And with that, I will close. Uh, we can now take comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zincius, and thank you, Ms. Uh, Tony. Really appreciate, again, uh, incredibly impressed uh, the, the speed and uh, just thoroughness in which that we've uh, developed this program and gotten dollars out to communities. So thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions at this time. You know, it'll be interesting, uh, certainly, to definitely um, see how uh, the implementation of the wastewater rearages goes. You know, what we really learned there, knowing that um, it's a uh, you know very uh, separate, different way in which uh, many wastewater agencies collect uh, even uh, their their fees and and rates. And so um, it's gonna. You know, I look forward to hearing how all that implementation is going. Certainly. Uh, board members, any questions or uh, comments here? And we do have, I believe, one commenter, Mr. Uh, Vosco. He's, he's held on. I can wait till after public comment. Okay. Uh, then let's uh, hear from Jared Vosco. Hi, hi again, board members. Um, Jared Vosco on behalf of CASA, and just want to um, echo your comments, Chair Escobel, to your staff and how quickly, thoroughly, and expeditiously they've accomplished what they have. Uh, I know it wasn't without pains, and uh, we've heard updates uh, pretty much monthly on this program, and we're very appreciative of it. I think we uh, just saw on the slide about 108 applications have already been submitted, as well as 270 started, and that will provide great relief to those agencies needing it for their customers for rearages. Um, and then also just wanna communicate and share that we're still actively uh, in communications and working with your Office of Public Participation on getting that word out. So I know we've got a couple more weeks um, before the formal deadline. I think there's a little bit of time for a late application, um, but we're gonna try to get out uh, a couple more messages, try to find those last people that uh, may be in that sweet spot of needing to, this relief, but haven't been connected with so that they can hopefully get in and uh, get covering uh, coverage as well for this opportunity. So thank you all and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Really appreciate that, Mr. Bosco. And thanks for sticking with us here and just a uh, you know, continuum of great work mm -hmm. on all the items prior, but on this one particularly, you know, I, I reflect on that number that we saw on the drinking water side, those connection, those systems below 500 connection where we only hit about 55% of those systems. Now there is likely a number of reasons why um, not all those systems were looking to avail themselves of this program. But here, as we implement on the wastewater side, you know, maybe again, and, and here I know we did an incredible um, amount of work to reach out to systems, uh, to provide technical assistance, um, especially for smaller systems to access these dollars. Um, and so I think it just reminds me of the real importance, certainly, um, that we have in sensitivity to all of our programs with our smaller uh, systems often more disadvantaged. Um, so just appreciate here we have an opportunity as we implement the wastewater site to maybe just see what further we can do so that we don't see as great a disparities uh, as we did on the drinking water side. And again, knowing that um, incredible work was done to, to uh, ensure that there was outreach to them. So just thanks, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, board members. Comments, uh, questions, board member Firestone, would you like to kick us off further? Or yeah, I'll, um, apologize, yeah. Um, okay. oh yeah, no, we don't have further commenters, sorry. I saw, I saw Mr. Zencius pop up and I thought that uh, I had something else. <laughs> so anyway, go on board member. Uh, you know, once again, just wanna say thank you so much to staff um, and also to the associations. I know um, uh, folks aren't on the platform to talk, but I do know that, um, the Water Foundation was was able to debrief um, with both our staff and stakeholders and associations on some of the lessons learned on this. And um, I think just uh, 
a huge amount of effort went in across the board as we see um, to get the kind of response rates that we were able to. And, um, you know, I think we all felt the need to make sure that we did justice to this opportunity we were given um, in the COVID crisis to make sure people didn't lose their water um, service after the moratorium lifted to make sure that, um, you know, we were able to get the funding into the pockets of those that need it, or I guess into the accounts, <laughs> credits of those who needed it. Um, with many programs like this that um, there's a, often, um, I think much more kind of overhead transaction costs than what we were able to do in this circumstance here. And I think a lot of that is to is is due somewhat to the flexibility that we had, but but in particular, I think to the the real um, creative problem solving <laughs> that our staff took into figuring out what was going to be the most um, uh, efficient way uh, of getting this money to water systems, making it easy for them to apply and then be able to get it to their customers as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, I think huge uh, lessons learned on that that, um, and just, I think impressive how quickly we were able to move and make that work. Um, I, you know, I, I, I do wanna recognize just that, you know, water and wastewater, um, are utilities that don't have ongoing low income rate payer assistance programs and um, you know, often don't have really significant customer assistance programs in terms of um, uh, different aid for folks that, um, that are in crisis. Uh, and there's some barriers to that locally, but um, there's, an, and there isn't a statewide program. And so, um, you know, I, I know we have, published um, the, our report on 401 about um, a statewide low-income rate payer assistance program. I know there's a lot of discussion on this and I just hope that we can use this opportunity and the lessons we've learned here um, to try and figure out how we can do that in our state. Um, I think that this is, this, is, um, this is a time that we are seeing um, prices rise significantly on um, or rates, I guess, rise significantly um, and are going to even more given the, the pressure um, and requirements on water systems and the pressure on our water sources. Um, and so, you know, I think it takes a while to get these programs in place. And the sooner that we can really uh, get that in place and, and work together to figure out how to address affordability on the customer household level, um, the better. So anyway, just appreciate the work. Um, I, you know, I feel like I've said that over and over again, I could not be more proud to be part of the agency that, um, that administered this program and more impressed with how quickly and effectively I think we were able to get this done, have heard great feedback. I mean, unbelievable feedback on the responsiveness um, from staff, as well as just the, like the number of touches that we did with um, with agencies to make sure that they uh, they knew about the program and were able to apply. So again, big thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You're here, board member, and agree with your points uh, around the connectivity to long-term affordability discussions and affordability generally. You know, especially given our maximum contaminant limit setting and our work on the division of drinking water, I think it all continues to create a a real honest and, and needed sensitivity to the affordability challenges that communities are facing. So we were incredibly proud, as you said, and honored to be able to even have this resource to be able to, to provide to communities. Um, and uh, here it's seeing the space that folks have been able to innovate um, by having communication with water agencies and better understanding even where debt goes, um, how it's managed, um, and, and here how to continue to make sure we're supporting households is yeah, just incredible. So here, here, I agree to all your points. Uh, other board members. And if there's nothing further to be said, that's, 
that works too. And so, uh, unless vice chair, yes, but thank you for vice chair. Yes. Yeah, kudos all around. Just really appreciate everyone. And thank you for the update here. Look forward to continuing to hear how uh, the rear side of uh, implementation goes. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. That wraps up item number seven, brings us uh, to the last two items here. Uh, and at the top of item number eight, which is board member reports, I just want to congratulate and give a round of applause to uh, board member Nicole Morgan, who was uh, confirmed on the floor of the Senate yesterday. So congratulations to you, board member. All right. Um, incredible, uh, you know, welcome. You can, you know, I know, especially, you know, at that first appointment, that period between confirmation and, and, and um, the appointment, uh, you know, it, it, it feels good to, to have that. And so incredible affirmation of your leadership and welcome uh, here now as an affirmed member of the State Water Resources Control Board. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the warm welcome and for, you know, all of your guidance and mentorship over the past, I mean, I've lost track of time, eight, nine months now. <laughs> It's been an intense so eight or nine months. Yes, <laughs> thank you, board <laughs> member. Um, and thank you for letting me kind of steal your report kind of there at the top. So um, I- well, As you're going, I also wanted to just say thank you for pulling in for me last week when I got stuck. <laughs> well, and that's where, you know, the only, uh, uh, the, the, the item I was gonna mention for my own report here is uh, last week I had an opportunity to, because um, a, a moment where board member uh, Morgan was stuck in Southern California, participated with uh, Mayor Steinberg from Sacramento and uh, here uh, Secretary Crowfoot from the Resources Agency, along with um, council members and uh, Josh Friedick, who is uh, the uh, head of Cal Volunteers, to talk about conservation and uh, look at some mulching. We had participated in some mulching activity. Um, I think on Twitter, I was reminded that, you know, you don't uh, do mulching in a blazer. So um, it, uh, it, was, it was a good opportunity. Uh, to, to truly, though, connect on, a, as we discussed earlier, a serious topic around conservation and helping uh, uh, households and communities point to the sorts of activities they can undertake to contribute to the, the resiliency that we're needing in our water systems, both at the water system level and the household level. So um, appreciate the, the opportunity to participate in that. Apologies that you weren't able to make it um, board member. And I think, though, what I appreciate now is um, and, and would also uh, note, and here I know I imagine Vice Chair will can go into more detail as well, so as I don't take up all the space here, but had a good opportunity to also visit last Friday uh, in to Yuba City. Uh, we're there, uh, Councilwoman uh, Grace Espindola uh, and the mayor and, and uh, all of the city um, staff truly really around drinking water and wastewater management send, uh, took us on a tour. And we also were able to, to I'll, I'll stop completely telling about it, but meet uh, some growers as well. Um, so those were my, my two items. Um, they they and reflect you know, us as board members starting to get out there more. So glad that we're getting out there um, and, and, and getting trapped places in Southern California as well. So other board members uh, with reports, please. Yeah, I'll just add that um, I was on that tour as well uh, of Yuba City, and it was just um, a, a wonderful opportunity to hear from a community that has been collaborating and wants to collaborate even more. So most of the day, as Chair Esquivel said, was spent on uh, drinking water and wastewater projects, but uh, there. Uh, as a city really crossing over into uh, not just those issues, but also flood protection and also uh, looking at uh, the challenges with sustainability, uh, long-term sustainability of the farming community because that provides for their economic base. And so uh, we connected with a lot of the folks that uh, we've met with many times before, um, Al Matna, uh, Nakwa, uh, officials, uh, Rice Commission, and got a good update about uh, the benefits, even in drought, of trying to provide some additional water for um, rice field flood up and for uh, migratory birds. And uh, I learned a little fun fact that the Pacific Flyway that passes through the Sacramento Valley, 60% of their food source comes from rice fields. And then also we did receive um, a bit of an update on a um, 
um, uh, uh, food production for salmon, um, another pilot project. Um, uh, I know uh, we all have learned about those pilot projects, but there's another one in the making um, that the Rice Commission is involved in. So look forward to hearing those results, which I think will be in 2024. And then the other update that I had is that um, last week, um, I um, was a, a speaker at uh, Cal Poly's Ag Leadership uh, Group. They were in Sacramento. And I have to say, I've been doing this for years. And this was the most advanced class. They had very detailed, very specific questions. So they're clearly following the water board. And I was really excited about that. That's fantastic, Vice Chair. Um, really appreciate that. And, and yes, the tour. Uh, what I really appreciated was just being able to see the city infrastructure, you know, the wastewater treatment plant, the drinking water treatment plant, and then also have a conversation you know, around agriculture as well and the interdependence, certainly of the communities and also of the resource sharing there. Um, it was it was really great to be able to take that time and, and get help. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Other board colleagues with any reports? Yeah, I could actually probably build on that a little bit here. Um, but first, I, I wanted to mention that um, Chair Esquivel, you and I had a very unique presentation that we made for the, for the NACWA annual meeting, which I think was a week ago or so. Um, we recorded, I think, just prior to our, our last board meeting, but it didn't show until afterwards. But anyway, we had a little bit of a back and forth. Uh, we were both on the camera at the same time, uh, wholly unscripted. and. Uh, one take, did it live. One take. <laughs> so it was an interesting uh, speaking engagement, I'll say. I'll say that for sure, but it was fun. It was good. Um, just talking about some of the challenges that we all we are all, are all facing that we all know very much about here. Um, and yeah, just in, in the in the vein of, of getting out, uh, last week I did uh, have the opportunity to uh, take a trip finally to the San Joaquin Valley, and I want to thank uh, board member Firestone for you know mentioning this opportunity to me there was and uh, board member Morgan I know that you were there in spirit and wanted to be there but you had other you were otherwise engaged uh, so that made sense um, but this was originally initially a tour for DWR Sigma staff and actually director Nemeth was there and Paul Goslin and a couple other staff were there um, hosted by uh, community water center and leadership council and self-help and a number of other uh, organizations in the valley and so just my perspective was uh you know the focus was sigma and how it relates to drinking water challenges and so started in west goshen and just on a property of a of a homeowner who has a domestic well uh and some of the challenges that they faced there and and later went to allensworth and uh board member morgan i think you had shared the challenges with the well and the tank that were, you know, um, flooding everywhere around. And yeah, I saw that. That's that's a that's a true thing. They're definitely having some challenges there in Allensworth right now. And it was good to hear that there's some work underway to help resolve that, uh, what they're experiencing. And then uh, later went to Decor and learned again about uh, you know another community and uh, some of their challenges. And there was there's a link to all of these, which. Um, the common thread was sort of the interface between, I would say, you know, urban, rural communities and agricultural activities. And, you know, each one had, uh, you know, uh, agricultural wells or water quality issues and challenges all sort of in very close proximity to the sites that we we're looking at. And for me, it was just very helpful, um, you know, to be out on the ground and seeing that firsthand exactly what's going on, you know, we hear a lot about it, we hear a lot about the challenges, but seeing it, you know, seeing a very large agricultural well, I'm not passing no judgment on it, just the fact that it exists, you know, maybe 100 feet away from a, a municipal well, a brand new municipal well, or or what have you, you, you can, it, it puts into perspective maybe the, the likelihood that there could be interface between those, those different sources of supply and their different uses. And so, you know, I'll just leave it at that. For me, it was just great to be out there to meet community members, you know, to really engage in that way where it had been so long uh, since I've had that opportunity. So, so that was Wednesday. And uh, thir Thursday was the uh, flips, 
scale opposite. I actually drove the rest of the way down to Southern California with the to the Burbank, San Fernando Valley area and uh, toured with LADWP, uh, probably Laura, uh, another project that I think you've already toured as well, um, but they're the LA Reservoir uh, Ultraviolet project that they needed for their long-term to enhance surface water treatment rule compliance. So they just, it just started operation a couple months ago and it's I think now the third largest UV plant in the country. Uh, they also have the second largest UV plant in the country at the same facility. So, you know, <laughs> uh, and I also went over to their, um, some of their groundwater cleanup um, projects that they have ongoing in Tahunga and West Hollywood. And, and all of these projects were funded by the State Water Board, uh, either through uh, SRF loans with the UV plant or through uh, Prop 1 groundwater cleanup funds. So they're all, you know, good investments that we've been making and just the scale, uh, you know, the, going from, from a, you know, an individual domestic well uh, on Wednesday to, you know, some of the largest facilities of this type, advanced treatment uh, in the world, you know, was very uh, educational. And, you know, but I, but I think it, just a good reminder of how, you know, our needs are very broad at the state board and, and what we do. You know, we are trying to help all Californians and provide that assistance to everyone. And it really does run the gamut. And so just again, you know, following on our IUP conversation and trying to fund good projects and, and move all those forward, just recognizing the complexity and doing that, uh, knowing the scale of the different types of needs that are out there. I think that was some of the perspective I certainly took away last week. That's all I had. It's not, there's no, that's all about it. That's fantastic. I mean, I'm really glad uh, you're getting out there. And again, it's, um, you know, I'll actually should mention uh, our next board meeting, uh, board members will be in person, uh, this first board meeting in April. So we're, you know, we're transitioning here a bit. Um, and uh, just appreciate the opportunity to your point board members providing us to continue to make sure we're connecting and listening and, and really understanding you know, the connectivity between sometimes what can seem siloed policy sort of discussions or decisions. And for us here as decision makers at the board, it's, you know, it's really trying to best integrate all of that um, as we make our considerations. So just here, here, thank you. Other board colleagues with any reports? I can go, um, I, let's see, I actually, um, actually have a, a couple of things because I missed at the, I had to leave early from the last board meeting. And so um, I didn't mention um, just one thing from that prior period, which is that I was able to take a tour with East Bay Mud um, uh, around on um, the consumnates and their reservoirs and um, hatchery and, and other projects and just talk with uh, general manager and other leadership there about um, a lot of their efforts that weren't just that, but also their customer assistance programs and um, you know, overall water supply management. Um, so it was, I just, I found it incredibly helpful. And like you said, board member McGuire is just great to get out in person and actually see things again and talk to people. Um, so yeah, I just a thanks to them and um, you know, for those that haven't yet um, been able to get that that tour with them, I, I very much recommend it. Um, so a couple things recently. Um, so I was I, I was filling in, um, but able to participate in um, a uh, uh, assembly select committee on California Mexico binational affairs. Um, uh, dialogue that was held on March 2nd, um, as well as a meeting afterwards with Secretary Bernal from um, Baja California. Um, and it was in regards to specifically, I think the focus was, and my participation was supporting um, uh, CaliPA's border program overall in terms of the funding that is allocated that, that we and our Division of Financial Assistance are administering. There's 20 million for border projects um, that was in the last budget. And um, so uh, 
was testifying on our process um, and uh, and requirements. It's we're looking um, CaliPA, the border program has been leading on this, but looking at um, trying to, to ensure that that can be both on um, the New River as well as the Tijuana River, um, both sides, it benefits all sides of the border, um, but certainly seeing water quality benefits um, in California. And uh, the time limit to get those funds expended is pretty quick. And so a lot of it was trying to make, make sure that folks had a a good sense of how quickly um, projects needed to be um, moving. And I think there's an, uh, already quite a number of projects that have been identified through other processes that are ready to go. So um, no final decision on that, but I just wanted to update folks on, on that. Um, it, uh, let's see, um, I was able to, um, uh, two processes I wanted to mention, just kind of a thanks to the Water Foundation, because they have been continuing to move forward discussions around um, how to accelerate consolidations um, and scale up consolidations throughout the state and sort of barriers and, and processes around that. There was a meeting um, that they pulled together that was building off the U.S. Water Alliance um, kind of convenings and trying to continue to move forward. Our staff was great and discussed a lot of our um, mandatory consolidation processes. Um, and, you know, I think is a great learning community for us all to be figuring out how we're gonna do this together. Um, there was also, um, a, like I said, a convening that they held yesterday, was it, on, <laughs> um, on just learning from the arrearages program. So just a thank you to, to them and to staff that are putting in time to, to help um, us and, and stakeholders in general um, throughout the state try to figure out how to um, you know, learn and continue to, to do justice to the, the um, opportunities we have now. Um, I was uh, let's see, I, I spoke at UC Davis, um, which was great for the, um, Rick Frakes Center um, for Environmental Policy. They have a series and it's always nice to get to UC Davis Law School. I um, was able to, to meet some folks that are um, interning with us right now. So that was great. Um, and uh, I, I, I was able to um, help pull together a, a kind of lunch discussion session um, with uh, Beth Rose Middleton Manning, which is that board member Nicole was able to, um, Morgan, board member Morgan was able to, <laughs> to join us for, um, and she's a, a professor at UC Davis and had done really interesting um, research and scholarship around um, uh, kind of theft and, um, and condemnation of Indian lands within the headwaters of the state water project and um, kind of the um, a lot of the documentation around um, that process and how over time there has in that area they've been able to um, actually through a settlement return some of the lands um, that were taken through the um, the stewardship council through a CPUC process and um, just really interesting um, context for a lot of the the work that we do as we think about um, kind of racial equity and how it interfaces with what all that we're doing today um, and that we that we rely on today. Um, and let's see if there is anything else. I think um, I uh, on Thursday. I, well, actually one thing I just wanted to clarify. So I got to go to the regional four board meeting is um, I was able to listen to, and there was a really good overview on the Dominguez channel. And I just wanted to clarify, cause I mentioned that earlier and, and got a, a good email from a, a stakeholder on this, that um, there's actually really two issues there. And I, I think it's helpful just for us to understand as an example of there was a um, industrial um, 
discharge facility that went into the canal that was illegally, um, you know, stormwater, illegal stormwater um, discharge that went into the canal and was causing, um, or at least the preliminary an investigation um, signals that that's what was causing really severe odors for a long time in the community. And then separately, there was a sewer spill that also ended up discharging into the canal that also went into the streets and up to homes and different things. And those were two separate incidents. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then lastly, um, I am able to be part of a press conference on Thursday with um, to celebrate the work that I know has been a long time coming um, with a, um, one of the, uh, with a, a, a nonprofit that has come out of um, CV Salts and the management zones there to uh, do uh, private well testing and um, is partnering with us at the State Water Board. We are funding the portion that is um, non-nitrate related so that we can make all of our resources go further, not have to have individual families have to, you know, get partial information around whether their water is safe to drink, um, try to get, you know, information from, um, from different folks and instead just have, uh, the, um, the one nonprofit go out and talk to people and make sure they can get the information and resources they need. So really appreciate that partnership and also um, the work it took to get these agreements in place. Um, hopefully that can be a good model of, of how we can um, all be making everyone's resources go further. Um, so appreciate that, that's it. Thank you, board member, really appreciate it. Uh, Executive Director Sobeck, I think that wraps up our board member reports. Uh, anything on the Executive uh, Director report? Um, I don't have anything to, to say other than what's in the report. I, I did just wanna um, reflect that I thought today's agenda pointed out that um, virtually every, every, every office, every subunit of our staff is working full out. I think that, you know, you got reports and action items on from water rights, from Division of Water Quality, from Division of Drinking Water, from Division of Financial Assistance. And then we have all of the offices that feed into and, and support and assist those offices. I know that you guys know this, but I, I feel like I, well, I, I wanna thank all of you and all of the um, participants today for recognizing um, staff and the amount of time and their, that they put in and the, um, you know, their, their real dedication to being collaborative and being responsive and, um, um, you know, not, um, not just um, not cutting corners and ticking the boxes, but actually um, listening. Um, it, they are under a lot of pressure and they have been going full out for, um, you know, uh, quite, quite a long time um, for a lot of good reasons. Like um, as, as um, board member McGuire mentioned, you know, the, the, the wonderful opportunity of a, of a generation to get out billions of dollars to assist our communities, but it does come at a cost to staff. Um, and then a lot of other um, not so happy um, things that are happening like drought and how to manage, best manage drought. So I uh, thank you for recognizing staff and I hope that you all will just keep it in mind. I think that as we deal with some of those priorities, some of the other work that we were hoping that we would be able to get to this year, will probably um, take longer and there are probably, we probably won't be going at the pace that you all want us to on those, but I think that we will all agree on the priority items um, that we will be working on. So um, so again, thank you for all of the, the kudos that came out at the meeting today. I think that's really helpful when staff is recognized when they've put in the effort. Thank you, Ms. Sobeck. I appreciate uh, the, the joining in the acknowledgement and the reminder. Uh, again, that uh, there's there's only so much that we can often squeeze out of the day uh, out of folks, and um, it just you know uh, being aware of what are real limitations uh, and not and, and making sure that uh, all of our uh, critical leadership and staff uh, understand that uh, this yeah this isn't a, a sprint it, it is a marathon these are and they need to make sure and preserve uh, their long term ability to engage in all of this so thank you I appreciate that. Uh, 
I think that brings us to the end of today's agenda. We do have a workshop tomorrow where we will be talking about Sacramento uh, River temperature management in depth. I want to thank uh, all the participants I know that um, are already lined up to be part of tomorrow's discussions and all commenters um, and look forward to, I know what will be very much a continuation of today's discussion around the challenges we're facing into tomorrow's workshop. But that brings us uh, at the end of today's agenda and here before five o'clock. So just thank you everyone. I know it's been a long day, a lot of discussion and appreciate everyone's attention and, and look forward to tomorrow's discussion certainly. So until then we are in recess and we will see everyone uh, tomorrow morning then at 9 a.m. Thank you, have a good evening, rest up, uh, talk soon, thanks. <laughs>